It's like 2 a.m. in the morning, and we hear dun, 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 boots slapping along the, the runway out there. The doors of the laundry boost open. In come 12 members of the security squad, both sergeants, the lieutenant, and they holler out this guy's name. So I said, that's fine. I said, I've got one addiction, one addiction only, and I don't want to get rid of it. And he goes, what's that? I said, motorcycles. And I said, well, what's she doing time for? He goes, well, because she cut up one of the whores that wasn't going to pay her for money for working at the truck stop. And I said, yeah, you know, this is a functional family. <laughs> Quite honestly, as far as I was always concerned, the Paisas were probably the more dangerous one because they lived in you know, places where it was violent virtually all the time. Felipe had used uh, inmate napalm on him, which is you boil a pot of water, you put baby oil in it, and you throw Kool-Aid in it. So when you throw it on, the water burns, the baby oil cooks, and the sugar gets in there and will cause infection. Ooh. And it, it's very effective, you know. They wanted you or whoever did it to be turned over to them. And he's like, well, it's not like they would have killed us. I said, that would have been what you've been hoping for. You know, you better start giving us the respect we have coming. So what respect? He goes, well, we're doing hard time. I said, you're not doing hard time. You don't know what hard time is. And he goes, don't you know who I am? I said, yeah, and I don't really care. I'm Charles, G you know, Manson. I'm more than Jesus Christ ever was. He is back. I am talking about our very first podcast guest. Most viral podcast guest ever. Caused a lot of people to comment on his videos. And... That engagement has created over 10 million views on his combined videos presently. He's got one video that's at 7 million views. If you've not seen it, what happens if a shot caller puts a green light on you in Folsom Prison? It's one story, 38 minutes. If all of our guests could just come on and tell stories of 38 minutes, 40 minutes, 50, whatever, we could just sit here and keep our mouths shut, it would make my life much easier. But yeah, so we are absolutely delighted for Jamie Morgan Kane to be back on. What we're going to do is, because we've already done three podcasts with him, we'll run those after these if you want to stay tuned. Or if you want to go in the description box, we'll, you can go down and watch them immediately down there. But what we're going to do is, because Jamie spent 34 years in California's toughest prisons, he's got endless stories and they're all mind-blowing. So we're going to cover some of those stories that we, we've never published before in this podcast you won't have heard these stories anywhere and if you want to get even more stories book number two not number one book number two <laughs> behind the granite walls on the back of the funding talks and the early podcasts jamie landed a major book deal with mirror books group one of the biggest publishers in the world he took them hundreds of pages of documentation because of all of the controversy around the videos he took them all of his legal paperwork his, his, his prison history his military records and their lawyers confirmed his story and they didn't just do one book with him it sold so many they have done two two so if you've got a problem with anything he says take it to the legal department <laughs> not to us but feel free to say whatever you want in the comments on these videos because it always it adds the engagement. It doesn't matter if it's good, doesn't matter if it's bad. It adds the engagement and YouTube pushes it even more. Now, since the last three videos, I was contacted by a guy who was in LA County Jail Fre back in Fresno, the day. Fresno County. Fresno County Jail back in the day. What year? Uh, it was 1983. 1983. And he said he was in the... And he thinks this is the same guy that protected him. And it is. And then we put him in touch. And he, in, the, in this initial co um, conversation that I had with this person who was trying to get a hold and find out if it was the same guy, Jamie was the same guy. He said, Jamie was massive. He was a force to be reckoned with. 
in Fresno County Jail. And Jamie has brought some photos. And we'll we'll perhaps get these made big and put on the screen as I'm showing these. But you can see how built he is on that one. We'll have the full photo. That was him at 34. Is that um, biking that, that, or in the joint? That's in the joint. Uh, that's four years after I went into the joint. But that's basically the size I was in the county jail. Here he is at 27. Yeah, that was just when I started getting back into working out. And at 60. Still hench. Hench, <laughs> hench at 60. I know people look at Jamie now and think, how is any of this possible? Well, hey, we all, we're all going to get old and not look like the badass we were once back in the day. You do still look like a badass. <laughs> <laughs> so Jen is going to read you the back cover blurb. Yep. So we start with torture, fear, violence and despair. Prison is a word which conjures up many dark thoughts and feelings. Only those who have been there will know what it's really like. In the best-selling 34 Years in Hell, author Jamie Morgan Cain told his remarkable life story about how circumstances persuaded him to plead guilty to a crime he did not commit and serve more than three decades in American jail. Released in 2018 and now re rebuilding his life in a British birth country, he has been asked many times what was prison really like. In Behind the Granite Walls, the book, he answers that question, he, oh, sorry, he answers that question, revealing the secret that enabled him to survive. This is the ultimate inside guide to what it's like to be behind bars in the USA. And his first book, it's sold like crazy. It's highly reviewed all over the world. His second book is going to follow in its footsteps. And we actually went to the Isle of Man with Jamie. We took him to speak at schools, at the prison. We're going to put some of that footage maybe uh, to, at the end of this video with all of his other podcasts. It'll be a big blockbuster edition. But to start out, we are going to get into these prison stories because we just like they're so gripping we just like to go take you right there it's a huge thing it's absolutely fantastic to yeah, see you again jamie you. well it's it's nice to be here and like i said it's good to see you again and like i said nice to meet you lovely to meet you absolute pleasure and you you've moved to newcastle it's you're doing great you've got that light in your eyes but before we get to the updates on your life let's just jump straight in to some of these prison stories so the first one then is spike yeah yeah spike um he was a rather interesting character. I, I met him about five years after he'd come to prison. Uh, he was down at CMC <clears throat> taking a, a, thera a therapy class down there, cat, what they call Cat T, which was intensified uh, therapy. You had to live with the, 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 uh, your, your therapy groups, and it was 18 months long, and you know, like 10 hours a day you, were, you had to do whatever their program was. Well, they did give you one option of doing something recreational exercising <clears throat> and um he'd gotten in with the coach uh in the gym and they had a power lifting club and a weight lifting club there and the coach we had had actually worked for a number of universities though he had to leave those jobs under certain clouds because he got rather friendly with some of the female girls that were students of his but he was a great big power lifter type guy and he actually set up uh, contests uh where outside uh, colleges and um, amateur and semi-professionals would come in and they would do the power lifting weight lifting you know thing and we actually had a few guys who were under his tutelage that actually set records for their weight classes and uh <clears throat> anyway, Spike got in there as an equipment guy when he first came, came to them. And um, he got in there about two years after he came to prison for that program. And he'd been extended in the program, which is almost unheard of. But the coach had suggested that he he needed to have the this balance and stuff. And actually, the coach was later found out to have been providing steroids to his power lifter guys. And... The thing about Spike when I first met him was he was like a walking brick, <laughs> you know, and 
if you know people who did really heavy steroids, they, they, they can't walk in a, a normal way. It's kind of a bum, bum, bum. And this is him. And the thing was, but the other thing that <clears throat> would grab your attention is his face was heavily tattooed, which at that time, there weren't a lot of guys with tattoos in prison on their faces. You know, he had a, a big eagle on the forehead coming down with claws, you know, on it. He had an ink bottle spilling ink on one side. You know, he had a dragon over here breathing fire across his lips. You know, you know he had this lightning bolt going down the center of his nose. And, his, and he had the, the full beard going down to his neck where it was like ghouls and goblins and things tearing out of the skin and all this stuff. So people see that and a lot of people go, oh, you know, and and the thing. And uh, for the way I met him was that um, because I came in with the amount of time I had, and because I had been a motor, uh, been a biker and rode motorcycles and was had been with a club and stuff. The first board um, review I had nine months in said, "This is the kind of stuff you need to do if you ever want to get paroled. You got to do these things. You need to take AA." And I said, but I'm not an alcoholic. And he said, well, the way we're looking at it, with the amount of time you might end up doing all said and done, you'll probably become an alcoholic because you'll have a reason to drink. And this is what the guy tells me, right? <clears throat> he says, so give me, give, me some, give me some time. And he goes, and then I'll write you off of it. You know, just, but show me you're willing to do your, do your best. And I went, oh, okay. So <laughs> I signed up um, with AA, with the secretary, um, and the, the guy who was the secretary, everybody called him chicken wing because he had been a thalidomide baby and he had one arm that was all kind of shrunken up and he only had three fingers on it. And his thumb was actually his big toe off his right foot that they'd actually put on to make a thumb so he could, you know, work with that, you know, and he was like really skinny, couldn't, couldn't put hardly any weight on his stuff, but I met him on the weight pile, funny enough. And he had had special gloves made and stuff. And he was trying to lift weights and, and I saw he struggling. So I went over and I, I first offered and he says, well, I don't need your help. He goes, I, I'm a man. And I went, yeah, well, that's fine. But you know, there's time when you're lifting too much weight and you need help. So I spotted for him. And then when he realized I wasn't going to clown him, wasn't going to play him, wasn't going to, you know, be abusive like a lot of guys because they'd call him chicken wing, and, you know, flipper and things like that. And I would actually confront people about that, you know, give them the respect, you know, and stuff. And so he signs me up for the AA because I happened to find out he's secretary. So I get him to sign me up. So we go to the AA thing and uh, I'm sitting in the, in the group there and, and I took a reading book with me because, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to be here in person, but I'm not going to be here in presence you know, type thing, you know? So I've got my book and stuff. And um, about the third, they, they have, they go, okay, we've got some new members now. And, uh, they called up one guy and said, could you tell us your story? And the guy gets up there and says, Hey, uh, yeah, my name is like Bill and you know, and I'm an alcoholic and a drug user and stuff. And they went, yeah, good Bill. You know, and then he got down the next guy go out of my, you know, my, you know, my name is Jesus and you know, and I'm a drug addict and da, 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 da. Oh, good. Jesus. And then they go, yo, know, Hey, Morgan, come on up here. And I'm, I'm, what? And I look around and everybody's looking at me and I go, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I, <laughs> I'm just here. I'm not participating in this shit. No, no, everybody's got to participate It's part of the thing. You know? So I get up there and I go, okay. And they go, uh, so tell us your name. I said, my name is Morgan Kane. Well, why are you here? I'm here because you weak piss ass motherfuckers can't take care of your own business and you cry all the time about that the reason you did this crime or did that crime was because you're a drug addict or an alcoholic just get right you're fucked up know you're fucked up and leave it at that right and everybody goes just sit down sit down sit down i said okay well thank you now that now we've we got that worked out i won't be called up ever again so we have a break about halfway through they've had a couple of people get up and do these talks and all of a sudden i'm sitting there looking at my book he goes, they call you by Rose to come up and get a cup of coffee, you know, and cookies and stuff. And I'm, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden there's a shadow over me. And I look up and there's Spike sitting there. And he's like, you know, I'm the sergeant at arms. I go, okay. And he goes, uh, I, I think you've misunderstood what the purpose of this program is. 
I said, no, I haven't. He goes, well, we're here to help people with their addictions. And I said, that's fine. I said, I've got one addiction, one addiction only, and I don't want to get rid of it. And he goes, what's that? I said, motorcycles. I said, I have absolutely no entire thing of ever getting rid of that addiction. <laughs> and he goes, well, do you think that not having a motorcycle could drive you to drugs or drinking? I said, no, but it could cause me to want to get into somebody's face. Right. And so I stand up now he's thicker than I am. And he's about two inches taller than I am, but we're chin to chin. And, and he sees it, that I may not be the guy that's going to back down and, you know, play the game. He goes, well, we don't want new members to disrupt, be disruptive. I said, look, leave me alone. I'm reading my book. I'm going to get me a cup of coffee. I'm going to be good. Okay. And he goes, well, we'll talk later. I said, oh yeah, okay. We'll talk later. And he walked off. So I get my cup of coffee and I'm sitting there you know, and I see him moving around the room. You know, and I'm thinking, oh crap. You know, he's, he's going to sneak up on me. This is what I'm thinking, right? And he comes over and all of a sudden he pulls a chair up and he sits down next to me. He goes, I would like to be your sponsor. My sponsor? He goes, I know that deep inside that you have addictions besides motorcycles. You're just yearning to try out. I tell him, look, no, I'm not. And he goes, well, I see you have tattoos. And I go, yeah. He goes, that's an addiction. He goes, you just don't realize, but that's another addiction you have. I said, no. And he goes, you notice... I have a few tattoos. I said, yeah, I, I've seen that. And he goes, well, do you know why I've got my tattoos? I said, no, I don't know why you got your tattoos. And he goes, well, when I first came to prison, I was very small and I was very pretty. And this one lifer came up to me and said, son, you're going to have a hard road unless you start hitting the iron pile and you make people think you're crazy. And so the guy said, let me help you be crazy. And he tattooed a couple of tattoos on my face. And then people thought I was crazy. And then people left me alone. And then I hit the weight pile. And I hit the weight pile. And as I got bigger, other people wanted to work out with me. And then we hit bigger weight. And that's how I got these tattoos on my face. And that's how I got so big. And I go, you know, weightlifting's an addiction. And he goes, well, yeah, it can be if you don't use it right. And I said, well, do you do it right? And he goes, I'm all natural. And I'm looking at him. I go, you, 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 you were going to sell that to me. I said, I'm all natural. I said, my skin is not trying to burst. I said, I walk and my legs don't touch each other and making the corduroy sound as you move. You know? <laughs> and, and he's like, well, I take protein shakes. Yeah. Okay. And I, and I go, okay. And so he goes, well, we'll talk the next time. I said, okay. And he picks a chair and he goes off I'm sitting there. And so the guy leans over and he goes, you know, Spike's really tough. I go, he's really tough. He goes, yeah. He goes, you know, he's got more than a hundred tattoos. Yeah. He goes, well, you can't, you, you, if you're, if you're, you can't be tough if you don't have that many tattoos. So, well, then I guess I'll never be tough because I don't have a hundred tattoos. And, and he goes, well, I'm just letting you know, because, you know, if he doesn't like you, you're going to know it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm good with that. Yeah. So, so I go back and I get to the yard and the secretary comes up to me and he says, what the hell was that? And he goes, everybody knows I signed you up and everybody wanted to know why did I bring the asshole here? I told him, I said, look, it didn't mean to have anything to do with you. Didn't mean to put anything on you. I said, I'll get it squared away. And he goes, well, he goes, personally, I liked it because he goes, you know, some of those guys are just in there for the damn chrono and they're not really even working, even though they do have anything. He goes, but he goes, at least you put it forth. The fact that, you know, you didn't think so. We had this lady named Kathy Bethel, and she was the counselor, CC2, correctional counselor 2, who oversaw the program. Next day, I get called to her office. And she says, you know, I'm going to tell you right now that if you want to get a decent chrono out of this, you have to attend every one, and you have to participate whenever you're called upon. Oh, okay. And I said, okay, I'll put forth an effort. She goes, good. She goes, so what's your drug of choice? I said, Harley Davidson. <laughs> and she goes, no, no, no. 
your drug? I said, Harley Davidson. I said, you don't realize I eat, drink, and sleep motorcycles. And if you cut me, I bleed 60 weight. <laughs> and she's like, oh, you're going to be, you know, a hard case. I said, no. I said, I don't drink and I don't do drugs. I don't smoke cigarettes. She goes, but you're a biker. I said, yeah. And she goes, and that somehow you're, you know, able to avoid these vices. I said, look, when I took Biker 101, those were not options of, you know, that I had to take to pass the course. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, exactly. I said, you don't, if you've never been there, you're not going to understand. If you have, I don't have to explain. Yeah. So she goes, okay, well, I'm expecting you to be more participating next time. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so a couple of weeks go by. I've been in the, into the thing. No, nobody's come approach me. I haven't been pulled up or anything. Been a few weeks. All of a sudden, Spike gets up there and he's doing his little stuff. And he goes, and I have a volunteer tonight. <laughs> Morgan Kane's going to volunteer tonight to come up and talk about his addiction. And so, <laughs> so I go up there and uh, I go, hi, I'm Morgan Kane. They go, hi, Morgan. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. okay. And they go, uh, so he goes, so he's standing kind of doing the, the co-hosting type thing. And he goes, uh, so when did you first know you had an addiction? I say, inner uteral. He goes, what? I say, inner uteral. He goes, what the hell is that? I said, well, that was when my mom was pregnant with me. He goes, so your mom used drugs? I said, no. He goes, well, then how did you know you had a problem? I said, I didn't say I had a problem. I said, that's why I knew I had an addiction. And he goes, well, what, how did you know that? I said, well, because I was born on the Isle of Man. I was living off the corner of Hillbury, which is off the, morning, the mountain course. And I could smell petrol leaking into my mom and i could hear the motorcycles roar in the ambiotic fluid and everybody in the room is like staring at me with dead eyes All right? I bet. and he goes well i don't think we i don't think we quite understand i said well it's, i'll make it simple when i was five years old i was given this motorcycle toy it was a little gold motor toy and I said, and it was my favorite toy. It's really the only toy I ever remember. And I carried it everywhere with me. I said, and I would think that that would mean that's an addiction. I mean, you're always looking for the next high. My high was every time I opened my hand, I'd see my little toy. I was happy. I, thought, hey, I don't think that's good. Okay, let me tell you. I said, <laughs> I met this guy named Joe and he was a biker and he lived right down the road. I was eight years old. And every time he'd go by, I'd wave at him like a madman. And one day he stopped and I told him, man, I said, you got a great motorcycle. And he goes, have you ever ridden one? I said, no, but I want to. And he walked up the door and he asked my, the grandma Toby, who was taking care of me, if he could take me for a ride. And she said, yeah. So the next day he came over, I got on the back of his Harley and we ripped off down back, black, you know, baseline road, no helmets, because of course we didn't need helmets back then. I'm holding on for dear life onto his denim jacket and we're just going. And he goes, I said, I'm telling you what, it was probably better than any high anybody's ever gotten from a drug. And I said, because I still remember that today. I said, most people can't remember one high from the other when they've done drugs. I said, the best they can remember is they, you know, that somewhere along the line, they lost their clothes, but they don't know beyond that. Right. And he's like, okay i think we've heard enough from morgan tonight you know and he starts clapping <laughs> and, and and i walk back and everybody's just kind of following me with you know like what the hell yeah so he comes up to me a couple of days later on the he catches me over at the gym and uh i'm not part of the weightlifting club and the power weightlifting club so i can't use the they they had um the, like these universal machines and they had you know um all the the big, you know, power weights and stuff. So I had to use the little free weights and stuff, you know, 90 pounds for pullovers and, you know, things like that. No, no, nothing above 90 pounds in dumbbells and, you know, nothing beyond about 300 pounds in barbell stuff, you know, so I, I was limited to what I could play with. <laughs> and he comes over and he goes, you know, uh, the coach would like to talk to you. I went, oh God. I said, is he, is he a sponsor too? He goes, no, 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 no. So I come over. He tells me, how would you like to be my equipment boy? I said, well, 
I'm not Buddy's boy. And he goes, well, equipment man. I said, yeah, no, I got, I got a job. I, I'm good with it, you know. And he goes like, well, you know, he goes, I see you come here pretty regular. I said, yeah. And he goes, and, and you're in pretty good shape, but I could get you in better shape. And I'm looking around at his power team. And I said, like those guys? He goes, well, yeah, I could get you up to that. I said, yeah, I don't, I don't want to wear it. look like that. And he goes, well, I could get you into my weightlifting team. And these were the guys that were all ripped and, you know, all that stuff. But most of them were really small, kind of scrawny guys as far as build. They were what, you know, because you, you have, uh, they were what they call ectomorphic. And you have ectomorphic, and those are the guys that, you know, really have to work, but then they get really good cuts, you know. And then you have like your mesiomorphs and they're the perfect bodybuilders. They just think about weights and they get the six pack and, and all that. And I fall more on the endomorphic side, which means that I can get thick. I just can't get the cuts that other people have necessarily. And so I'm explaining this to him. And it was really funny because he looks at me and he goes, so you've done some reading. I tell him, yeah, I've, I've done some reading. And I said, also, I've never had a weight pile injury. And as I knew a number of his guys did. He goes, well, how's that? I said, because I have a Navy medical background and uh, I know how far to push myself and how far not to. And I stop before and then make sure I have heal up time and all this stuff. And he goes, well, then you would be a good part of this team because you could help me. You could be a junior coach. And I'm like, yeah, that's not happening either. You know, we're not going to do it. So I come out and I'm walking back from the gym and Spike's sitting there with two cups of coffee. He goes, can I give you a cup of coffee? I said, you've been sitting out here? He goes, yeah. I said, is it hot? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I just stung it up over here with this socket. And he goes, so it's hot. So we're sitting there talking. And he's like, you know, you're different. He goes, I haven't figured you out yet. He goes, you're not this hardcore convict guy, but you don't want to be a part of any of the prison cultural stuff. But everybody says you're pretty decent. I said, okay. And he goes, you know, I kind of like you. And he goes, I don't know why. I just kind of like you. Said, okay. I said, well, I appreciate the future if you just didn't call me up on stage like that. If you're going to do it, give me a heads up beforehand. And he goes, yeah, but you're so much fun when we get you up there because you you, you, you really don't know what you're going to say next. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's been my, I've been going to him for like six months and we've interacted, we've interacted stuff. All of a sudden we find out that Spike's getting ready to go to the borough board and he's really excited. He's got an outside sponsor that's writing letters for him. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's meeting, uh, a few people that are, you know, have come in as, as outside guests who spoke to him and given stuff like that. And then he tells us, that, yeah, and, he's, and his uncle's going to give him a job. So we go, to, we go to the meeting, and he's going to tell everybody all this stuff, right? And he's, everybody's clapping for him. He says, and I've got a job waiting for me. He goes, my uncle sells vacuum cleaners door to door, and I'm going to get a job doing that. So, and everybody's clapping, yay! And so he gets off. The break happens. I go get a cup of coffee. I walk over to him. I said, Spike, I said, you know, you're a decent guy, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you came to my door trying to sell vacuum cleaners, <laughs> looking like you do, I said, I'd have, I'd have you out of there in the back of a police car. I said, it's simply, I said, you're too big. You're too scary looking. The average citizen will, will be just completely frozen. He goes, but they won't even have heard my, my spiel. My uncle's giving me a spiel. I said, yeah. I said, you know, yeah, I don't know how you're going to do that. You just aren't going to be able to do this, right? So anyway, so he goes to the board and they basically tell him the same thing. Tell him, yeah, that's not the kind of job we want you to have. Okay. So I've been in AA now about a year and, um, uh, he gets up there one time. He talks about, I've got me a girlfriend now. And he goes, and she's lovely. And he goes, uh, we've applied for family visits because we want children. And he goes, but we got to wait till we get married and we're going to get married in a couple of weeks and stuff. And I've invited this guy and this guy too, the guys in the group to be, his, be at his wedding because you're allowed two other inmates to be there. So 
the day of his wedding was Sunday. And after the wedding ceremony, they all go out to the visiting room and they can have like a little out of the vending machines. They can have a little party type thing. And they're sitting over there. I happen to have my partner dwarf and his gal come up and we're sitting over here. And, uh, so, so dwarf and I were talking and he, you know, he's my, one of my club brothers and we're talking and he, uh, he goes, look at that gal over there. And I said, yeah. And he goes, God, she's a slob. I go, what? And he goes, look at her feet. And she had flip-flops on, but she had dropped the flip-flops off, had her feet up on a table where people put the food stuff, and there was dirt falling off her feet onto the table, Ooh. right? And uh, he goes, man, he goes, she's really nasty. And his lady had said she'd gone to the toilet, and this gal had been in there and uh, was asking anybody if they had any deodorant she could borrow, you know? And uh, said that she had this, as they said, you know, fly attraction to her, right? And and I'm saying, well, you know, that, that's Spike's uh, new wife. He just married her today. And the lady goes, she got married in a potato sack because of the dress she was wearing was just like brown and yellow. And, you know, it was just really, really sad looking type clothes, right? And I'm like, well, you know teach his own i can't i can't make any judgment i've i've had two bad marriages i you know i can't i'm not the person to make judgment so anyway any leave so i come back out and spike and i are going through the strip out going back from visits and he's like did you see my wife i said well yeah he goes well, real good looker huh and i said you yeah. know in your eyes i'm sure she's the most beautiful thing in the world and he goes yes she is and i went good for you you know <laughs> And I get back, him. and as soon as I get back to yard, everybody's got the word out about you know how just or you know horrible. And one of the guys says, "Yeah," he goes, "My wife was in the bathroom and said that she had to, she took out her teeth to rinse them off before she put them back in. Apparently, she had no teeth; she had false teeth. Now, whether he knew that or not, I don't know. But anyway, but he'd met her through one of his cousins' sisters' girlfriends, that type of one of those things where just some gal. So anyway. Sure enough, another year, another six months goes by. He's going back up to the board again. Now he's got a new job and now he's got a wife and she's pregnant. You know, they've had their family visit and she's like four months pregnant. So he's going to the board and uh, he goes in and he doesn't tell us what his job's going to be this time, right? He just leaves that out. He comes back and he's got this big smile. The very He doesn't tell anybody after he comes back board, doesn't tell anybody. He's just got a big smile. Two days later, we go back to the AA meeting. He comes in. He goes, I've got to talk. I've got to talk. He gets up there and he says, they found me suitable. He goes, I'm going to be going home. He goes, they like my job. And everybody's like, okay, what's your job? He goes, mixing cement. I said, well, yeah, that's... Uh, that would be a job that would probably fit you really well. He goes, yeah, my wife's dad is the one that hired me because he's really happy. He's going to have a grandchild. Well, that's, that's, that's good. And he goes, yep. He goes, I'm looking forward to it. He goes, especially when we do our trips to Mexico to get the bags of cement and bring them back over. <laughs> and there's like this dull silence. And we're like, Mm, there's like cement companies here in California and you know, you know, and uh, he goes, and he's going to pay me $50 an hour. And all I've got to do is help load the truck. <laughs> yeah. So he comes out and I ask him, I said, <clears throat> have you met, have you met your father-in-law? He goes, Oh yeah. He came up. He took a look at me and said, yep, you're the guy I need. He goes, you, you, you can lift the bags and uh, you can make sure nobody comes up and molests the truck and take tries to take our stuff. He goes, I told him, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> and then, sure enough, 90 days later, Spike tooled out the gate. Yeah. And uh, went off to have his nice little new life. About six months after that, I get counsel pulled in by the counselor and she tells me well you've done two years you don't have a history of drug and alcohol or you know issues and we have people on the waiting list that do 
we'd like to you to give up your seat. And I said, I'm going to give up my seat to you. Give me a chrono for the board that says I participate. She burned me off a chrono right then. I got out. They, I took it at that little board guy. He was happy. We were all good and stuff. About eight years later, a guy comes up and he says, hey, you remember Spike? I said, yeah, I remember Spike. He goes, you know what happened to him? I said, yeah, he went out and he got a job with his father-in-law, you know, and stuff. He goes, well, yeah, and that worked out pretty well for about three years. Says, uh, apparently, you know, he got grabbed up by the Federales in Mexico because apparently their cement was coming out of Colombia. And, and he was at a dock loading up the truck. And uh, funny enough, he was the only American there with all the Mexican workers because his father-in-law had basically let him handle all the transportation. And um, yeah, so he wrote a couple letters to a couple of guys saying, boy, it's really messed up down here. He goes, you know, they've given me, you know, more years than I can count. And they did it all in Spanish, which makes it worse because I don't be sure how much time I'm doing you know. And uh, yeah, so you are literally the best to- storyteller <laughs> ever. That was what about half an hour? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And anyone, anyone who wants to come on the podcast, take, take notes. Yeah. Because take notes. when you're telling the story, tell it and just let us sit here. <laughs> not. I actually just yeah, I was I was like this to begin with, and I was just like, nah, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> The way he just sets the table, describes everything, just takes you through it, stories at length. We don't have to say anything. No, we ask you a question, you give us a 10-second answer and make it real pain in the ass for us to interview. And tell us to read it in your book. Yeah, but if um, if you don't mind, I'd like to go with uh, Which, this one here. Um, yeah. Stupid youngsters, their dealings with a house angel. Yeah. And where was that? <laughs> that was at Avenal. Avenal. Yeah. Oh, wow. Let's go with that one. So um, I, get tra- I, I get transferred to Avenal state prison and um initially avenal was ch- the only thing in avenal prior to this prison really be- built there was two truck stops and about 50 hookers that was really that was the main reason for you base stopping and in thing i mean you had good truck stops and then you had the hookers you know um uh, there were a lot of mobile home empty mobile homes out there you could rent them for 50 dollars a month and you know nobody asking what you were doing there and stuff and um i mean i get transferred down there <clears throat> and uh, one of the first things I find out is they uh, they start sending CYA rollovers down to us, California Youth Authority, youth prison guys. Well, normally, if you were sentenced to the CYA, you could be uh, basically as young as like 12, maybe 10, depending on the crime. And if you stayed out of trouble... You could actually stay there till you were like 25, but most people got kicked out around 18 to 21. But you did have that faction of guys who wanted to be a lot more than they wanted to be all they could be. And um, we'd be getting kicked out when they were 16. And uh, I was really lucky. I, I got one of these 16 year old kids. I got this kid named Kina and he was from the town of Avenal, which was even more amazing because, you know, like I said, pretty much any children born in Avenal were from working women. Um, you know, and so, and so uh, but with Kina, the interesting thing was he didn't know who his father was because his, his mom actually worked in one of the truck stops and his dad had been a truck driver. And funny enough, I'd actually done time with his father in CMC a couple of years earlier. And, uh, but Kina comes in <laughs> and he walks up to me and he tells me, which bunk's mine? Well, I'm on the bottom bunk because this is all dorm stuff. And I go, which bunk do you think is yours? And he goes, well, I'd like the bottom one. I said, you know, that's pretty nice, but that one's up there is yours. He goes, well, you know, I sleepwalk sometime. I said, well, then you'll sleep fall sometimes too because when you come <laughs> off that, it's got solid concrete when you land, but it'll be all right. I mean, he's like, you know, you could be nicer to me. I said, I don't even know you. He goes, hey, you got a cigarette? I said, how old are you? He goes, I'm 16. Well, there was a sign up saying that if you gave coffee or cigarettes or tea to anybody under 18, you could be written up for it because you're contributing to a minor. I told him, no, you can't, you can't have a cigarette. He goes, let me have a shot of coffee. 
said, so, oh, I drink coffee when I'm on the streets. Yeah, you're not on the streets right now, right? And I said, so how long have you been down? He goes, I've got three years in. Oh, okay, yeah. Got three years in. And at, at, at this point in time, you know, I've got working on like 12. <laughs> and so, and I go, yeah. And he goes, uh, yeah. And I go, so, so what'd you do? He goes, man, I'm telling you, this is a fucked up deal. He goes, I shouldn't be even put in prison. I go, okay. He goes, so I met this girl, you know, this, when I was 12 and I was madly in love with her, but her family wouldn't have anything to do with my family because my mom and my dad had been in prison. Okay. And he goes, and so she was having her 13th birthday party and I wasn't invited. So I went and talked to some friends of my dad's and I told them, you know, this is the, I want to go to that. And they won't let me go to, it. they said, well, we're going to help you get, show them who's boss. <clears throat> so they put me in the trunk of an, an Impala and gave me an, uh, uh, an M16. And we drove by the house and I started shooting at the house because I'm going to tell him. And he goes, and then all of a sudden, they hit the gas. The car goes down. It hits one of the potholes there. The gun slip, flies out of my hand, goes out of the car, gets caught on the, the trunk lock. Trunk comes down, locks me in, you know, and the gun's bouncing down the street and they're driving down the highway. They pull on and they're going right down the highway. And not more than a mile later, there's a half a dozen highway patrol cars behind them because they see this m m rifle outside the car bouncing down the highway, right? So they get pulled over. The two grownups said, we didn't know he was in the trunk. We didn't know he had a gun. We don't even know who the kid is. And he goes, and I told him, but Uncle Eugene, you gave me the gun. He punched me in front of those cops. He goes, you would think he would protect me because I'm just a kid. I said, you just ratted him out. Well, yeah, because he was lying. He said, no, no. You just ratted out the guy who gave you the gun and drove you around well yeah but I'm, I'm i'm gonna go outside he takes off and walks out to the yard yeah <laughs> and he came down with like initially about seven eight other guys and they all got put in different places so they weren't like together <clears throat> so we're all we're all like okay this is great this is just fucking great so we got one other guy but he's on the other side of the thing and uh i'll give him credit he was actually realized the errors of his way he got a job in the library spent every time moment reading and stayed away from all the stupid stuff so the guy he was bunked with was really happy because he hardly ever saw him so a couple of weeks later another crew of these guys get kicked out of the ways and <clears throat> i come walking in and Keena's sitting there on my bunk there's two other guys sitting on my bunk and there's two guys sitting up on the upper bunk and they've spilled tobacco on my my blanket, and they you know, and they're drinking coffee and stuff. That I don't know where they got it from. I walked in. I said, "What the fuck are you doing on my bunk?" And the guy goes, "Well, you know, we're just kicking here." And this is one of the guys just sitting there that I've never seen before. I said, "Get off my bunk!" And the guy get up and goes, "You know, you, you know, you could be dealt with." I go, "What?" And I'm looking at this guy, and Keena gets up and goes, "Well, I'm sorry. I should have asked." No, no, you shouldn't have asked. You shouldn't have been on it. It's a big difference. Ask means you think I would actually say, okay. And then I pulled my blanket off and I, sh I handed it to him. I said, go get me a new, new blanket. Oh man, go get me a new blanket. Go to the clothing room, get me a new blanket. And so he goes trucking out. The other four go out and they're out in the day room. And, and the funny thing about the <laughs> Avenal, because it's a dorm living thing, they have a TV on all day long in there. And they have one that's basically for the whites one that's for the Mexicans and basically one for the blacks. So the white one has got all the real intellectual programs on. It's got Power Rangers. It's got big, big bad Beetleborgs. Bonanza. It's got, no, no, it's got all these cartoon stuff on, right? And, you, and when you walk in and you see guys in their 30s and 40s and 50s going, big bad Beetleborgs, <laughs> you know, or they're singing the Power Rangers songs. You're going, oh God, get me out of here. So, I walk out and I see these four guys and they're standing over there watching these, the TV with them. And I go into the, the toilet area and you know, it's like an open communal toilet and it's got these little plastic screens between them. And, um, I, I, I walk in there and I'm washing my hands and, uh, 
this one guy, Tank, the one that spoke to me, comes walking up and he goes, uh, Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Harry's. Having such a scratchy face, I'm always delighted to get a new Harry's set. There's a foaming gel, hydrating night lotion, and the razor with the weighted handle really gets the job done. The trimmer blade makes it so easy to get into those tricky places to reach. The shave gel offers effective lubrication and just comes off like butter. It's such a smooth shave. It shaves fast, efficiently, no discomfort, and it is so smooth by the end. The hydrating night lotion is light and non-greasy. After shaving with Harry's and using the hydrating night lotion, my skin is glowing and smooth. Harry's products are formulated with 0% sulfates, parabens, or dyes, and are alcohol-free. No nasties here. Harry's skincare products can be added to shave plans anytime, anywhere. You never have to worry about running out. Make sure to support our podcast and start your own skincare journey by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, and have your trial set delivered to your door. That's harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. You know, you better start giving us the respect we have coming. So what respect? He goes, well, we're doing hard time. I said, you're not doing hard time. You don't know what a fucking hard time is. And he's like, <clears throat> you know, some someday somebody's going to run up on you. <clears throat> I said, okay. So I walk out. And about four or five hours later, I come in. And I see him in the toilet taking a leak. And I run smooth up on, on there. And I slap the plastic thing. And he goes, what did you do that for? I said, because somebody can run up on you. And he's like, man, you're lucky my boys weren't here. I said, what do you need boys for? I said, I don't need boys. I said, I'm an old man. Well, you know, because, you know, because that's how we do it. You know, so you, you have to run in a pack. <laughs> he goes, yeah, because <coughs> we have to have to make sure we, we, we can win. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, <coughs> well, that's not always the best way to do it. So things go by and I'm like, okay, this, uh, <coughs> we, uh, Keenan gets moved off my bunk. He moves into another dorm. So he's with a couple of these other guys. So they all kind of hang out and they're always hitting up people for thing. And they started picking on old guys with gray hair. Because, you know, if you're in prison and you're old and you got gray hair, you can only be in prison for one thing. You have to be a pedophile. It's the only thing you can be in prison for if you're old and you've got gray hair. So now they're pressuring guys for coffee and tobacco and stuff, you know, or they're going to beat them up, you know, and stuff. Well, in one of the other buildings, we had this guy with long gray hair. He walked. He basically had like a dragging leg, kind of a walking, but he was kind of dragged the leg a little bit. Always wore like this really kind of, I would say almost like a dirty, raggedy type jacket. You know, you could see he'd had it for quite a while and he had uh, jeans were the same thing, worn down at the bottom and his boots were all scuffed up and all that stuff. But he'd go out to the weight pile and he would always work out by himself. Now, Powers of observation I've learned a long time ago with youngsters are not really good. I think they have a real blindness in a lot of things. Because this guy would use 90-pound dumbbells to do, you know, champagnes off his chest. And this guy was doing inclined benches of, a, you know, 200, 225 without a spotter. And, you know... He would sit there and curl with like 75 pound dumbbells in each arm. And, and so this is just one of those things you think maybe this isn't the guy you want to go over and, and say things to. So one day he's going out the weight pile and I'm on the weight pile. <clears throat> there was a couple of black guys there that I've known for a long time that were working out. And there's only like four or five of us on the weight pile this time. Cause you had to get a weight lifting card at Avenal to work, get on the weight pile. If you didn't have one, if you got caught on the way, pal, you were kicked off, you all know, getting all kinds of stuff. So suddenly these six guys 
come over. Tank's leading them. Keen is there. These other guys are all there. And they walk up to him and they said, hey, check this out, you fucking chest. And oh, next thing you knew, Tank's got, this guy's grabbed him by the throat and has lifted him physically while on the incline bench, physically lifted him up off his feet. <laughs> Sits up and throws him to the ground and says, what's the next word coming out of your fucking mouth? And he's holding a 75 pound dumbbell in his hand, right? And Iron Mike and, and Big Juan <clears throat> two black guys that were there and one had 26 inch arms and mike had 24 inch gut biceps they come running over and they said look look they ain't worth it and he tells them did you hear what they were about to call me me they were going to call me that he's saying he go, and they're going yeah they you they're they're idiots they're stupid they you know they're kids they don't know what they're talking about and one of the other guys go yeah you just lucky you got you know, got that grip on Tank because if he'd gotten a hold of you, you'd have been done. And Tank's still trying to get his fucking breath back. You can see the fear in his eyes, like, <laughs> shut the fuck up. You're about to get me, you know, smashed, right? And the other guys are all standing there. And, and, the, and the guy who's mouthing now is going, you know, if you just pay us a pack of tobacco every week and you give us a jar of coffee, we can let you stay on our yard. The guy gets up. And he, t- he's, he takes off his jacket and he grabs his sweatshirt and he pulls his sweatshirt off and it says Hell's Angels across his stomach and chest here, right? And there's four bullet holes on, <laughs> that you can see on him. You can see a big rip in his arm here, right? Where it's been scarred up and stuff. And uh, you're looking at it and, it and the thing was at the time, <laughs> you know, it's got a he's got a Colorado state patch on his side, right? Come to find out, <clears throat> the reason he dragged that leg is that the shot, cops shot him off his motorcycle and he went down at about seventy five miles an hour, and so he tore a bunch of muscles in his leg and on his arm and stuff. But they shot him four times in the back on his motorcycle, and he survived it. He didn't have spotters because the only people he trusted were other angels. And we didn't have any other angels on the yard. It's real simple. Very understandable from my standpoint. <clears throat> he tells these guys, if I ever see one of you motherfuckers around me again, he goes, you won't be breathing. Right? And he goes, get away from me. And they all get off the weight pile. Right? But they're all standing across the field. And you can see they're talking like they're plotting something. And you're like... They fucking haven't learned, right? They just, just haven't learned. So for, for about a week, every time I'd go out to the yard, you'd see these guys following him as he went and walk, was he walking the yard. And, and they're going, hey, can we talk to you? Hey, can we talk to you? Get away from me. You know, he, he's going around. We, because they have a, we had, we had like a, uh, a chapel area, right? And they would show films up in here. And he goes in to see this film and they get in the row behind him and, and they're going, Hey, it's really cool that you're a hell's angel. Uh, can, can, can we prospect? And the next thing you know, there's a bells and alarms and all this <laughs> shit going off. I'm on the yard, but guys that were in there were telling me the conversation going on. Fucking dozen cops go running in there. About half of them come running back out yelling for you know for them to call for medical and shit you know next thing you know you see them dragging the the angel out right and while they're dragging him out he still has one of the guys by the mouth he's got his hand in this guy's mouth death grip on him dragging him the cops are hitting him on his arm trying to get him to break finally they break his grip on him you know and get him up gaffle him up and take him off and they take him to the hole and they charged him for assaults on minors. No. Yeah. <laughs> he got charged for, for doing assaults on minors, right? And the AW for our yard came on and, and did a big announcement saying, <clears throat> now you older guys need to learn how to mentor these young guys, you know, and you have to realize that they're still underage and, you know, they may not act like you think they should. So, treat them nice and guys are telling fuck you throwing shit up there at them and stuff and tell them you know look then get them out of our prison if they don't know how to act get them out of the prison because they're going to start getting stabbed is what's going to happen right 
they end up slapping the guy with like another eight years, you know, for, for, cause a couple of the guys were, were pretty badly hurt, you know? And, um, uh, <laughs> I, re I remember the guy that he was bunked with that had the upper bunk came over and said, you know, uh, I've got all this stuff. I don't know what the hell to do with it. I said, well, if you got his stuff, look through, see if you can find an address, pack it up, mail it to the address. He goes, well, who's going to pay me for that? I said, I wouldn't worry about that right now, but I said, I'll guarantee you, if you do this right, somebody's going to appreciate it, right? So he writes a note and says, hey, look, this is what happened, blah, 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 blah. Because when you get through, first got thrown in the hole, it was like two weeks before you can write anybody and you can't make calls and stuff. <clears throat> so anyway, he sends it out. Oh, I guess it was like six months later. He gets called to the package room. He never gets packaged. He gets called to the package room. And there's a 30-pound package of food and clothes and all this stuff in there. And there's a little note in there saying, you know, thanks. That's all, just thanks. And he's like, I don't know who the hell it came from because it had a name <clears throat> he didn't recognize and stuff. I said, I'll guarantee you that was because you sent all that stuff because he had pictures of other Hell's Angel brothers and he had a bunch of other stuff, you know, his property and stuff and thing. And, um, Anyway, th that guy, he did get out of the, there, but they gave him a transfer within <laughs> within about two weeks. They put him on a different yard, <clears throat> and it, it started up again where youngsters were now thrilled with wanting to talk to this guy, and they're not understanding. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to deal with them. They they end up transferring to him, Solidad, and from what last I'd heard from a couple other guys up there, he got up there, and there were a couple other Angel brothers, and they just kind of hung out together, and they basically they they deal their own thing, but they. They wouldn't deal with this. <clears throat> now, Kena, as I said, he'd been my bunkie. The thing about Kena, like I said, I knew his dad. And uh, when he was telling me, he goes about, yeah, whose dad was and stuff. And I said, yeah, I remember your dad. And he goes, yeah, he man, he, he's a really bad motherfucker, isn't he? I said, no, he's not. I said, basically, he stayed to himself. He avoided any conflicts he could. He goes, yeah, but you know, he was done wrong. He goes, because when he shot that motherfucker, he goes, that park ranger didn't have to testify against him. And he, he shot a guy. He got a, a, um, a great bodily injury. He didn't, get a, didn't kill the guy. So he only did a couple of years. He gets out. He went up to the National Park, King, <laughs> Kingsview, Kingsview National Park, and uh, outside of Fresno, and uh, got into a group of visitors that were all going around and came upon that park ranger and gunned the park ranger down in front of everybody. <clears throat> now, to show you just how smart he is, he shoots the guy six times, starts to reload the gun, and gets jumped by a half a dozen guys in the group. Now he's in a federal prison because this is a <clears throat> U.S. National Park, blah, blah, blah. So he now goes there. And now he's got a life sentence because he killed a park ranger, which is like killing a police officer stuff. Now, while I'm there, Kena's telling me, yeah, people, people aren't going to punk my family. And he goes, my brother's in for doing a drive-by shooting. Yeah. He goes, that's right. He goes, he went and shot up a college dormitory because a girl wouldn't date him. And I said, and how did he get caught? And he goes, well, the girl started throwing shoes and stuff down at him and he was on a stairwell and he started running down the stairwell and he tripped and fell and broke both of his kneecaps and, and his shoulder. And he couldn't crawl away fast enough before the, the security could get him. Yeah, that he goes, I go, where's he? <clears throat> he goes, oh, you know, he, he's down at Tehachapi. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, he goes, and right now he goes, I can't get anything from my mom because she's doing time right now. And I said, well, what's she doing time for? He goes, well, because she cut up one of the whores that wasn't going to pay her for money for working at the truck stop. And I said, yeah, you know. This is a functional family, you know? <laughs> and he goes, well, we're, we're well known. Yeah, but I don't want to think what you're well known for. And he goes, what are you trying to say? I said, you know, you know, you're kind of like really idiots, right? <laughs> and, and he's like, well, if my dad was here. I said, if your dad was here, he would just look at me the way you're looking at me. He wouldn't say anything more to me. And then he goes, well, you know, you... you you just think that you're something special. And I said, no, I don't think I'm something special. I just think I'm more than what you are at the moment. <clears throat> so a few days later, 
He comes up and he goes, I've decided I'm going to change. And I went, oh yeah? And he goes, and I want you to teach me how to lift weights. There you do. He goes, yeah. He goes, I figured out that I can lift the same amount of weight you can. You think so? He goes, yeah. Okay, so I said, well, meet me tomorrow. So I get him out on the weight pile. I was doing 150 pound suicides off my forehead with a back arm bar. So I go, okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to grab the bar, pull it up, do this, take it back, pull it up, do this, right? I said, but what we're going to do is we're going to start you here so that you, you can get the rhythm. Okay, so I'm holding it, spotting him, but I'm standing off to the side for the front. I go, okay, take it over, takes it over. The whole body goes off the bench, you know, flips off backwards. He goes, what happened? I said, you didn't have your feet planted. He did this about seven times. I said, maybe we ought to start with a little bit less weight. And he's like, well, how much less weight? Well, let's just try, tr trust me on this. Let's try this. I said, we'll go with 30 pounds. 30 pounds? I said, have you ever lifted 30 pounds before? He goes, well, no. I said, well, let's go with 30 pounds. So he takes it, gets it over, brings it up, and bounces it off his forehead. Gets this nice big bruise across his forehead said that's why we're doing 30 pounds and then i kept kept him from doing that again and uh then i got him to do some flies and some other things next morning i get up for breakfast and they go come on keenan and he goes i'll come along in a minute okay so i go off to breakfast i come back he's still in bed I said man you missed breakfast yeah i'm okay i go what's wrong i can't move my arms and his arms had actually swollen up from too much fluid building up in it from, from overworking them. And he goes, I, I, and he looked like Popeye. His arms were all, but he, he's like, yeah, I, I can't get my arms up. And I'm like, you broke him. I broke him. Yeah. I <laughs> broke the kid. So anyway, he tells, uh, he goes to one of the cops and tells the cops that, uh, he doesn't like Avenal. Avenal's not a friendly place. He wants to go back to YA right and i don't know they talked about something anyway he goes and he gets moved to another yard where there's more of the youngsters than on our yard and then gets caught up in a in a melee with guys in wheelchairs you know they because they had what's called the pick we called it the pick apart yards yard five at avenal <clears throat> they had all the guys in wheelchairs and you used to have the problem with the guys in wheelchairs when they'd get mad at each other. They'd roll up, lock the wheelchairs, and throw themselves up and swing for as long as they could before they fall back into their wheelchairs. <clears throat> and some of them, some of them would have it to where they would pull their arm of their chair up. And, they like and stop rubbing chairs. Huh? Start rubbing chairs. Well, they'd, they'd try to rub that, but what they would do is they'd just, they'd run their chairs up as close as they could. And like I said, and they don't have belts on them. And they'd throw, throw themselves, push themselves up because they're usually got upper body and, and then they would fight. But there was a few guys that had taken the arms out of their chairs and gotten them sharpened up on the cement so they could actually try to stab somebody. But to be in the pick-apart yard was a privilege because you could work at PI Metal Fab. So you got paid good money. You could you know, make up to 90 cents an hour if you got to lead positions. But to get there, you had to sleep on the upper bunks because you had to, part of your job was help you get your, your handicap bunkie ready for the day, you know? And that could entail a number of different things, you know, because some of them had colostomy bags and some of them had pee bags and, you know, and stuff like that. But anyway, they got over there and what ended up happening is this group of wheelchair guys and this group of wheelchair guys had issues. And what, what the issues were, I never knew, never understood, but they went to their... <clears throat> never heard anything like this before in my life. Yeah. Wheelchair <laughs> prison gang wars. <laughs> And, and and these and these guys would actually they actually got their bunkies who were able bodied to basically get in there and help help fight, you know. So so some of the guys were fighting the guys in the wheelchairs, and some were fighting the guys that weren't in wheelchairs. But it had this big melee on the on this yard of about of about forty people, and probably about fifteen of those were in wheelchairs or so, you know. We've lost yeah. all. Yeah. So yeah, you know, and and because of that, he didn't get to go to where he wanted he ended up going being sent to hatchery max because apparently he was one of the silly guys that had put a couple of cans of stew in a sock and uh 
was cracking people with. And so each can of, is a pound can. So you got two pounds of, of weight wrapped up in a pair of socks. And uh, it's like putting a lock in sock, only a bit worse. And uh, he clocked a few people and that and caused some major damage. And they wrote him, got him a new beef, got him salt with deadly weapons, got him, you know. And they, they ended up tagging him up as, as being in part of a disruptive group. Because they couldn't say gang because they weren't actually identified as an actual gang, but they were a disruptive group. And then he got shipped to Atchby, and I never got to see him again. These stories, <clears throat> these stories are not ending well for the protagonists. But <sighs> Jamie Morgan Kane is on fire. This is like the energy we saw him in podcast one. Mind blowing content that we've never ever heard before. <laughs> Wheelchair Definitely. prison gang wars. So, wherever you want to go. Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> well, what's the next prison one? Many, well, they're all, they're all these. Prisons. They're all prisons. <laughs> are they uh, all prison? Yeah, we can go much with, more, many more with Rory. Many more Rory. Um, yeah, SQ. What is it? Yeah, San Quentin. Okay. Oh, San Quentin. So, <clears throat> the guy, I met this guy, and this may be a bit hard for a lot of younger people to know. But there was an actor named Rory Calhoun. He was a Western actor. And he was a pretty decent actor. <clears throat> well, this guy, when I first got to San Quentin, I, I get put in, in uh, a blo- uh, Alpine section. You know, and that's A block, and it's South, South block, A section. I go in, and the cop tells me, <clears throat> go see Rory. And uh, I look over, and there's this guy sitting out in front of a cell. He's got shorts on. He's got six inch tall high cowboy boots on and he's he's got a leather vest on a tank top and he's got a stetson hat sitting in a recliner chair out in front of the cell petting a cat right (laughs) and i'm looking at the guy and i said him he goes yeah and i said you see an inmate and he goes yeah he's the lead porter in the building i went oh okay and i walk over I go, Rory? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, I'm moving in, and I'm up on third tier, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, okay, let me get your fish kit. And he gets up, and I'm looking in his cell. And in his cell, he's got a fish tank there. He's got, like, this, n- like, knitted, uh, you know, quilt on his bed, knitted co- bed cover. And he's got one of these lights that has the chain where the cord goes through it. And it says Coca-Cola on it, right? Hanging up in his cell, you know? And it's the cat sitting in the chair there. And he comes back and he gives me a blanket and a couple of blankets and some other stuff. And, and I go, that's your cell? He goes, yeah. And I go, okay. He goes, yeah. He goes, uh, matter of fact, last month I was in better cells and penitentiaries. Okay. Uh and he goes, oh, you didn't get the joke. You know, better homes and gardens, you know, better pen- cells and penitentiaries. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, I get that. <clears throat> I said, they allow you to have fish tanks? He goes, well, they used to let us have the fish. He goes, but then people were, too many people were getting them, but they were using it to hide their knives under the sand. He goes, if you notice, I don't have any sand in mine. So I get to keep my fish tank. I don't even fish, but I get to keep it. He goes, it calms me down. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and the thing about Rory is he was about six foot two. He's probably about, oh, maybe 180 pounds. Not real muscular, but just very, you know. But he had that like Western Texas type drawl type thing. And um, we're walking. He goes, uh, just so you know, uh, my name's not Rory. I go by Rory. And I go by Rory because I look like Rory Calhoun. I went, oh, okay. Yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> okay. And he goes, you knew who that is? I said, actually, I do. And I started telling him something about it. I knew him. So anyway, he walks me all the way up to my cell. And he yells at the guard on the, the gun walk to yell at a guard in a post to pop my door so I can get in. And he says, uh, come on down and see me after chow. And I've got, I'll give you a few other things you got coming and stuff. But I just don't have time to go get them. Okay, so I come back down afterwards <clears throat> so <laughs> i'm i'm talking to him and, and the thing is that this time in prison you were only allowed to have ball caps you could only have a ball cap you know um you could put a bandana on your head you could have a ball cap that type of thing <clears throat> so he's got a stetson and i'm kind of like how's he how's he got a stetson right it just seems like 
So, so one day I'm talking to this other guy on the yard that lives in the same building. I said, you know Rory? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, he's wearing a Stetson. He goes, yep. And I go, well, how come he's got a, how did he get a Stetson in here? He goes, well, it's real simple because it's a ball cap. And I go, it's a ball cap. He goes, yeah. He said he went to the warden one day, caught the warden walking in the yard, Daniel Vasquez, and said, look, I want a ball cap. I mean, I go, I want a Stetson. He goes, and, and he said, well, you can only have ball caps. He goes, a Stetson is a ball cap. He goes, you proved to me that one baseball team wears Stetsons, and I'll let you have a Stetson. A couple months later, he catches him on the yard again, holds up a picture of the Houston Astro baseball team all wearing Stetsons, and it says, sponsored by Stetson, and they're all wearing white Stetsons. <laughs> Daniel Vasquez says, well, I'm a good to my word. You can have a Stetson. So he got his Stetson, <laughs> and he got a chrono from the warden saying he could wear his Stetson. Yeah. But he had this cat. <clears throat> and uh, Rory was doing a lot of time. And he had picked up a number of times in prison as well. So I never knew about how much time, because the idea is you're technically, it's not it's bad manners to go ask people how much time you're doing. <clears throat> but he was always really friendly, jovial, that type of thing. But he, and, I, and one day I heard him talk, discussing cats with people, right? Now, I, my job is I work in the, the medical clinic. I work in the clinic there. So um, he's talking about his cat's pregnant, and he's going to have kittens, and he sells kittens. He sells kittens for a box of cigarettes. You know, it's a 20 packs of cigarettes or whatever. You know, and he, so 200 cigarettes he gets for a kitten. And uh, the kittens are born, and I think, I don't know, they're a few weeks old. And he comes up to my cell, and he says, hey, I... Uh, could you do me a favor tomorrow? He goes, when you go to work. I said, yeah. I go, stop by and see me before you go. I said, okay. So I come down there and he's got this little wooden box, a uh, little uh, cardboard box. And uh, he goes, uh, take this in and take it to, to this certain nurse. Okay. I, I'm not thinking anything about it. As I'm walking, I'm hearing this meow, meow, meow. Right. I get him in. I walk up to this nurse and I knew her and I, and I tell her, yeah, Rory asked me, oh yeah, I've been waiting for this takes them over, opens them up, and there's all these little kittens in there, right? She breaks out needles. Her husband's a veterinarian. He gives her all the medicine. She injects all the cats, and then they go back to Rory, all right? Because she's a cat person and all this other thing like that. So anyway, we, uh, we, I get him back to Rory, and he's like, hey, that's really good. And he goes, here, here's for your troubles. And he hands me a couple packs of cigarettes. I told him, you know, I don't really smoke. I thought you were going to say a cat. <laughs> no, no, no. He, he goes, here's a couple packs of cigarettes. And I said, well, I don't really smoke it. He goes, just for, so I don't feel I owe you, take them. Okay, so I got a couple packs of cigarettes. And it's cash in prison anyway. And so so we get about, oh, about two months goes by. And he had one little kitten that wasn't doing really well. It was like the runt and stuff like that. And uh, he goes, hey, w would you like it? And he goes, I can't say it'll live, but you know, if it does, it would probably do all right with you. <clears throat> so I go, yeah, I'm thinking, I'm not really a cat person. I mean, I really haven't been around a lot of cats. So I get this little thing. And it's just, it's still at like two months. It just fits in the palm of my hands. So I bring it in and I've got powdered milk for it from the clinic and I'm doing all this stuff for it. And I break off tuna and I feed a little bit of tuna here and there and it starts to thrive and I constantly warm it. I sleep with it. It's on my neck. I've got it under my thing and it sit there and go brrr, brrr, right. So it does well. So <clears throat> I, I, I just tell him about it. Yeah. You know, it's all doing really good and stuff. And, uh, he had had like four cats over the years that he'd always kept one when he, when his one cat was getting too old, He'd always keep one back to become a breed thing. And this was just his thing. And the cops were pretty good about as long as you didn't make a problem, you could keep your cat, right? Well, <laughs> he gets a second litter of kittens, you know, and I've done this to run about for him and like that. And uh, this one guy wanted one of the cats from him. You know, my kitten at this point in time, it's like a year old or something like, you know, and um, there were other guys on the tier had him. And it was really good because my cat would never go out through the bars. 
it'd go and sit at the bars and look out. But they, the cats would go out through the back piping into the where all the pipe drainage stuff was, and they'd hunt rats and mice out there. And one time my cat did come back and pr- give me a pl- present by putting a dead mouse on my chest. But figured I was giving it food, it was going to share. You know, it was re- really good. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money, formerly Truebill. If you're missing your credit card payments or you need to make a budget, you need our favorite financial app, Rocket Money, formerly Truebill. So why did Truebill change its name to Rocket Money? I'll tell you what I heard. Truebill, now backed by Rocket Companies, has grown from a bill management app into a full-on personal finance empowerment tool that helps over 3.4 million people with budgeting, lowering bills, cancelling subscriptions and more, saving each of their members on average $700 a year. And with all that growth comes the next evolution in Truebill's story, a new name. Bottom line, Rocket Money is everything I've loved about Truebill, but with a fresh look and feel. Start cancelling your unused subscriptions and save money at rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Or download the app from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Link will be in the description box if you're watching on YouTube. But, you know, and I would go every time I went to the <clears throat> chow hall and they had fish, I would always bring back fish for them. Oh. And I'm not very <coughs> inventive with cat names. <coughs> so in Gaelic, I called it cat because K-A- K-A-Y-T is cat in Gaelic. <coughs> so <coughs> cat, you know, that's basically it. So... <clears throat> anyway, so I had it. Well, this one guy wanted a cat from, and Rory tells the guy, I'm not going to sell you one. Something about you I don't like. Don't know what. I'm not going to sell you a cat. And the guy goes, yeah, you will. You better sell me a cat. And he goes, yeah, I'm not going to sell you a cat. Okay. So we end up having to go out for our jobs and, and everything like that. And Rory happened to be off out for a medical appointment out of the prison. <clears throat> the cops came and took all of our cats. Cleaned out every cat in the, in our cell block area, right? Well, we come back and not all the cats were in the cell when you came back from work. Some of them were out doing their thing. <clears throat> but you all knew they would come back within a certain time once you got back and they knew you were back because they knew bells and all that stuff. They'd hear them. They knew nobody's cats came. Right. And um, you have guys yelling at the gunner, hey, where's my cat? Right. And uh, all of a sudden, this sergeant comes up and it's just about shift change. This sergeant comes up and says, I'd like to explain to you guys right now that we did not want to have to take the cats. But the inmate in cell 333 filed a grievance saying that. It was unsanitary that you guys have cats and unhealthy and, you know, and that by all rules, we're not allowed to let you guys have cats and stuff. So whatever you do, please do not stab my officers. If you have a question about it, talk to the prisoner in cell 333. You know, I'm sure he'll be willing to answer any questions. Please do not stab my officers. We had no choice. It came up from, from above and walks off the tier. Bastard. You hear the bell change for the, the change of shift and you hear the cell, cell, cell three, three, three yelling across to the gunner. I need to see the Lieutenant. I need to see the Lieutenant. You know? And, um, yeah, they had to come get him with the, the big she plastic shields and the helmets and all stuff. And, um, yeah, he locked up that night for some funny ass reason. I'm not real (laughs) sure exactly what the reason was, but he, he, he chose lock. But as he was trying to get off the tiers and he was off the third tier, People were willing to throw um, not only jars of piss on him as he went by, but they were actually throwing cans of food trying to hit him. And a couple of guys actually uh, threw firebombs over trying to burn him up as he went down the other tiers. Uh, People threw things out onto the uh, baby oil out on the steps of the stairwell, which caused most of the officers to slip, but uh, trying to get this guy, right? So anyway... 
The only cat that didn't get taken was Rory's. One of the officers grabbed it and took it to the clinic and gave it to the nurse. Right? <clears throat> when Rory came back, the first thing they did is they locked Rory up in his cell. Then the captain came to him and told him, your cat's okay. We've got it squared away. Just give us a few days and we'll give it back to you. But right now, we got inspectors coming the next day or so. Let us just handle it our way. And the nurse actually took it home with her so that it, they wouldn't find it anywhere <clears throat> and then brought it back in. Which, of course, as if you know, prison staff, they're not supposed to be taking contraband out for inmates or bringing it back in for inmates. But in this case, nobody thought it was contraband. What they thought was this was keeping Rory from killing people because they pretty much figured that Rory had nothing else in his life but this cat. And uh, when you've got that kind of a scenario, you sometimes have to make, you know, the rules bend slightly, make it a little grayer area and stuff. But the guy who got sent out, for whatever reason, CDC always figured that if you have a problem in one prison, they just send you somewhere else and, and nobody will know about it. You know, it doesn't quite work that way. <clears throat> within, within days of the guy getting to the next prison, he was stabbed up numerous times. Not serious stabbing, just stabbed up. Uh, over a period of time, he'd been stabbed about 40 some odd times to where the cops like to joke with him about being a pin cushion and stuff like that and stuff. And he kept thinking how it was so terrible that he was the victim because, you know, all he wanted was a cat and they wouldn't sell him one. Well, like I said, it was Rory's call. Rory chose he didn't want to sell this guy one, you know, and it just, that's kind of shit happens sometimes, you know, it goes bad, but you know, uh, Rory eventually got transferred uh, down to uh, um, uh, Pleasant Valley. And then, funny enough, his cat didn't go with him, but the nurse took the cat home for him and told him it'll be here when you come out because there had been a court case done and Rory was expecting to <clears throat> be released. Rory got his case granted. The prison was ordered 10 days to release him. On day eight, they found him dead in his cell from a heart attack. And they always believed that it was just the stress of him finally going home that was too much for him. Oh my God. And, he, so and, he, and he passed away, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Did, um, what about your cat? Did it come back? No, my cat was taken and I never got it back. You know, mine was one of the ones that they... <clears throat> the thing what we we found out is that uh, they'd had uh, a guy come in that would collect them, and they were taken and to like a rescue center, so they weren't killed. I was going to ask. No, they weren't killed. They were, the cats were just taken to because we were up there in San Francisco area, <clears throat> and it's a very very you know modern progressive you know we don't give up the illegal alien people you know they they're not going to kill the cats you know <clears throat> but you know it was just one of those things but you know that because of that i i had that thing where though i'd never been a cat person before you know i'm not an anti-cat person now you know i mean you know this type of thing i mean i can i can deal with cats just as well as dogs but yeah you know it's just that was what finally woke me up to that cats were not not necessarily a bad thing yeah. Did you miss your cat? <clears throat> I missed my cat. Yeah. Because like I said, it was one of those things where for some reason, just the idea that, like I said, it liked to lay across my neck and just the, <laughs> the purring and the warmth on my neck, you know, and the fact that it would, it would, it would crawl under my shirt. You know, it, there was that, that little thing there now, but in the same instance, <clears throat> that's not the only pets we had in prison. We had guys who had birds and stuff and, and just, to clarify, the, the bird man of Alcatraz never had birds at Alcatraz. He had birds at the other federal prison, but at Alcatraz itself, he never did. So, you know, that, that just, you know, Robert Stroud, that wasn't, that didn't actually happen, but then you know, that's near here or there. But <clears throat> the different prisons I'd been at, I, I knew a guy who had a bat at CMC. A pet bat. Well, it, had, it hit the razor wire and it cut through the membranes and it couldn't fly. 
And he brought it to me and asked me, hey, can you, can you fix this? And I told him, I don't know. So we actually got a hold of some super glue. And we tried to super glue it back because I tried, figured if you tried to stitch it, it'd be, it would you know, change the aerodynamics. We tried super glue. It did work, but not enough to make it where it could fly. But the guy had a, a box in his cell. And he was single cell. He was up in the honor unit. And, and he has this box up there. And it's called, it says, the bat house. Do not open, right? So, of course, you know that everybody, everybody abides by that. One day he's at work. He worked in the laundry with me. And they see officers came. And they had a, a new female officer working the tier that had never worked there before. And she'd only been at the prison a few weeks. And they go down and they give her his cell to search. Now, the male cops know about the bat house. And the male cops don't open the bat house because they know what the bat house is. She goes in there. She sees this thing, says the bat house, do not open. She pops it open and the bat comes flying out and lands right on her face and into her hair. And, and she goes crazy. She starts you know, hitting her, herself and trying to get into and everything like that. And eventually she didn't actually end up killing the, the bat while trying to get it out of her hair. <clears throat> she wrote the officers up for her, you know, for harassment and, and all that kind of stuff. Cause apparently she got the idea that they, did this because they didn't really want to have a female officer on their tier and all this stuff. Funny enough, the guy filed against her and, uh, because he pointed out that, you know, it had been a bat that was one of the species that was an endangered species. And he was doing the best to try to keep it alive because it was that. And nobody else had ever had a problem with it. And on and on and on and on. And funny enough, he actually won a little bit of a court case on that. And she ended up having to pay him, I think it was like a thousand dollars or something. It wasn't much, but it was the idea that, you know, you know, this type of thing like that. But getting back to San Quentin, we had one guy up there who had gotten a baby rat and had raised this rat. And the guy was a heroin addict to begin with, but he thought it'd be really cool to tattoo his rat. You know, what? To tattoo his rat. So what he did is he, 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 he took a toilet roll pla- uh, paper, you know, cardboard roll, and he made it small, and he put marijuana joint in there, and he'd, you know, get the rat high on marijuana, right? So he's doing this. At some way, he got the rat calmed down enough to shave the rat, and then over a period of time, he did tattoo it up, you know? You know, he had cool flames going down its sides, and, you know, fuck CDC on its back and, and stuff like that. <laughs> So, so the thing was, you know, oh, yeah, it, it, people always thought that this, this guy was a bit like Willard, you know, you know, he was, he was kind of like the rat boy type thing and give him, give him credit. He kind of looked like a rat boy. Cause he would say he was one of those sucked up, you know, the heroin kind of gets sucked up thing. And, um, I can't say for a fact, I mean, I knew the marijuana cause I actually walked by one day when he was sitting there with the rat blowing marijuana you know, in there, but there were guys that said that he actually was trying to get her, get it to use heroin as well. So they could be like, you know, bond together. Cause you know, it's a <laughs> thing like that. But I don't know if he ever got to that point, but he did use marijuana to keep it calm. A lot of times though, he was bitten a number of times. I'm not and, surprised. And he did share Pruno with it. You know, it would drink the Pruno, Ouch. you know? So, so, you know, so the thing was, but, but I do know that he used to complain that, when he didn't have any marijuana, that it would get really agitated at him and nip at him because it was wanting to get high. You Not know? because he was getting tattooed. <laughs> well, apparently, apparently, for whatever reason, he never really had problems with it biting him when he did tattoos, or at least we never heard he did. Because he was high. Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. He was a cool motherfucking rat. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I don't know whatever happened to him, but when they took our cats, they didn't get his rat. Yeah. Because his rat usually stayed out of the cell until he called it. It would actually come when he called it. So. Unbelievable. Right, so we're one hour, 20 minutes in. It seems like five minutes with Jamie's fast-paced stories about people. <laughs> Things that never end well for these people, though. The next one is an 80-year-old Philippe. Let's hope he survives this story, shall we? Oh, what happens to Philippe? Well, okay, well, well, Philippe, this... This was like, we're talking like 2003, 2004. Uh, no, excuse me. Let me get that correct. <clears throat> when, yeah, it was 2003, 2004. 
Philippe, we're, we're, um, they're, um, at, at, um, the, um, Folsom with him and, um, Philippe's 80 years old and, um, he's a real nice guy. He has, he, he's actually gotten to where <clears throat> the prisons have allowed him a little plot of land down in the lower yard where he's basically uh, a porter goes around, picks up papers and empties trash bins and stuff. But he's got a little garden area and he'd grow little jalapenos and onions and tomatoes and things. He just minds his own business. You don't know, no problem and stuff like that. Don't know him much about him. I know he'd at this point in time, he'd been in for about 20 years. So which means he had to come in when he was about 60. But other guys had told me that back in the day, <clears throat> we're talking like the forties, he had been somebody in one of the groups at the time. And, uh, he'd earned his stripes and all that stuff. And basically he got out, he went straight when he was like in his forties, fifties, and he was allowed to basically retire out of his, his, his involvement and stuff. But something happened. He came back in. He'd been down about 20 years. And the thing was that there was the only people that I ever saw really talk to him were some of the old guards who remembered him from when they first started, when he was getting out or some of the older Hispanic guys that would talk to him. But in general, people just kind of ignored him. You know, they, he was just like, you know, nobody noticed him type thing. And, um, but if he always saw you, he'd always smile. He just smiled at everybody. So you, you figure he's a nice guy, guy that <clears throat> every once in a while, somebody would buy him an ice cream, you know, and you'd see him go off to a corner and he'd eat his ice cream and stuff like that because he would give people peppers and onions and tomatoes because he grew way more than he could eat and stuff. And so people paid him in kind with canteen and stuff like this, but it was like not a, a friendly where you were sat down and just broke, you know, bread with him and stuff. So, we ended up having this shift in population if they're and they ended up having uh, these young uh, southerners coming in and um, they um, they didn't allow nor funny enough they didn't northerners could not get on the Folsom line and it's a northern prison you know if a northern showed up they would immediately be locked up to be turned around, be shipped back out. Could you explain to Jen what <clears throat> Northerners and Southerners okay. are in California? Is it like um, in the UK? Yeah, yeah. You got uh, you know, you got the uh, Nuista Familia, you know, which is the Northerners, uh, and the Mexican Mafia, which is the Southerners, basically. And and the next with the uh, with the Hispanic uh, gangs and stuff. Your Northern Mexicans, basically, their families had been there longer. And a lot of time, the Northern Mexicans lined with black gangs. You know, that was their kind of thing. <clears throat> Most of them didn't really speak much in the way of Spanish, except what they call Spanglish, where they kind of blended all the stuff. The Southern Mexicans, their families were still a couple of generations from coming across the border and becoming legitimate and stuff. They spoke a lot more Spanish, but they also had their own versions of Spanish that was different than their parents' Spanish. <clears throat> then you had the Paisas and the Paisas were basically, if you're a Mexican national or, or from Central America and things like that, quite honestly, as far as I was always concerned, the Paisas were probably the more dangerous one because they lived in, you know, places where it was violent virtually all the time on the streets, you know, cartels and, you know, and, and, and all that. It's just, uh, so when they came across, when they got in prison, sometimes they became soldiers for, the other groups and stuff like that. But when they were in them, their own right, they would be pretty much separate from it. Now within the Northerners, you had other splinter groups like Fresno. You originally had the F 14ers 14 for the letter N 13 for the, you know, for, for the M for the Mexican mob. So it's this kind of thing, but, uh, <clears throat> they ended up, uh, the Fresno Bulldogs got tired of being used as a buffer. Uh, Somebody in the northern groups would do something against the southern groups. Southern groups wanted, you know, to get reparations for it. And uh, they'd go and the shot callers talk and they'd say, oh, go stab one of the Fresno boys. That's okay. And the Fresno boys got tired of being that buffer, 
you know, so they became bulldogs and then they weren't really aligned with anybody and they fought with barely everybody. And then there was another group that had been, was Northerners and they were the San Jose sharks. Funny enough, the bulldogs is a symbol of the Fresno state university, Fresno city college. They have the bulldogs. So, and in San Jose, they have the San Jose sharks, you know, uh, sports team. So the sharks being still aligned with the Northerners, would oftentimes have tattoos put on of a great white shark holding a bulldog in its mouth as a way of basically saying, this is what we think of you. Da, da, da. And of course, you know that if you get those two guys together, there's got to be a dish issue about it. So anyway, but Philippe, he just, he was just kind and considered and all this stuff. So it was right in the 2003, 2004 time. They brought this change of these guys in. And they saw Philippe had this little garden and they made demands. You're going to start bringing us this up. You're going to bring us that up, blah, blah, blah. And we're not paying you. You know, you're an old man. We'll fuck you off and blah, 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 blah. Okay. You know, I don't know what up. Well, Philippe also was in a hobby. And at the time he, he would do modeling clay stuff. And we weren't allowed to have kilns, but we could have air dry clay. And, one of the things he was allowed to have was a wire to cut through the clay, you know, with the two things. It's a typical tool. <clears throat> you know, you're allowed to have that. Um, he was also allowed to have <clears throat> an X-Acto knife with a little set <clears throat> that had small saws because he cut small wood like basswood. <clears throat> he would do that to build boxes for things or whatever he was doing. But he did these little things, sold them in the hobby shop. So one day, <coughs> he goes to Chow, comes back, found out that the guards hadn't locked his cell fast enough. Somebody ran in there, ransacked, took a bunch of his stuff, right? Took his TV, took you know, his radio, took some canteen stuff. He comes back, he asks about, and most of the guys tell him well i didn't see anything i didn't see anything which of course is pretty common but there were a couple of the black guys on the tier that didn't really give a shit and they said yeah you know those guys down there took your shit you know and we don't care because they ain't going to come after us anyway but we're just going to let you we're just letting you know because we respect you philippe okay so a couple weeks later philippe's had a whole bunch of stuff grow he's brought a bunch of stuff back cops let him bring it back They'd go through the strip out search and stuff. And the cops would set it off to the side and give it to him when he came through. <clears throat> so Philippe goes up, goes to his cell. And, uh, guy comes, jumps on his door and tells him when, uh, when you get your next package, you got to pay us to allow you to stay on this tier. And he goes, okay. Yeah. And that weekend, he was getting a package. His name had already come out on a list. That's how they knew he had a package coming. <clears throat> so he goes, he gets his package, brings it back, puts it in his cell. So the guys come by, and uh, Philippe isn't going to go to chow because you usually eat out of your package the first night you get it. You get good stuff. And uh, he tells them, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to chow. And they said, well, when we come back, we're going to get our stuff. And he goes, yeah, when you come back, you can come have whatever you want. I'm good with that. You, you're more than welcome to anything you want. And they're like, yeah, we knew we, we'd get out what we want. And so off trucks, and then it's like seven, eight of these guys. <clears throat> and they, they all rush through chow and they come back. And the cops would crack the, the, the tier doors. So all the doors are open. They'd crack the tier doors and they would wait till everybody for that building is finished child and get in. And then they would lock the doors. And then they would relay, unlock them later for yard or showers, whatever. So the guys come back, they go down and he's, I'm on a, I'm, I'm on AA and you have AA and you have AB and then you have BA and then you have BB and he's on the BB side. He's back at back bar way down there at the end. <clears throat> he's like the second cell from the very, very end. So these guys all go down there. You start hearing screaming. All the way through the building. You're hearing just scream after scream after scream. Guards run over there. One guy comes up and he's still on fire. 
Yeah. And uh, one guard throws him to the ground, throws a blanket over him. Guards are running, guards are running, bells are going. Everybody get down, get down, down on your bellies, down on your bellies. <clears throat> Guys in the chow hall, everybody down on the floor. You know, doors are locked, everything. Sitting in the chow hall, you can watch him walking Felipe by. And he's in cuffs. And they're walking him over to medical. And Felipe's got blood all over him, right? They're walking to medical. And you see a gurney go by with the guy on it that had been burned. You see another gurney go by with a, with a guy laying there that you can see he's bleeding. You see another gurney go by, and this guy's bleeding. You see a third gurney go, a fourth gurney go by, and this guy's bleeding, but, you know, <clears throat> from his neck and stuff. And then you see him bring these other three guys by in cuffs, and they've got marks on them, but they're not that bad. And they take them right over to into the like the ad seg office. Well, at this point in time, we don't really have inmates working in the clinic at the moment, <clears throat> so we don't really know what's going on. But my job is I work in the watch office. I work for the captain, so I read all the the DARs, the daily activity reports. I get to know everything that goes on. So they get us up. They tell everybody, go back to your cell. As I'm coming through. And there's a the guy who works with me. He's, he's, he works for the lieutenant. We're told, go straight to your jobs. They need you there. <clears throat> we go over. We're sitting in our jobs. Captain walks in and said, do you see anything? I said, just the guy's going by. We, we were in chow. Says, well, get get that typewriter warmed up. He goes, you're going to be typing. He goes, uh, you won't be home for breakfast. He goes, it's going to be a long night. Okay. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're sitting there. We get our stuff going. <clears throat> In comes the first report. Four guys are being sent out to the outside hospital due to their injuries. Stab wounds strangled with a wire cutter lit on fire with paint thinner um you know and uh there was like claw marks on one of the guys across his neck and face and stuff and uh then it comes in it says petition potential assailant felipe and i'm not gonna say his last name but felipe on there and it lists the ages of the guys. <clears throat> 21, 23, 24, 25, 27, this type of thing. Felipe, 80. You know. <clears throat> then the other lieutenant clerk, he's typing up the lockup order for the three other guys. You know. And he comes over and goes, yeah, they're being locked up for uh, potentially trying to do, uh, you know, a robbery. And I said, uh, well, what, what's happening with Felipe? says well they've got him out they, they've sent him out to the hospital to uh to have him looked over okay about four o'clock in the morning i have to i get notified to send out a, <clears throat> a a recovery team to go and pick up an inmate from the hospital now i don't know who's coming back felipe comes back turns out all the blood on him was not his none of the blood on him the only thing he had was he had scraped his foot when they when the officers dragged him out because he wasn't wearing shoes. And when they took him off the concrete, he scraped the top of his toes. That was the only injury Felipe had, right? And uh, <clears throat> so they put him in ad seg while the investigation goes on. And um, the four guys go to the hospital. And uh, the guy who, who was on fire, was it was from his chest up. And uh, he actually, his ears kind of got melted a little bit. And, you know, his, his eyes weren't going to see quite as well again. And hair was missing and, you know, burns across his chest and stuff. <clears throat> and uh, one of the other guys had some burns too. But Felipe had used uh, inmate napalm on him, which is you boil a pot of water, you put baby oil in it, and you throw Kool-Aid in it. So when you throw it on, the water burns the baby all cooks and the sugar gets in there and will cause infection. Ooh. And it, it's very effective, you know. Well, <clears throat> a few days later, Felipe gets released from 
Ad seg. He goes back to his cell. Guys come over and give him stuff because they know he probably needs some few things. <clears throat> Somebody had already gone in and cleaned up his cell. All the blood and all the stuff like that had been one of the, one of the friends of his cleaned it. We get the reports back. All seven of them were charged with attempted robbery. Felipe's story was they all rushed in and then they just started cutting each other and one guy lit the other guy on fire and then I was trying to make a pot of coffee and one guy took my hot water, threw some boy bill oil in it, threw some Kool-Aid in it and threw it on another guy. I don't know what was going on. I just tried to get out of the way. <laughs> and he said, but people were bleeding and blood got over me. I don't know what was happening. I was just doing my best to stay out of the way. I'm an old man. Right? <laughs> so... None of those guys ever returned to the prison. They, they were all went to others elsewhere. So, I don't know. I'm going through some other paperwork. And the captain walks in. says, uh, you like to read history? I go, yeah, I'm a history buff. He goes, here, read this. Drops me off. And it's Folsom State Prison, 1955, 56, six, something like that. And there. And there's, there's a Felipe. And there's a, a very young Felipe. And he stabbed one guy 12 times in the chest and threw him off the fourth tier for disrespecting his mother. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting bit there. And he goes, oh, no, read the next page. And uh, the next page, he chased two guys down the end of a fifth tier with two knives and made them jump from the fifth tier. Wow. One broke his hips and his legs and the other was killed. Yeah. Turned out that in the day, Felipe was the guy that dealt with collecting debts and dealing with disrespect. And uh, so I said, so what's going to happen with Felipe? He goes, Felipe's an old man. He was being robbed. Felipe just got out of the way. It, the robbers were, were so greedy, they went after each other. And that's how they wrote the report up. <laughs> That these guys assaulted each other. And one of the things when they did that was that they couldn't be in the same prisons. So they all got sent to different prisons. Now, rumor mill had it that some of them were assaulted again because of the fact that they went after this old man who had been somebody and had been given the permission to retire out. And uh, yeah, so, you know, but Felipe... I later found out what Felipe was imprisoned for. And what the <clears throat> thing was is that uh, his wife had been a Jehovah Witness. He'd married a woman who was a Jehovah Witness. And she got really, really ill. And she wouldn't accept medical care. And they tried to force medical care on her. And Felipe basically held a gun on the doctors and would not let them give her any medical care. And she died. And so they basically gave him a second degree murder. And that's what Felipe was in prison for. Oh, my God. Felipe yeah. was a badass. <clears throat> Felipe was a badass. He just, yeah. well, what, <clears throat> what about uh, Jim Passmore? Oh, Wasco. Jim Passmore. Jim Passmore. <laughs> Slave Jim. Slave Jim had been a, had been a Satan Slaves out of San Fernando. Slow down. A what? Uh -huh. He had been a member of the Satan Slaves Motorcycle Club okay. out of <laughs> San Fernando. And I first met Jim when I was probably 25 or something. Right after I started riding my club, I bumped into him in San Fernando at a bar and stuff. <clears throat> and uh, my patch, my club had only been around a very short, short period of time. And uh, he come over and looked at my patch. You know, and it's a confederate flag with the devil's head and stuff on it. And he goes... Well, it's pretty patch, you know, you know, and, and the idea is you got, you know, there's supposed to be that thing about, well, you don't let people disrespect your patch and things like that. But the way he said it, I didn't hear the disrespect. I heard just this kind of joking thing. So I offered to buy him a beer and he goes, a beer. You're only going to buy me a beer. And I said, well, what would you like? He goes, well, we'll, we'll find out when I get through. And he sat down and he ordered a, a beer and a shot of whiskey to make a boiler maker. 
and he drank Boilermakers. And I think I paid for like seven or eight Boilermakers for him, right? <clears throat> and then he he gave me one of his courtesy cards, Slave Jim, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, the, the Hells Angels had, you know, ended up uh, absorbing the, the Satan slaves, right? So they were actually became Hells Angels. The problem is, Satan, is Slave Jim got kicked out of the Hells Angels because... <laughs> He didn't want to be absorbed. He didn't want to be. He wanted to be a slave. He was a slave. He slave Jim, you know, and the president was slave Louis. I mean, everybody in the club was slave so-and-so, right? So <clears throat> you don't really want to be called slave Jim and you're hell's angel. It doesn't work. So what's happens? You just become Jim. And that was his attitude. You know, I'm slave Jim. So when he got his patch, the hell's angel patch, <clears throat> the story went that he, uh, Found a police car parked outside of a, of, of a restaurant type thing, like kind of in an alley, you know. And he climbed up on top of the hood and stomped down on top of the hood, jumped down or top on the roof and then jumped down on the hood, dropped his drawers and shit on their windshield while they were sitting in it and then ran off. They never saw his face. They only saw the Hell's Angel patch, you know. So, of course, then they go after, they go and start harassing the Hells Angels about, you just crushed one of our cars and shit on our car and ran off. You know, what the hell is this? Yeah. So, basically, Jim was this kind of guy. He, <clears throat> you've seen the, 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 the films, I'm sure, where somebody's grabbed somebody's head and put their face in a toilet. Yeah. Bulk washing. Jim, Jim did that many, many times. You know, uh, Jim was known to, to basically, you know, slam a guy's head into one of the urinal troughs and snap it off, you know, snap the troughs off. I mean, I saw him one time bring a, a toilet door ha uh, door out of a, a bathroom and beat a guy in a bar with it because the guy didn't wash his hands. I mean, Jim was this guy, right? So <clears throat> I'd known Jim from this time and I'd seen him a few times there. That was my, so I haven't seen him for a while. So now I'm, I'm at, I'm at Wasco state prison. It's, you know, we're talking, you know, that it's now like 95, you know, and uh, I've got a job where uh, they, the, when we hit the, the warden at the, at the, we named Warden Carrillo, he had swore up and down, we will never have life prisoners here. Well, <clears throat> basically every prison gets life prisoners. And he'd actually turned away a couple of buses, wouldn't let him in the gate. That only lasted until the Fed, the, the uh, Sacramento found out. <clears throat> they sent people down there and said, they better come in here or you won't have a job. Now, <clears throat> he gets them in, but then he comes up with this idea. He's going to put us on this one yard because all of Wasco is a reception center except the mainline yard. Now, mainline yard has buildings there that one building is split in half and it's part reception for when the guys come over from the reception side to go to mainline. And the other half, he's going to put the few lifers he's, he's re said he'll take. And he also had the heat med guys. So they, if you were a lifer, they gave you a category B restrictive movement. <clears throat> so above the door, it said, cat, it, said, it said killer bees and horrible heats <laughs> above the door of the, of the building when we went in. And uh, I'm working as clerk on the reception thing. And I also work out of the gym. Well, the gym is only supposed to be for people who are like, uh, 90 days to the house or minimum custody that aren't able to go out to the minimum because they're, they got things in there. Like um, they got rabbit blood in them or something like that. And so they can't put them outside the fence cause they run away. Yeah, so they put them in the gym over here. So I work in the gym and I'm a clerk in both places. And I, and I also handed out like GED packages, general education, High school diploma equivalency type thing. Well, Jim comes in and, he, and he, he's been transferred in from another prison. And he comes to check in with me. And he looks at me. He goes, hey, I know you. And I go, yeah. And he looks at my patch. He goes, yeah, you guy with the pretty tattoo. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm the guy with the pretty tattoo. How you doing, Jim? And we start talking. And he goes, <clears throat> you know, you know I, got, I, got, I got a bad back. And, and my, my shoulders hurt a lot. And my, my, my feet are you know, really always hurting me. And I need a lower bunk, right? Because normally the first guys come in, they'd put them on an upper bunk. And uh, I said, no problem, Jim. So I give him a lower bunk. <clears throat> and I write it up that he, he has all this thing. Now, 
I can't say he has these things, but I just say he does on this paperwork, right? So I give him this lower bunk and I actually tell him, where, where would you like it to be? He goes, where, where I can lay in my bed and watch the telly would be really nice. Okay. You know, but not too close to the shower because I don't want to see weenies. You tell me, right? And so, okay. So we get him at one place. So he's watching the telly, you know? So <clears throat> one day I get a bunch of new guys come in and, uh, you can see guys who've never really done any time and they, they, they just have this carry the way they carry themselves. And there were a couple like that and they get kind of put here and put there and they're on upper bunks. And, stuff. and uh, this one guy's name is John and um, I check him in and you know, it's like no big thing. And I give him the spiel. Here's your fish kit. Uh, if you have any questions, come see us, blah, blah, blah. We'll see what we can do. Uh, I don't live in this building, but I'm here, you know, basically seven days a week. I always come in, check in, do what paperwork needs to be done. Cause we had a gunner in, in the gym and he, and the reason we had a gunner was some of these 90 day guys were guys who just kicked, got, got kicked out of level fours, 90 days to house. So you got level fours and level ones living in the same thing, you know, never a really good mix, but the gunner we had was well known to take his magazine, take his magazine out of his, out of his rifle, set it in the locker, put the gun down and lay down and go to sleep because we didn't really have things happen, even though they could. <clears throat> the other two officers we had uh, had this ongoing pinochle game thing where they were playing cards and, you know, and they had a couple of officers come in and play and they could care less. They just there for their eight and that's it, you know? So anyway, so John's been there and he's been there now about a couple of weeks. He's got a package came in and stuff. And Jim comes walking over. He goes, Hey, he goes, you know, Mom, that new guy over there by my bunk? I go, yeah. And he goes, uh, yeah, you know, I don't really give a shit, but, you know, he's having a little bit of problem. And he goes, you know, you're that bleeding heart guy that is willing to help people out. Yeah, personally, I don't really care, but I thought well, I'd bring it to your attention, you know, for no other reason, just because, you know, I know you and we get along okay. Okay, Jim. So I get up and I go walking over there. And Jim goes back to his bed. <clears throat> and, uh, so I walk over and I see John up on his bunk and he's telling, no, I'm not going to give you my package. I, I, it's, I've got my first stuff. I, you know, and these guys, there's three of them. They're going, you're going to give us the package. And he goes, no, I'm not going to give you my package. And he goes, we're going to beat you up. And they pull them off the bunk, you know, and they're, they're kind of like in the three person circle thing. And I walk up and I go, is there a problem here? And the guy tells me, look, it's got nothing to do with you. He owes us. So what does he owe you for? He goes, doesn't matter. He owes us. You know, <laughs> one guy off to my right standing up there. Well, Jim's bunk is right there. And all of a sudden I see this guy get, get his jaw, this hands come under the guy's jaw and drag him over the top bunk. You know, and the other two just suddenly look at him. So I push the one guy down off the bunk and I'd look at the guy who's been doing all the talk. And I said, you know, you're not going to take this guy's shit. And he goes, I'll take it if I want, you know, and, and, he pulls out a toothbrush that's got a razor blade on him and he slashes and that's the scar across my hand well when he hits it the blade goes boing because he didn't melt it on right so now he's sitting there with just a plastic handle of a <laughs> toothbrush looking at me and so I, I i give him a two-handed push in the chest well as soon as i give him the two-handed push in the chest he goes sliding on his butt the guy that I pushed on the bed jumps up and he goes and grabs me around my, tries to grab me around the chest, but his hands can't lock around my chest. At this time, I've got about a 50 some odd inch chest plus my arms are at this time are about 18 inches. You know, so he, so you're talking about, you know, you, you, you can't quite lock around there. All of a sudden I feel him let go. And I hear this thing like a bag of potatoes hitting the floor. And Jim had reached under the bunk, grabbed his legs and pulled him. And so he face planted dead on the, on the concrete floor, busted most of his grill, broke his nose, you know, and dr Bill, he drags him over. And I said, Jim, I thought you weren't getting involved. He goes, they're blocking the TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and I go, what happened to the guy you pulled over the, the bed? He goes, uh, he's in that locker over there because they had camp style lockers and he put him in a locker and locked it. <laughs> didn't know what locker, whose locker it was. Didn't know, just the lock was unlocked, shoved the guy in there, locked it. 
<laughs> so this guy's in. He's beating on the door to get out. The guy I shoved back, he's ran to go tell the sergeant that I'm trying to beat him up. You know? And the cops get over there and they call, they call me over because I'm their clerk. And they go, oh, this guy says you're trying to beat him up. And I go, no. I said, I went over there to check on one of the newbies. And he goes, so what makes you think he wants to beat you up? He goes, because he pulled a razor knife on me. And I go, really? And they're looking at my hand. And they're looking at him. <clears throat> and the cop goes, I think if he pulled a razor knife on you, you weren't going to be over here talking to us. Yeah. And the guy goes, well, I want, I, I, I want out of this dorm. He says, no problem. There's a lovely cell for you in Ad Seg. And they walked him out. And of course, as he's walking out, guys are yelling, you fucking snitch, you rat. Well, you know, you better not come back to this yard, you know, stuff like that. And they go out. <laughs> the guy that got face planted, we've had to call medical, get him to take the medical. He's pretty cool. He tells him, I came out of the shower. I didn't realize somebody had dropped a bar of soap on the floor. I slipped on it, face planted. You know, that's what he tells him. Okay, no problem. He comes back. He's got his face all bandaged up. The guy in the locker, the guy who owns the locker comes in. The cops haven't even come over. They hear all the racket. They don't, they're not even going to come look. Guy comes over, undoes the combination. The guy comes and goes, what are you doing in my locker? <laughs> well, uh, I got put in this locker. What are you doing in my locker? And it turns out to be a great, great, great big black guy. And then he goes, where's my Snickers? Did you eat my Snickers? Did you break into my locker and get my Snickers? <laughs> the guy goes, I didn't touch these Snickers. Well, there ain't no Snickers on that thing. There were 10 Snickers on that shelf, and there are no Snickers now. And he goes, you better go get me some Snickers. And if I don't have Snickers in half an hour, you're going to be my bitch. You know? <laughs> and, and the guy's running around people. Hey, anybody got Snickers? I can get Snickers. I got to get Snickers. From. And, and, and I go back to my, my desk, and Jim comes over and goes, I think you owe me a cup of coffee. Yeah, no problem. I make him a cup of coffee. I said, uh, so what the hell was on TV? He goes, my soaps. You know I like watching my soaps. Motherfuckers block my soaps. You know, and stuff like that. So anyway, Jim's like down to about a month before he's supposed to get out. And uh, he gets called to the chapel. And when you get called to the chapel, you usually know what that means, right? Something's, someone's died. Someone's died. Okay. <clears throat> so he comes back. And uh, he tells me, come over to my bunk. I come over to the bunk. He breaks out. And we make burritos. And he's, we're talking like nobody, talking about bikes, talking about runs. He's telling me when he gets out, he's going to you know, be out there doing all this, that, and the other thing. He hasn't mentioned anything about going to the chapel. Right? So the guy goes, hey, Jim, who died? And you're like, fuck. You know, he, and Jim goes, nobody of importance. And goes, oh. So doesn't it have to be family? He goes, well, he isn't he wasn't family anymore. And so it's like, what do you mean he wasn't family anymore? He goes, well, it's my fucking rat ass son who fucking turned federal and you know witness against some of the guys that he was running around with down there in Miami, you know, doing the drug stuff because my, my son thought he was going to be part of Miami vice type shit. And he was going to, he wanted to be, he wanted to be a cop. Didn't have what it took to be a cop. Wanted to be a gangster. Didn't have what it took to be a gangster, but he had everything it took to be a rat. He says, and they killed him. And he go, and you're not upset. He goes, he was a rat. He goes, but he was your son. He was a rat. He says, quite honestly, I told him five years ago, don't you ever fucking come around me. Because he came and told me, Dad, I'm going to do this because they're going to pay me. And he said, for some reason, he thought I was going to respect him. He says, I'd far rather respected him if he'd, got, if he'd been the guy who went to prison for being a great drug dealer or being a great gangster or being anything but a rat. Yeah. So the guy leaves. <laughs> We're sitting eating burritos. He looks at me. He goes, Yeah. He goes, you can't really make your children be what you want. He goes, I gave that kid Harleys. He goes, I took him to all the runs. He goes, I got him all kinds of, he goes, I took him to a whorehouse when he was 13 years old. He goes, 
and he turns out to be a rat. He goes, the worst thing about it is he still carried the Passmore name. And he goes, and I told, I told the chaplain, he won't be buried under the Passmore name. He goes, as far as I'm concerned, he can be buried in a nameless grave. And then Jim was just that way. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And the thing about Jim, 1970, uh, Jim had gotten into a minor incident and got shot four times in the chest, survived that. And three people that were suspected of being a part of it, though Jim never told the cops, they kept asking him who did it, who did it. He goes, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. These guys uh, suddenly disappeared from the face of the earth. And uh, they came after Jim and said, we think you did something to these guys. He goes, what guys? Because I don't even know who those guys are. I've never heard their names before. You're the only people that talk about them. How do I know you guys didn't do this and try to put it on me? Why would I do it? And they said, well, we found in one of the guy's houses the gun that was used to shoot you with. He goes, well, I never saw their faces, so I wouldn't know that, would I? And they're going, well, somebody would have known. He goes, well, well, how's that make my problem? And they tried and tried and tried to figure out how to link him to it. And other than the fact he could get shot four times in the chest with a 38 and, and walk away from that. But that's how Jim Passmore was. He was this, this, this mountain of a man and stuff. <clears throat> the worst part about with poor Jim Passmore is when he did eventually pass away a few years later. Cause he was up and he was up in his age, but, uh, he passed away just exactly how he thought he would like to do, which was at a whorehouse in Nevada, you know, you know, so drunk. many men have said that huh? they want to die that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he, what he actually used to say is he always wanted to die when he was 104 shot by a jealous husband, you know, but you know, you know but you know, the thing was that, but he died in a whorehouse and you know, he, he'd gone there on basically about a seven day binge, you know, and uh, you know, but you know, Jim had a great turnout at his funeral. A couple hundred bikers I knew went to it. I didn't get to go to it, but he went to it. And it was a pretty good deal all in all. Wow, what an amazing um, story. Go, Jim. Ostriches and chicken farm at Avenal. I don't even know where this one's <laughs> going to go. Okay, so <clears throat> at Avenal, they had a pig farm, and they originally had an ostrich farm. And we also had a chicken farm where they raised chickens from eggs all the way up to killing them and packaging them and selling the chicken went through not only the prisons, but it got sent to schools, you know, stuff like that through part of the state programs. Now, the interesting thing about this is you had to get a gate pass to go out to work because of those facilities were just outside the fence line. Now you couldn't get one of those if you had, outstanding driving offenses you're gonna get a gate pass if you had any kind of uh like say rabbit blood in you uh if you were doing over a certain amount of time you couldn't get it or if you were <clears throat> illegally in the country you couldn't do it yet funny enough 90 percent of the guys who went out behind the gate were always his young hispanic kids who were all illegally in the country but who had worked on farms in mexico and so they had skills they needed the skills, so they got special dispensation for this. But you had the odd white guy, you know, that got to go out too. Now, <clears throat> they could hatch a chicken egg. And within eight weeks, that's a full-grown chicken ready to be cut up and served. Now, if you raise a chicken, it takes a lot longer than eight weeks for that chicken to become full-grown. But because they inject it with hormones and all kinds of other things, they make these chickens grow faster and all this stuff like that. Okay. So guys working on the weight pile are always looking to get big, you know, and you can't get steroids and you can't get this and can't get. So you had these guys and there were a number of them that I knew um, <clears throat> that thought if the chickens get like that, I can get like that. And they had this one particular guy who was already had done and they call his nickname was Royd because he had done roids on the streets and he came in really big, but he was worried about losing his size. And he was looking at this, the chicken thing about the, the eight weeks and they're like the big chicken, you know, and stuff like that. And so they had the air guns that do the injections. And so <laughs> 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 
And he did this to multiple parts of his body. Funny enough, there's something in the chemical there that causes these really big abscesses, you know? And, and, and it's like chunks, like slugs about the size of a 50 P has to be taken out when they, cause it hardens up and kind of all, uh, gets like necrosis in there and stuff. Right now you would think that people hearing about this would go, Oh, that I'll never do that. Right. Well, <clears throat> we had this one young guy named Thor. His name is Thor Peterson, right? He's dead. So it doesn't matter. But he was oh, a young guy. Superhero, Thor, huh? like T H O R. Yeah, yeah, Thor. Yeah, because the white guys. He was a white guy. Look up to the uh, Hitler neo Nazi. Yeah. Um, but uh, his, he was named that by his parents. Oh, Cause, okay. Because his parents were were Scandinavian, da da da, and so they named him Thor. Yeah, and his dad. I didn't know it, they could legally do that. What name you after a god? You're not allowed to be named after Hulk. I know that or Superman. No, I think you. Can't be Hulk, but wait, you wait, can't wait. be Superman. Do you know how many Hispanic guys are named after Jesus? Jose. Hey, no, Jesus. Jesus. But that's Jesus. Jesus. Have you ever seen how it's, it's Jesus? Mm. Yeah, so you, know, you can be named Jesus. And if you were German, you could be a Christ. Because, you know. It's freedom of so, speech, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, but I mean, you know, that type of thing. I mean, there, there are things. But no, but anyway, he was named Thor. You know, and, and uh, but for some reason, do not ask me why. I have no idea how. But <laughs> we get the report back on the yard that he'd gone out there <clears throat> and decided to inject himself, you know, in his man meat because he wanted to. He wanted. He wanted this this muscle. Well, like I said, you get an abscess about the size of a fifty p. You know, six months after he'd done that, and they'd done all the surgery, they kept everybody kept. Joking and calling him Pee Wee, you know, because he had to lose about half of it, oh. you know, because of the where it was in, how it was injected and and, oh. and, and it narc, like say narcosis and stuff. So, <clears throat> but the 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 thing about the Mexican guys working out there is you, you get the guys in the abattoir, and the way the abattoir worked is they cut the chicken up and then they throw it down a flash freezer. It's it's a big tunnel, and you just throw it up there, and by the time it gets down at the bottom, it's frozen. It's flash freezer. And on more than a number of occasions, there'd be an incident go on where staff would get up there and have to try to save somebody. They were trying to stuff down the frozen, the, the flash freezer because Mexicans get really into that. Trying to get the guy down there. He's, he's hanging on for dear life, you know, <laughs> because he knows if he goes down the thing, he ain't coming back out. But so they, they, they have the, they have all this kind of thing, but then you had the guys that thought, I'm not going to do the injections because that's, that's not good. But the grain they have is, you know, is, is filled with the hormones and stuff to help out too. So guys would get it and they would grind it down and they'd make a porridge and then they would eat it. And virtually everyone that I know of that did that had to be sent out to the hospital and be opened up to remove these huge blocks that were in their intestines that would just solid up like concrete. You know, so again, something meant for a chicken is not necessarily meant for a human. And uh, what was behind the abattoir is where the, the Avenal uh, correctional guards uh, dogs were kept. And they had this set of six beautiful Belgium shepherd type dogs. And they had them out there. Now, when they do the abattoir, they have used all kinds of chemicals and stuff. You know, you just, they do it. And it blows out through a vent and then blew out through a vent onto the dog pound area. And within a year, all the dogs had cancerous tumors growing on them, and they lost all their dogs. Plus the fact is they come to find out their dogs being out there lost their total sense of smell. So when they brought them around to smell for cell phones and, and drugs, they, they, these dogs, they couldn't smell anything. You know, they went by, I mean, you could set, you know, a thousand pounds out and, you know, a pound of cocaine and the dog would look at it and keep moving because he doesn't know what it he can't smell anything right so they and they, they, they was a big deal about big scandal guards got actually got <clears throat> lost their you know jobs as far as guards and got made staff members i mean it was pretty pretty heinous on that but besides the chickens we had the and the, we had the pig farm and the pig farm was pretty much you only had a few minor instances where 
guys went out there because they had tu- they had boars, and you had a few guys that tried to figure out how they could get a boar tusk because they wanted to wear it around their neck because that's like really cool and stuff. And they they found that that if you put your hand in a boar's mouth to try to hold it so you can grab the tusk, you might not come back with everything that you put in his mouth. Really, got one really sharp teeth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See. People are thinking, oh, it's a pig and it's con. Yeah, not the same thing. You know, it doesn't work that way. So they had a few instances like that. But what they, when they got to the thing, but they came out with this idea that there was a big fad about ostrich meat. It's healthier. It's better than beef and all this stuff. It's, it's the other red meat type thing and all that. So they, they got some ostriches and they brought them in. They got guys hired to do it. And they bring an ostrich wrangler in, which I never had heard of before that. But it's a guy who works with ostriches. Real, and the guy was from Australia and he knew all about ostriches and all this kind of stuff. And he tells them, you know, that to get an ostrich to do what you want, they're inquisitive. So what the idea is you open the door up and when they lean their head in, you put the black sock over their head and now you can walk them anywhere they want because they can't see. And so they're going to rely on you to get them there. They're simple enough. Okay, that that works well. And um, a few guys did smuggle back some ostrich feathers because they were going to thought it'd be really cool to make pins out of them and stuff, you know, like quill pins. Like. <laughs> and then we had this one guy. Yeah, we had this one guy named Charlie. And Charlie was a rather big, buffed-up motherfucker. And he thought, they're just big chickens. All right? So he went out into the... They would bring an ostrich into this little room it's probably four feet by maybe eight feet and they'd let it in and then the idea is the door's at the other end so you get it to come all the way over and then you get you trick it well he walks into it when they let the ostrich in he's standing there and he punches it with all he's got he punches this big bird the big bird raises up one leg and pile drives him across the thing into the wall leaving these puncture wounds in his chest and fracturing his sternum and breaking a few ribs. And then the chicken went over there and started stomping on, you know, the big ostrich and started stomping all over him. And it took everything the wrangler could do to get him out of there before it killed him and told him, you never, you never hit an ostrich. It says, first off, all they know is retaliation after that. It says, that ostrich, we're going to have to kill it in there and drag its body out because we aren't going to be able to trick it now because you messed that up, you know, and stuff. So anyway, but after that instant, they decided, well, ostriches are too big. So we're going to get emus because, you know, emus are almost like an ostrich, a little smaller. And they're basically, you know, easier to deal with. Have you ever seen an emu uh, stampede? Yeah. (laughs) They get them into a corral and they're trying to get them to come over here to go through this this pin, this draw, you know, the uh, trough pin type thing to squeeze them in to get them to where they want them to go. And they're not buying it. They're all hanging out over here. They pick this small little Mexican guy says, Hey, go in there, scare them, make them come around. So he goes in there and he's going, Hey, psh, Hey, psh, Hey, psh. And they're ignoring him. Right? So one of the guards says, Hey, throw some rocks at him. He threw about a half a dozen good-sized rocks at him, and they all turned. And they all looked at him, and then they all ran towards him. And he was running for his life trying to get into that little trough thing because they could only come one at a time through there. He got within about five feet of it before they ran right over the fuck on him. Ran down one after another going down that trough. But they like every one of them seemed to hit this poor kid. <clears throat> Sad part is that after that, he got to be a part of the pick apart yard because they, they punctured his, his spine and, uh, and, oh. and broke his legs and stuff. And he ended up being paralyzed from the waist down. And, and you would think he'd be compensated for that, but instead he was written up for abuse of the, you know, abuse of the animals for throwing the rocks at him, even though the staff member told him throw rocks at him, you know? So he got a ride up, got more time. Got a wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> this is just blowing my mind. So he's gone from an emu stampede victim 
to wheelchair prison gang wheelchair walks. <laughs> yeah, so you know. <laughs> Is that like wood as in white? Wood wood brothers. Well, you'll have to find out, won't you? Can you explain to Jen what a wood is? Okay. There's, uh, in in the white culture, prison gang stuff, you have what's called pecker woods. And pecker woods are, it's like a thing to be noted as if you're true white. You're, You're down for the white cause and all that. But if you actually look at the historical relevance of it, Peckerwood was a derogatory term used by wealthy people for the poor whites. And the thing was, what they would do is they were, the whites were the only one allowed to approach the houses to bring firewood. A lot of times in the South, the firewood they would bring had been pecked by woodpeckers. It burns hot and fast. It's trash wood, basically. So for them to call white peckerwood, they were referring to them as weak, poor, white trash, kind of like the wood, okay? Now, but again, whites have taken it as a sense of pride, and, you know, it's being called. It's kind of like the idea that with blacks, you can use, you keep, and if, you, if you're black, you can call each other the N-word, and it's okay. But if you call, if anybody of another race calls them, oh, now you're being derogatory. So it's, it's this kind of, you know, two-sided thing. <clears throat> so anyway... There at Wasco, um, we had these these guys drive up. One guy's name is Ledgerwood. One guy's name is Leatherwood. And one guy's name is Peckerwood. And they're all three black. What? They're all three black. Peckerwood came out of Georgia. The other ones came out of Alabama. The cops on the yard thought it was really funny to go, can we get a peckerwood at the office? Can we get a peckerwood at the office? You know, can we get the Wood Brothers here? We need some woods over here. We need Wood Brothers over here. Because when they say wood and brothers, they were referring to the blacks. You know, And every time they'd say that, you'd see the whites you know, kind of like tightened up. You know? And the one guy, Peckerwood, was, well, all three of them were good size, but they were very typical blacks where they were very muscular up top sight, but not so lakes. But the one guy, Peckerwood, every time he'd see a guy, white guy, he goes, Hey, thank you. I appreciate. I love the fact you put my name on you. And then of course the white guy go, you know, and so he's got the, so a number of them went and complained to this guy, Sergeant Broach. And Sergeant Broach was really cool because Sergeant Broach could speak German. So the white guy's like, yeah, brooch, man. He's a down, down white boy. And then one day they saw a brooch and he's wearing a yarmulke because he's Jewish German. <coughs> and that, that kind of like, well, we thought you were one of us. He goes, one of you. I'm a cop. What, what makes you think I'm one of you? <coughs> yeah. But brooch was funny because <coughs> he would start talking German to him and all that stuff. And they, he'd catch them out all the time like that. But um, anyway, the the guy Peckerwood, he was only in on multiple traffic violations. He didn't have a license. Didn't, he never paid taxes on his car. He's never, he, he just bought a car and drove it, didn't have insurance. And, and he wound up with like something like 25, 30,000, you know, dollars in, violations so they threw his happy ass in prison for a year you know and uh he got in there and the the other guys the other two were bonafide gangsters they were they were drug dealers and uh you know they didn't you know they were thing but yeah it was just one of those things but you know uh it was just the idea that these guys would bring such joy to so many people in the yard because like i said every time they'd get called on the thing there but i can give you the, but CDC has this funny way of, of, of playing that when they know they got that. Because at the same prison, we had uh, these guys that were bunked up, right? And one guy was uh, named Blue Baugh, 
And the other guy was named Red Dick. Right? And they would they would have they would call the building and tell the officer, we need blue ball and red dick. And of course, not everybody's accent plays right. So I need blue balls and red dick at my desk. I need blue <laughs> balls and red dick at my desk, right? And there's stuff like that. But the funnier one was at Avenal, and we had an Indian named Harry Dick. That was his actual name. <laughs> Swear to God, actual name. And every time they had a female officer work in his wing, and when they were visiting, they, the, the sergeant in the office would go, yeah, call her and tell her. I need Harry Dick. I need a Harry Dick up at my desk. You're going to visit. Can I get a Harry Dick for a visit? And about three or four times, the all female officers would go, I've been played. And then <laughs> Harry Dick would walk up, get his pass, go to his visit. You know, he thought, he thought you know, but like I said, CDC's always been where, where they don't have a problem clowning people on their thing. Funny enough, they don't like being clowned back, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, but, you know, that's so, you know, we had a guy named McDougal, you know, and you know what Mac means? It means son of. Sorry? Son of. Mac okay. means son of. You know, if it's, in, if it's Ui, it means wife of. If it's Nia, it means daughter of. Okay? It's Gaelic. Right? And Dougal, well, if you break it down, Duv is black. Gal meant foreigner. So his name meant, name meant son of a black foreigner. Right? And he was, he was a guy that was at CMC with us. I'm oh, not sorry, DVI with us. And he was a real dick of a cop. If you walked down the hallway and he thought you had too much lunch in your bag, he'd just rip it out of your hand. Wouldn't even ask you, just rip it out and, and, and cause a scene. <clears throat> and one day, you know, he did that to one of the guys I knew, um, a black guy. And uh, he didn't like the guy because he used to think he was up deep. Problem was he was just educated. He spoke well, he was educated, all this stuff. Yes, he did it in prison, but he still was all that. And um, anyway, so I made the comment to him after he got back to work with me. I told him, yeah, you know, I said, just so you know, you have to forgive him because he, he's just feeling a little bent right now because you're not acknowledging him. He goes, what do you mean I'm not acknowledging him? So I'm telling the inmate, right? And, and I go, yeah, well, you know, his name means he's the son of a black foreigner. <clears throat> he goes, what? And I said, yeah. And I showed him, wrote it out in Gaelic to him. And uh, he goes, so what you're telling me is that he has black ancestors. I said, well, that's not necessarily true. I said, because in, in the old times, black could mean color of the guy's hair because you were called by your hair or a mark you had. Or something. He could, black could also mean he has a really messed up attitude. But he was foreign, which meant he wasn't from scotland which is where this guy's ancestry was so he could have been from the iberian peninsula had black hair and had a bad attitude he'd be known as black foreigner that type of thing he goes no no i like the fact that he you know that he's got black in him <laughs> so so he, he walked up to him and he goes hey bro and he slapped the cop's hand right, what the hell he goes man it's okay it's okay i understand you know you're passing it's all right man he goes I'll keep it down low for you. What the hell do you mean? He goes, oh, come on. I know that you're the son of a black foreigner, man. And, and where, how much blacker? He goes, what, a Somalian? Nigerian. No, 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 no. He goes, I'm Scottish. He goes, yeah, but your name says something else. And, and McDougal didn't know that. So he actually went and found out. He come back and he's like mad. God, he's mad. He's like, well, nobody better say I'm black again. And suddenly you had guys walking by with little signs going, McDougal's black. <laughs> little shit like that, you know? And it was just, it was an ongoing thing, right? <laughs> and, uh, but the funny thing is with McDougal, I had very little problems with him. The only time I ever had a problem was I went on a visit one time. And a matter of fact, that photo, uh, is the problem he had because he didn't like my shirt sleeves. Um, he, he, he goes, that looks like an altered shirt. I said, no, sir. I said, it was issued to me in the, the prison laundry. And uh, so when I went to, uh, he took me over the prison laundry and they got me another shirt and they gave it to me and it fit me just the same way. <laughs> <laughs> How big were your guns at that age? 
all at this point in time they were only about 17 maybe Still 17 and a half 60 mm. so yeah. sorry yeah. Uh, you speak fluent gaelic no i don't speak fluent gaelic you i write. speak gaelic but only what okay i have what they refer to as hesitant conversational it means that i can speak I can speak some Manx Gaelic, which a lot of people have argued about, that there is no Manx Gaelic. It is Manx Gaelic. It is based on the Irish Gaelic, um, Irish Middle Gaelic, actually. <clears throat> but I can I can do conversational. Konostatu makara means how are you, my friend? Yeah, and your your thing would be te, uh, te mi goma, means I am fine. And my response would be agastatu, and I am too. You know, uh, you know I own a doe, a tree, a quar. Kehar, say, a shek, an ak, a a day. But I can do Spanish. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, si, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. You know? Um, que on the way. Know, yeah. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, so, you know, bon is white, duv is black, don is brown, you know, ru is red, you know. So the thing is that I could write Gaelic. I had, I had Gaelic material, funny enough. It was actually sent to me by the Irish embassy, some of the stuff. But, <clears throat> when I was a little kid, Martha, who was Irish, matter of fact, from the Isle of Man, she had been part of the Irish, the Boswell Irish gypsies who used to be up on Douglas Point. And they, from the 1850s, they had horse fairs and all this stuff. And she was the one that taught me. But what she did, it she taught me so we could talk what she referred to as mommy speak. So we spoke stuff. So I only knew up until... I was probably 18, 19, when I started actually looking into more of my cultural stuff. I only knew enough, knew Gaelic to carry on a conversation if I was talking to my mom. You know, where are we going? You know, what are we doing? You know, is, are we do you know, am I, you know, hungry? I'm, you know, cold, things along that. So it wasn't fluent in that respect, but the fact was I could speak it. But the thing was, I could speak more Gaelic than other guys in prison. And that's kind of where people got the misconception of this. That, but I did use it to my own advantage at the time just to confuse people. You know, I'm sorry. I just, well, but you know, but it's like the thing when somebody would come up to me and I could see they've got an issue. They come up to me and they'd say something to me and I go, you want me to do what to you? How many times? And now they're like, because now they're not sure what the hell they asked me. <laughs> you know, what, 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 what? what? Because I, I would do things like that. Sorry about your luck. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I did things like this, you know. But the thing was that, but I've gone through and like said, I, um, I didn't, she taught me Irish, Irish Gaelic because that's what she was. When I learned later there was Manx Gaelic, I started contacting Culture Vannin on the Isle of Man. They sent me stuff. And so I started learning. And so now my focus is to basically become functionally literate in Manx Gaelic. Now I can write Gaelic much better than I could speak it, you know? And, uh, but the thing was that it's just that I could, you know, like I said, it's like, like we were talking about, like people putting runes on. There became a big thing in prison where a lot of whites, particularly ones that were leaning Norse type stuff, they would take and write runes out. Well, runes were a secret religious magical thing they weren't meant to sit down and write okay you got to go kill this guy right here and get a dope from him that's not what that's not what they were meant for that is little stones yeah and, and then the funny part is is that people don't realize there's not just one type of runes you know there's lots of different I, you know i've got like 12 different versions of the runes depending on whether it's you know the old runes the new runes you younger elder futhark uh germanic you know, you know, most of the Eastern European, most of the Europeans where any Nordic people had been in, had their own types, all that. But the Celts never had runes. They had what's called Ogham. And that's a different type of writing. But but that's what I'm saying. People, most people learn this much of a, of something and then they like, now they're, they're still thing. Me, I actually did a lot of studying. I, I you know, I, about the Celts and Norse and all that stuff. And I actually have enough material. I could actually write a book or put a book together. Because I used to teach people in prison. Uh, when people did ask about certain things, I would teach them about different cultural and religious type things. So anyway, but that's... So did you have pagan religious services? Yes, I, I, ran, I ran those. Uh, you ran had, ground, had grounds at different prisons and stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, but, 
you know, and, and the thing was, it was more the idea that for me, it was my cultural identity. And, and, and that's why I try explaining to people, you know, that, um, there's people who want to borrow from this religion and, or this culture and that culture and that culture and that culture, and then say it's all theirs. It doesn't work quite work that way, but people do this. It's like tattoos. You know, I remember when, when people come up and go, I want tribal tattooing. And you'd suddenly see these just marks. Well, that's not necessarily tribal tattooing. You know, I mean, there are tribes who had tattoos, but they weren't. Now, like with mine, you know, I've got my, my Isle of Man three legs here. Well, these are just my version of an eight more ancient three legs. Yeah. You know, but this is mine in that respect. You know, so yeah, I mean, so that's you know, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry to get off the list. That's Someone. all right. Um we'll go on to the story. Christian Brando and Christian Brando and, and Charles, Charles Keating. Keating. Yeah. Keating. So this is Marlon Brando's son. <laughs> Marlon Brando's son. And Keating was part of the savings and loans. Link, the Lincoln fraud Savings and Loan in Arizona, fraud. wasn't he? Well, no, he he was actually in in, in Arizona and California. He had few because he was doing what they used to call the 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 penny bonds or something like that, where he would get poor people to invest money and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'll go with Charles Keating first. We talked about that, and he had the Lincoln Five, which had like John you know, had John Glenn and uh, these other senators and all that stuff involved in. But he he uh, he ended up doing four years in prison before his conviction was basically overturned and stuff. And the four years in prison he did, it was at CMC, you know? And when he first thing he did, when he got to CMC, they took his wig, his, his, his you know, his, he had, he had a, a, a rug, a rug, <laughs> toupee, toupee. Anyway, they took it from him because you're not allowed. For people who are not familiar, what does CMC stand for? Oh, California Men's Colony. Oftentimes called the home, the, the home of the stars because basically very famous people went there. Ike Turner was there when I was there. Yeah. Uh, we had like, say Christian Brando, you know, you, you, you had, uh, um, I won't try to remember the name of the drum, the drummer, but there was a drummer from a, a, one of the famous bands. He was there. Yeah. I mean, but you, uh, Hollywood Henderson, who was a, a football player and, and was in for rape, got out and then wins $26 million in a lottery. Yeah. I mean, you know, but <clears throat> we had, we had a lot of, there were a lot of stars came through there. Um, and the well-known uh, criminals. But anyway, Charles Keating came there and of course they took his toupee, which, you know, like he, that's the part of his image, you know, unlike some of us who don't really worry about that. Um, but he, uh, he realized quickly that very few Hispanics ever invested in stocks and bonds and things like that. Cause they don't have that kind of thought process in you know they're they're more family oriented things like that. but the whites and the blacks were always trying to get get up a little bit trying to make a little bit for some so he realized very quickly that some of the people at the prison had family who had lost money through his stuff and they were whites and blacks so he paid the southern mexicans to protect him and anytime he went anywhere, he had about a dozen of them walking, some in front, some on the side, some behind him, all this stuff. And I knew the, I knew the guy who was the shot caller at the time for the Southern Mexicans there. And uh, I talked to him one time about it and he says, oh yeah, he goes, you know, he kicks us down so much money a month. We get quarterly packages. He even has girls come up and see us and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all worked out for everybody, you know? And we don't let anybody hurt him. He takes care of us. He's even offered us a few jobs, a few of us jobs when we get out through friends of his for doing this, protecting him. Is that a racial violation though for a white guy to pay the Mexicans to protect him? It would be accepted CMC. CMC was basically supposed to be a neutral ground. It got, it it was funny. Everybody would tell you in prison, you know, if you can get CMC, it's great because you have all, you have more, more prison industries there. You had nine. So there's a lot of money to be made. You had more vocations there. You know, you had like uh, more than a dozen there. You had the, all the college stuff. You could get college degrees from Cuesta C- City College, you could, from Chapman U- University, and from Cal, Cal State, U- uh, San Luis Obispo. So you had all this kind of, you know, stuff. So the politics was more relaxed. Yeah. And, and well, the thing was because 
Here's the thing. No active gang member could go down there. Mm. You had to debrief if you wanted to go down. So that was one reason why they get people who were been victimized other places. Sometimes, you know, a lot of them got to go down there, but high pro some high profile, the child chill, kidnapper guys were down there. You know, there, you know, there were, you know, um, um, guy who killed Pauly class. Um, I'm trying to think of his name right now. Um, oh. Richard Allen Davis. He was there and I knew him before he got out and killed Pauly class. And funny enough, as soon as he, as soon as, as soon as the, the drawing came up of the suspect, there must've been a dozen guys at CMC run to the office to tell him who they believed it was because it was such a great drawing. They did so. And he was such a dick when he was there. I mean, he, he, he'd make a cell. He stay out of the cell all the time. <clears throat> very, very antisocial person. But anyway, so Charles Keating was into, into all that. And so he stayed aloof. So you really didn't get to know Charles Keating, except you knew who he was because he had all the guards around him. Yeah. And uh, he'd go to eat and he, he would eat at the Mexicans tables. And then they had all the tables around him, to protect him and stuff like that. Where at CMC, we usually just sat where we wanted, but they made it to where he had a protective bubble around him. And he was on B quad, which B quad was basically a half medical quad anyway. And what, what and then they also had an ad seg there. So it was very little main line. It was the smallest main line of the section there. Now, Christian Brando is a whole nother story. Good Christian Brando r- rolls up there. Just tell Jim what he was in for first. This is Marlon Brando's son. Okay, Marlon Brando's son, oh. Christian Brando. He had a sister named Cheyenne. And she had a boyfriend who was allegedly beating her up and stuff like that. Well, anyway, he ends up killing the guy. When he did that, Cheyenne went kind of crazy and got, got had to be put in a hospital. Anyway, he ended up getting his case and he got manslaughter out of it. Uh, <clears throat> so, but when they got, they got him to CMC so they could protect him basically because he was a celebrity himself and a celebrity son. Now we had no visiting at this time on Tuesdays and Wednesdays during the week, except for Marlon Brando. He could come up to visit his son on those two days that way he wouldn't be harassed by other visitors but the problem that came out was that he'd come in and a guard would come up and go uh, mr brando uh, i need you to sign this um uh, saying the security pass saying that you're here today and uh, oh could you put it to frank front me up and uh oh here's a fo- here's a a, sec- a security photo of me standing next to you. Could you put in here to your best friend? And so you had cops doing this to give him his props. He was compliant because he wanted to see his son. He didn't want to cause waves and stuff, but that came to a, a, uh, a head when we had a captain uh, who found out this was going on and went down there and told him he comes in. He's nobody. You leave him alone. You let him visit his son. I don't want to hear about it. I hear about it. You'd be out on your ear. And it was pretty good that way. But <clears throat> this one had gone on for about six, seven months before. But when they, when Christian Brando came again to protect him, they put him in D quad. Now D quad was the major nut quad. It's where they had the cat J's, which are uh, paranoid schizophrenics in remission and the cat K's, which are the ones that are not in remission that are on heavy, heavy, lobotomy medicine you know and all that kind of that shit like that. noisy no no it was both pretty much quiet because oh, yeah because the guys were just so medicated most of the time oh. so they put him over there but they give him a job on the back dock of the kitchen because they have two guards right there so they can always watch him and nobody can get to him type thing at this time i worked in the laundry and my job as uh i ran the one of the laundry washing machines but i was a uh, assistant lead man so i would also take rags over to the clothing room and to the kitchen so i'd bring rags over well we had a working deal with the bakery i would bring them extra rags and they would give me fresh made donuts and coffee to take back to my crew and we had this little thing but when i'd go there who did i have to get the rags to i had to give them to christian brando now i didn't get a lot of conversation out of him because he was really kind of funny enough he's very big man you know height wise but he was very shy and things so we you know i would i would do this but i'd always say hi and i never called him by his name because i didn't want him to know i knew who he was that type of thing i'd just go hey how you doing today and stuff so we end up um doing this well 
Turns out one day, the uh, the head of the kitchen uh, sees me walking back with donuts and coffee, you know, a bag of grounds and this big box of donuts. So I said, where'd you get those? Because these donuts were only made by the vocational bakery and they were only made for the staff. The other, they were made, you know, and then the, when the other baker guys came in, they would make stuff for us, not nearly as good. And I, and I go, well, I, I got them, from, you know, from the staff member because, you know, I'm not, I'm not, what am I going to tell them? That's where I got them from. I can't walk in there. I don't have keys, right? Says, well, that's going to stop. Okay, no problem. And took it from me, right? Okay. So next day, or next couple days when they need rags again, I took their I took their issue of rags over, one small bag. And they go, what happens? It? Your boss said, I can't get donuts and coffee. You can't get rags. It's the way it works. It's real simple. Prison, you know, prison politics, the way it works. About a, about a month went by, and they're bitching, complaining, because their rags get greasy and all this stuff. And the lady go, calls, c- catches me one morning. She goes, we need more rags than that. I said, well, that's all you're allotted. No, we need more rags. I said, that's all you're allotted. I said, we had a program where you got more rags, and we got the extras, coffee and donuts that you guys didn't need. Wait right there. Next note, she comes down with a bigger bag of coffee and much more donuts and said, we need more rags. I said, no, I'll probably be right back. Yeah, and stuff. But with Christian, I had, working in the laundry, <clears throat> we worked first watch. So we'd go in, it's like seven o'clock at night and get off at six in the morning. We had this, you know, like 11 hour shift. <clears throat> it was really great because when they had holidays, we worked that holiday night. We got holiday pay back then. They used to actually give it to us. So we have this one guy, and he's an orange hat. And orange hat were volunteers who would go over to the, the uh, D quad and they would get the, the guys to come out of their cells because otherwise they'd just sit in there and drool on them. So get them out and try to get them play frisbee and throw a ball and try to give them some exercise stuff. And it, and it looked good for the board that you were socially involved and all this stuff. So this guy was one of those guys. So one, one day... Uh, oh, we had we had inmate photographers on the yards too. By the way, you pay them a ducat, which is a one dollar. You buy them in the canteen, you trade it, and they'll take a photo for you. So he goes to this one guy on the yard there, and, and that guy on that yard didn't make much money because most of the others didn't know that anything about t- paying for photos, so they didn't get. So the guy went to him, told him, "Here, I'm going to give you these ten ducats. And I want you to get a couple of photos for me." He goes. I'm going to walk up to Christian Brando, put my arm over his shoulder. And when he turns to look at me, I want you to take photos. The guy goes, okay, I'm not sure. Well, no problem. Because, you know, hey, it's $10 in my hand. I ain't been making much money because they only got like $20 a month just to be there. So they you got extra money for being doing the photos. So he goes and does this, right? Okay, all good. He told only two guys in the laundry that he had done, that he's going to do this, right? Didn't tell anybody else. And those two guys, real tight lip. Nobody, nobody's giving him up. So he gets the photo, and it looks like they're about to kiss. Now, they had a thing called the National Enquirer. It's a little rag newspaper thing. You know, you just, you're just you having a Martian baby and that type of thing, you know. Um, and they don't really, and so he figured they don't have any scruples. So he figured that what he'd do is he would just send them the photo, send them byline. Christian Brando is my prison love slave, <laughs> right? He figured that ought to be worth like five hundred dollars, right? You know, hey, you know, you've got to get a hustle, right? You know, hustle's a hustle. Sends it out, and probably for the first time in the history of the National Choir, they had some scruples, and they contacted the prison. It's like 2 a.m. in the morning, and we hear dun, 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 boots slapping along the, the runway out there. The doors of the laundry boost open. In come 12 members of the security squad, both sergeants, the lieutenant, and they holler out this guy's name. <clears throat> now, what you have, out of the corner of my eye, I see him dive into a freshly... Uh, pulled out laundry out of a dryer and cover himself up. We're locked in a laundry. 
There's only so many places, right? It's not long before they find him. They drag him out. They cuff him up. They ankle chain him. And they face drop him about half a dozen times before they take him out. They drag him down. They take and they shut the doors. The guards in our thing tells say everybody stay away from the door. Stay the door door. Okay, so everybody runs upstairs to the upstairs area so we can look out the window. Look out the window. You see them taking him down the alleyway, down by medical. But that's where they keep the vans that they're going to transport people in. 10, 15 minutes later, you see a car go out, a van go out, another car go out, and he's gone. <clears throat> they take him to Tatchby Max. And from what I've understood from a few people who saw him over there, Apparently, he got worked over more than a few times uh, to where he was almost unrecognizable, permanently unrecognizable. Um, it's amazing what a, a PR24 baton will do to your, your face and your hands and stuff like that. And uh, then we got this big warning the next morning when uh, the captain came in from the watch office before we got out and said, if anybody else has a bright idea like this, please run it by me first. <laughs> and I'll tell you whether it's a good one or not. <laughs> he says, otherwise, you know, there might be repercussions behind this and stuff. Um, yeah, so, um, but after that happened, everybody just kind of gave Christian a, a pretty wide berth about thing, you know, and then, you know, so... <laughs> All right. I'm going to go Sea Hag next. Sea Hag. Sea <laughs> Hag was at CMC. He was on Sea on on Yard, which Sea Yard was half mainline inmates and half, uh, you know, the Cat J's. Because the one, if you're if you're paranoid, schizophrenic, and remission means you're 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 doing well on your meds. You're not you know you. But they they had you couldn't be out if it was over a certain temperature. If it's over 90 degrees. You had to go back to your cell and they had air conditioning in, in the building stuff. <clears throat> sea Hag was an old uh, merchant Marine. And uh, he would be uh, kind of like Hemingway. If you looked, if you saw a picture of Hemingway, that's Sea Hag. Just not so neat. The beard was not so neat, right? And uh, he was a clerk in the building and he was known to build plank-on-plank plank ships. And he did them so historically correct that three of them were bought for the governor's mansions in Sacramento. And we're not talking that he got paid a few hundred dollars for these. His ships went at that time for 10000 for a historically correct big full schooner type thing. The cheapest one he ever did was just a dinghy that he built. And that was like 5000 you know, and, you know, he did all the meticulous, everything. And he, he, you know, I give him his props. He knew it. Now we had, uh, at CMC, because like I say, CMC had a lot of things. We had a stamp club. We had a walking club. We had a yoga club. We had a Tai Chi club. We had tennis club. We all had handball club. We had a nine hole putting green on a yard. And we had an investors club. We had Blake Sleen, Blake Sleen investments. And we had one guy named John Eicher who was his whole clientele were inmates at CMC because we had a lot of money there. All the guys working PIA, making a lot of money. You know, uh, some of the vocations also paid apprenticeship money. But then we, so we had the, and we had guys who had hustles and so, and hobby shop. We had guy, we had the, the average hobby shop monthly taken for inmates was about 10 grand. For all the different leather belts, beaded earrings, wood paintings, whatever. So we had a lot of money there. And so <clears throat> Sea Hag built these ships and he sold these ships and and he always had standing orders. It was not like he didn't have, you know. So he'd sold many, 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 many ships to people. And uh he invested his money, he was part of that. And I got involved in it and I bought mutual funds and stuff. But um John Eicher used to come in and he'd tell people, now I've got I've got a hot, hot one right now. He said, it's kind of risky, but if it goes through, it's going to pay off. And he would tell you, this, and he would give tips that were probably not legally for him to give, but he would do this. And Sea Hag was one of the ones who would take these. And Sea Hag, more times than not, scored big. So 
But Seahag, like I said, he would rub people wrong because he was gruffy. He'd just get gruff at you, you know? You know, and particularly if you were young and stupid, and we had a lot of young and stupid officers. And they'd come down, they'd, they'd tell him, hey, I need you to do that. And he goes, that's not my job. Go get somebody else. And the guy said, I just told you. I, did you not hear what I said? And then he shut his the cell door. And the cop opened and he shut it again. And he, he was just this way. But he worked for the sergeant. He didn't work for the officers. And they did, some of them didn't know that. So one day, uh, the cop was up there and he was talking about Seahag. He goes, I went and looked up his file. He goes, you know what he's in here for? He said, he put a shotgun in the mouth of a guy and blew his head dead off. And he goes, he goes, he's a trash. Seag hears him. Seag walks to his cell, comes out, brings out this little portfolio book, slaps it up there and tells him, check this out. I've been down 25 years. I killed a man who molested my daughter. And he goes, and uh, I'm worth $2 million right now. I'm worth more after 25 years in prison than you'll ever fucking be worth. I'm never getting out of prison. I know I'm never getting out of prison. He goes, but you know what? My granddaughters are going to be really well. They're going to be going to colleges. They're going to be well set up, you know, and that's all that matters. And every, every week his daughter and his granddaughters came up to see him, you know, and they loved him just, I mean, when you'd see him out there, he, he was, he was, the tip, he was the perfect granddad out there. I mean, he was just all that, but back in his cell, he went, and, and, and he tell the guy, he goes, yeah, he goes, guy grabs my daughter and assaults her. And because he's the son of a police chief, the police tell me, you know, we don't have enough evidence. Oh, we've lost the DNA. Oh, this, oh, that, all these other things. He says, well, me, you know, he goes, I went and I got my shotgun, 10 gauge greener. And I put two twin 10 gauge shells through his head. And you know what? That won't be another woman hurt. And he goes, and I don't really care. And the guy's like, well, uh, 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 he goes, you know, maybe you ought to read past the, the first line and something. And he goes, but how come you're not going to get out of prison? He goes, I killed the police chief's son. He goes, do you think I'm ever going to see the streets again? He goes, I'm not going to, but I don't care. My family's safe. My family know I love them and my family's going to be taken care of. Now, if you ever have something to say about me, you better come tell me before you go tell others. And he left it at that. And, uh, but yeah, he'd been a merchant Marine. God, he, he retired. He had a pension from that, you know, and yeah, you know, he was up there, but, uh, yeah, I mean, but, uh, yeah, he just, he was a great, he was a great guy all in all. Like I said, you know, of course, like I said, he's long passed away now, you know, but you know, he, he, I mean, he never got out. I'm sure he passed away, but I'm sure he put was in his sleep. Who was sentenced to 27 life sentences without parole? The, um, I think it says above it. Oh, that was the Schoenfeld brothers. That, uh, that's the Chowchilla kidnappers, Schoenfelds, and then Ed Woods. Um, <clears throat> they kidnapped uh, 26 children and, and a bus driver and a bus. And, oh, the bus one. Yeah, the bus one, yeah. That was huge news. Yeah, and when I got to CMC, James and Rick Schoenfeld, the brothers, were there. And <clears throat> they were the epitome of being uh, the best uh, tennis team out there they were always golden tanned and out there and stuff when woods finally showed up he was all pasty and stuff he'd he'd had a harder time than they did but the thing was these were all kids that had came from family with money the problem was they didn't want to wait for money they wanted money now and so they they kidnapped this the busload of kids in chowchilla uh, and it's kind of funny because it was it's based on the idea of the dirty harry film when they took the bus and thing like that, but they took it and they took it into this quarry, and they basically buried the, the bus in the quarry. Problem is, the quarry actually was owned by one of Woods's family members. I can't remember his dad or his uncle or something like that. But <clears throat> they had a bus driver, and he was an older guy and stuff. And the most of the kids were a lot stronger than people think kids could be, and they actually were able to to get their way out through the the vent the, on the top of the bus. And then they got away. But the interesting thing was that they didn't get away right away. It was like they were there for quite a few hours. But, um, you know, the uh, the youngest, uh, Schoenfeld, actually 
gave them some water bottles and stuff, you know, and stuff. But when I met the Schoenfelds, I, I happened to see them one day and, and, uh, and they were out there playing the tennis and stuff. And one of the balls came over my way and, uh, he goes, Hey, throw that ball. So I picked up and I threw it in the opposite direction. And he's like, did you do that for? He said, you said, let me throw it. Yeah, I meant to me. I said, you didn't say throw it to me. You said, throw it. So I threw it. Right. And of course, at this point in time, I was kind of having a bit of my attitude because I was new, kind of just coming into the grips that shit was going wrong. They'd already t- taken all my good time, my work time. The governor got the right to take our dates. You know, so I was kind of like not, not all that wanting to be buddy, buddy, friendly, all that kind of shit there. So anyway, he, uh, um, and I just come down from DVI and, uh, so he comes over and he said something to me and I go, you know, I don't really care who the fuck you think you are. And he, and then he said, you know, <clears throat> we're the Schoenfeld brothers. And then it clicked. <clears throat> I said, oh, <clears throat> so you guys just go and, and steal ki- school kids, right? <clears throat> and he gets all kind of huffy and stuff like that. So I said, well, let me, let me add you this little tidbit. I said, do you realize how lucky you are that you're in prison? He goes, what do you mean? I said, you may not realize, but the moment that bus went missing and word got out, one of the little girls on that bus was the niece of the San Jose chapter of the Hells Angels. And word got sent to all the bike shops and clubs in the valley. I said, if you'd been out that day on the highway, you would have been amazed at how many guys were riding bikes with no woman, but they had bundles of had blanket wraps on their handlebars and stuff. And, the, and cause the word was that they wanted you or whoever did it to be turned over to them. And he's like, well, it's not like they would have killed us. I said, that would have been what you've been hoping for. <clears throat> so after that, he kind of gave me a little bit of a wide berth and stuff, <clears throat> but I can tell you when I first hit CMC, the very first day, I really got the whole shock thing. Cause I get into R and R the receiving and releasing thing. And they give you your property. And normally you take a few days to get your property. I got mine right then there. The cop goes, oh, here, would you like your property right now? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, oh, well, come here. And I, the, and then I realized that this cop is like super gay, right? And then I realized that all the inmates working in R&R are, are super gay, you know? And they're all calling each other girl, friend, and da-da-da-da-da, including the officers calling it, you know, stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is... Uh, so I don't really know much what's going on here. So I get the, the box <clears throat> and they, they're going, ooh, oh. And they keep handing my stuff to me and I'm putting it in another bags that they give me. And then they go, would you like a lunchbox? And they bring me a lunchbox. Now, most prisons, you get this crappy peanut butter or some kind of mystery meat sandwich type thing. Here they bring me a nice little cardboard box you open it up it's got a fruit cup in it it's got a can of uh deviled ham that's in the can it's got a nice roll it's got condiments you know it's got some onions and tomatoes and stuff it's got some chips and it's got some you know biscuits and i and then they go would you like a juice or would you like a soda and i'm like where the hell am i here this kind of thing so i get my stuff and i get it back and they take me to my cell my cell is at work both bunks are made so since both bunks are made, and some people do like the top bunk, I put my stuff on the floor till I see the guy. So there's no dude start. We're not going to start with disrespect off the gate, you know. So I go out to the yard. Now, all I've got on at this time is I've got a, a white T-shirt, and it's not really a thick T-shirt because it's well worn type thing, and my jeans, and I've got my boots because we transferred in that. <clears throat> so I'm walking the walking the thing and i'm seeing and there's all these people sunbathing on the yard you know and they've got their shorts pulled up as high as they can get them and they've got oil and they're laying on blankets and they're sound asleep and stuff and i'm thinking i just came from dvi you do not close your eyes on the prison yard you do not lay out on a towel you you're not and and here it's just like everybody's doing this type thing there's like maybe two dozen people out here so i'm walking and as i come around this one corner i hear feet running up behind me and I spin and I grab the person and I throw him into the bushes against this building, right? 
Turned out he was just running the track. <laughs> right? Hey, you asshole. What the fuck's wrong with you? I said, man, you ran up on me. Man, I was trying to get past you. Hey, you ran up on me. That's all I know. You know? And like I said, I just came from gladiator school the first time. You know, so, I mean, somebody comes running up on you, you've got to expect something. So I'm walking the track and I'm just trying to take it all in. And then all of a sudden, I, I see a shadow behind me. And it's a guy crouching down. And he's creeping type thing, right? And so I get over by where, where the weight pile is. I immediately drop down, pick up a five-pound weight, and spin on him. And he's like, whoa, whoa, brother. It ain't like that. And I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm trying to see what your tattoos are through your shirt. <laughs> what? He goes, yeah, I saw you had tattoos. I was trying to see what they were. The hell is wrong with you, Right? And he goes, where'd you come from? I said, DVI. Oh, yeah, man, we ain't like that up here. I put the weight back down. I said, okay, well, get in front of me. He goes, oh, okay. And he gets in front of me. And he, I'm making him stand like three feet in front of me and talk back to me. You know? <laughs> and, I, and, and the guy's like, yeah. He goes, but he's, then he says, okay, but now watch. He says, see that guy? See that guy? See that guy? And those two over there? He goes, don't do anything in front of them because they're the yard snitches. He goes, the way the policy is here, you're only allowed to have 30 yard ducats in your possession at a time. If you've got more than 30, the cops find it. They'll take the extras. They give them to the yard sergeant. And then he pays these guys when they tell on things that are happening and stuff. And we weren't there about 20 minutes after that. And all of a sudden I see one guy start running and then you see another one running. And you see these, and there, and the idea is that the first guy who tells and the second guy who backs up the stuff both get paid <clears throat> the other ones don't get paid you know so it's like first come first serve and uh sure enough they go and they tell they saw somebody doing a drug deal and one guy told but the second guy didn't see it but he got close enough to hear what the first guy said so he could confirm it because that's part of the thing if you you know if you don't see it you still get close enough you can hear it. and so you, you have this type of um a process and stuff and so basically what the rule of thumb was, you find yourself one or two decent, solid people. Me, I had two solid people. I had Moose, my celly, and I had Ted Tybor Karsai, who was an allegedly a bagman for the Russian mob out of Sacramento. Now, they never caught him, but they had been, had him, the police and federal government had had him under surveillance, and they, uh, had walking him down and around to, uh, he was going to do pickups. And they saw him going and come out of these places with this, this little satchel. And then he went down this alley. Well, the funny thing about this alley is it actually turns into almost like a V. So there's like a blind spot from both ends right at the tip. They can't quite see it because it kind of flattens out before it comes back out. And they see him going with the bag comes back out he ain't got a bag so they grab him up and they run down there and they put cops in every dipsy dumpster trash bin thing they can find can't find a bag can find no evidence of a bag and uh and they go we we where's the money he goes what money we know you had money you were collecting money he goes i don't know what you're talking about and he held on held on held on so they arrest him under the the fact they have 72 hours to build the case <clears throat> they get two people that he brought money out of that said, yeah, I gave him this much money. I gave him that much money. And um, they were able to protect those people till his trial. But they were going to give him five years. So I met him. And um, the thing was, you look at him, he was nowhere near as big as I was. But he was, if you looked at his arms up close, they were like cords of cords cable he could he could virtually hit the same amount of iron as i could on almost everything only the incline and decline benches could he not hit what i could hit but other than that he was like said pound for pound he was uh you know pretty much but he was a great guy he was and he happened to marry a, <clears throat> a sister of one of the guys who happened to be attached to the russian mob people and uh but he was deported back to romania because that's where he actually was from but uh yeah he was he was a great guy but i'll tell you what the funny thing was he got transferred to solano while we were there to do like his last year and uh he liked chew he liked uh tobacco chew mm -hmm. 
you put in your gums. And uh, <clears throat> when you got on the bus at that time, they stopped letting you wear boots. You had to wear flip-flops. And he had a pair of bright yellow flip-flops. Don't ask me how he got me at them. But he found out that Solano made you wait two weeks to get your property. Well, he couldn't do without Chew for two weeks, and he didn't want to have to go try to borrow Chew and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> he bought these cigars that we had in the canteen, and they came in a plastic holder. And he packed like as much Chew. He had like six these things packed in these. And he had three of them, and he taped them together, and he hooped them the morning he was going to get on the bus, right? And I knew another guy getting on the bus with him. I told him, hey, when you see the guy with the yellow flip-flops, I said, sit behind him. I said, when you get about 10 miles out of town, go, the hell smells like Copenhagen. (laughs) (laughs) Because what ended up happening is they stopped at Soledad for overnight. So he couldn't eat anything the whole time before he went to the next day there. But I get a message back from his wife. And she said, Ted says, ha ha that was so funny <laughs> so i knew the guy had done it to him you know? but uh yeah he was he was a really a really great guy and stuff you know and like i said he's somebody that if i ever met i'd i'd love to kick it with because but yeah we we you know uh and funny thing with him robbie rosencrantz you know who we're coming up on was there and i'll tell you when his his attitude towards robbie yeah you know, so. what's robbie's story then Okay, Robbie Rosencrantz, uh, he was 18 years old. Um, he was gay, but he wasn't known to be gay. He had a girl that everybody thought was his girlfriend who also was gay, right? So they used to go places so they could be with the people they wanted to be with. They were having a graduation party from high school. <clears throat> so his be- one of his, like his best friend that from high school who also, like I said, did not know he was gay and his brother um kind of got word that there was this gay thing going on so they came at him with a, with a stun gun uh you know and um uh, they, and they did something else but they came in and uh <clears throat> basically broke in the room i think it had a, a, like a bat or a baton or something broke in the room and 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 st- well they broke the party all up you know and stuff but then what ended up happening was the best friend went to Robbie's dad. Now, Rosencrantz, he's Jewish, went to his dad and told him, you know, he's gay. Good, strong Jewish family, not a thing to do. So there was a big thing, and basically his dad threw him out on his ear. You know, you're no son of mine, you're dead to me, da 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 all that time. Well, Robbie ends up going out, <clears throat> spends a few days, finds it, gets a place where he finds, and he gets a U, gets an Uzi. You know, and he has the Uzi, you know, uh, and takes photos of him holding the Uzi and, you know, doing all that, that, that kind of stuff. But he goes on a drive by looking for the friend. The story he tells everybody, he just wanted to convince the guy to, re, to redact his story, say, no, that's not. But his brother also told the dad, you know. But he said he only planned to shoot the guy's car up. Well, he ended up shooting the guy in the car in about 10, 12 rounds, something like that. And killed the guy. So he gets a second degree. Well, his dad was involved with the movie industry, I understood. So he had long thing. Now, normally, unless you were like certain people like Christian Brando, who still had to go through Chino reception before you could get to CMC, you don't come, you don't just come to CMC. It doesn't happen. He does. Right from county jail, he comes to CMC. Not only does he come to CMC, he's given a cell in the honor unit up on the third floor, up where Tex Watson and those guys are living. You don't get a single cell. You have to wait on a waiting list, sometimes up to five or more years. He gets the job working in the office as a lieutenant's clerk. Wait a minute. He's just been here. He hasn't been here 24 hours. He's got a job. The guy who had the job, who'd had the job for years, was found to have some heroin in his cell. Interesting thing, and you might know a bit more about this. If you are a meth head, how often do you use heroin? Never. You do. Right. So the guy that that was in there was a meth guy, yet he suddenly gets busted with heroin. 
Yeah. And uh, so he goes the hole, loses his cell, loses his job. Robbie walks into it. That right there did not endear him to people on the yard. Even the guys who were pieces of shit on the yard weren't happy with that because who the fuck is this guy? 18 year old kid, blah, 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 and stuff. And he's going, I'm not gay. I'm not gay. I'm not gay. I'm not gay. All this type. Well, <clears throat> suddenly we have officers getting hernias from carrying his mailbags from all the, the young gay kids that are writing to him, you know, support and, oh, I'm, you know, this type of thing. And he starts getting this big following of people. I mean, seriously, money being sent in, all this stuff. And he starts by, and CMC was one of the few places where you could buy clothes that you could wear personal clothes and stuff. But you, we had catalogs where you could almost like buy, buy certain like designer type stuff. Wow. And he bought a workout outfit for him. And he had a guy he worked with named, they called Bronze, who was mixed race. But if you ever saw the Doc Savage character, the man of bronze, he, this guy looked bronze and they called him bronze. And he bought them workout outfits that had these little tiny strings that came down the front, went down to a diamond patch here, oh, came, came, up, came up over the back and then strapped around. <laughs> oh. And then they had these little lightweight, like jogging shorts that went over them, right? So <clears throat> they're out there working on the weight pile together. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming around with Ted. We've just done our workout over here. We come around and there is a uh, Robbie doing these, which are commonly referred to as Adolphs. <laughs> and Ted stops and goes, my, 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 what's the world come to when a guy starts doing Adolf Hitler salutes? <laughs> <laughs> so Robbie drops the weights and he's shaking. He's so mad. He's shaking. Bronze steps up and bronze is pretty cut up and stuff like that. And he, t he tells Ted, you better shut up. You fucking Russian. Yeah. And he goes, no, no, I'm Romanian. And he goes, oh, so you're a pig. I've never seen anybody get hit so fast in a blink of an eye. He'd hit him and put his hand back down his side. The guard in the tower couldn't even catch him on the camera doing it. It was so quick. It was right angle where he just pow, just chin checked him as hard as he could. Bronze falls back, hits his head on the, on some weights and stuff. And Robbie's like, you assaulted me. You're telling the guard at the tower. He's hit him. He's hit him. And the guard goes, wait a minute. He tells everybody stop. He goes, and he looks at his camera. He cannot see from the angle. He can't see this chin sh shot, right? And we're all standing there. Guard says, I don't know what's going on down there, but you guys quit doing it or you're going to have to go back and get off the playground and that type of thing, right? So he goes, walk it off. You know, we go walk it around. So later, this other guy is big bruiser type guy who was a gay boy, but masculine type gay boy type thing, comes up and says, you know, we don't want any of your homophobic, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Ted goes, homophobic? He goes, I just don't fucking like. Guys, <laughs> also <laughs> right. Yeah. He goes, hell, I don't care what he does. I just don't like. You know, and he's like, oh crap, you know. You know, and <clears throat> so they we have this little standoff, and then the guy's like, well, I just want you to leave them alone. So look, we don't really care what you guys do. Stay out of our way. We're all. So we go over there. So the next day, <laughs> Ted goes, let's superset them. Fuck. So we were doing pull downs and slapping as much weight on as we can. You know, I mean, we're pushing it <clears throat> and we're doing it just to irritate them because they're they're where they work out. They can see us. Yeah. You know, we just did it to irritate them and shit like that. But, uh, Robbie, um, uh, actually his dad came around, got him some really good lawyers and stuff. He eventually, he ended up doing 21 years on 17 to life. And, uh, because the thing was, he kept being listed as a model inmate. The problem was all the model inmates kept getting shipped out of CMC and he wasn't getting shipped out. Yeah. And so, you know, he ended up, I mean, because Tex Watson was a model inmate. He got shipped out with me. <laughs> yeah, he suddenly wants to be a model. Tex Watson is he one of the murderers for Charles Manson. He's one of the Manson, Manson family. family. Yeah, because I was there. I, was, I, I, I met Charles Manson at Vacaville. And then at CMC, I was with... 
uh, Charles Tex Watson, Bobby Boussoulet, and Bruce Davis, all three were also Manson family members. Wow. And they had, uh, Tex had uh, conjugal visits and had his own family. He, he got a family and he got, he, he got um, uh, his church-based thing where he was getting tax-free. He got, and his, they bought a house that was church property and all that kind of shit like that. Yeah. What was Charlie Boy like? <clears throat> Pardon? What was Charlie like? Which one? Manson. Manson. Manson? Charlie Manson was a, he was a little squirrel. He was a little nut. Uh, when I first met him, he was working in the uh, Catholic chapel at, at Vacaville. And a guy pulled me up and said, hey, you want to meet Charlie Manson? And I went, no, eh, I don't really. It doesn't, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a celebrity hound. So he goes, come here. He takes me into the chapel. And we look in the garden. He goes, there he is right there. And the guy stands up and he's like five foot two, five foot three. It's a little short shit, right? And because the Manson stuff happened when I was still a teenager, in my mind, because of every time they talked about it, and they talked about having to have all these go- cops around and stuff, I just always thought he was a much bigger man. I just, you know, but evidently I was thinking like Tex Watson, who was much taller and stuff. But anyway, it just never clicked. So I'm like, well, that's not. But he used to, he used to p- paint on rocks and sign them and stand by a canteen trying to get you to buy them. You know, and guys bought them because, well, it's Charles Manson. But when I worked in the hospital, and what he, he he'd come over. And uh, he would try to hustle the guys who were in the hospital to get needles or get any kind of pills and stuff like that. Because Vacaville was a medical facility and we had psych drugs and, and other kind of stuff. And um, he came to me and uh, with that, uh, hey, brother, you know. And I told him, we're not brothers. You know, we're not cousins. I don't care. And he goes, don't you know who I am? I said, yeah, and I don't really care. I'm Charles fucking, G- you know, man said, I'm more than Jesus Christ ever was. And he starts getting on. I told him, you know, go away. What? I said, go away. And he starts doing, I said, give me all that crazy eye you want. I don't care. And and to be honest with you, <laughs> my opinion, and this is my opinion, my opinion only. He'd always been a petty little thief. He'd been sexually abused when he was a child in, in youth facilities and jails and stuff. The only thing that he did was that he made the good figurehead for the family. Tex Watson, I'll tell by dying breath, I'll believe that he was actually the real, you know, evil behind all that. When he took the girls there and said, Charlie said to do this, I'm sorry, his name's Charlie too. He, the girl, he didn't say Charlie Manson said, he said, Charlie said to do this. Yeah. Um, he's the one that recruited the girls because he was, good looking and he was you know intelligent and all stuff charlie was just fun to be around because he played music and he did dope and you know and he had these hallucinogenic things and had these ideas that he was going to one day be king of the world or whatever you know and that's everything um the only one out of the four guys i knew that i thought was redeemable was bruce davis do you reckon he's brainwashed pardon do you reckon he was brainwashed who Bruce. No, 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 no. Bruce was a part of the family thing, but Bruce wasn't a part of the killing of the of the Tate and Labanca. So he wasn't a part of that. No. He killed Shorty O'Shea, who and was involved in another killing. Totally separate. He would not have still be in prison if he hadn't have been connected to the Manson family. If he would just done these other killings, he'd have been out. But because he was a part of that, you know. And then the thing with Bobby Boussole, Bobby Boussole was in jail already for something else when the Manson shit happened. And he was not, he was going to be getting out. And all of a sudden he started, yeah, I'm part of the Manson family. And then they got him for being a part of the Manson family. And then he got, but Bobby Boussoulet so badly wanted to be a part of something else. He got involved in all the white supremacist shit and everything like that. You know, so he, he kind of screws himself on things like that. But Bruce Davis, honestly, I believe that he truly regretted everything. I believe that he truly uh, rehabilitated himself. I watched him do lots and lots and lots of good for people, never thinking to get anything back. And uh, quite honestly, like I said, if anybody was out of that whole bunch was really somebody who should be able to be get out, it would have been Bruce. And I think if Bruce had got out, I think quite honestly, the world would have been much better because like I said, the man, I sat and talked to him for hours, you know, and, and, and you know, and he just, uh, he was a very, 
strong-minded man who at, he admitted that at times when he was younger didn't know how strong he, he could be. He always thought he had to have other people's approval and that's what got him in trouble. But when he realized that it didn't matter if he had people's approval, as long as he could, as he said, when I can get up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror, I know I'm okay. And that was how he looked at things. Yeah. Did, did the Aryan Brotherhood punk out um, Manson and have him bring it, women bringing the drugs in? <clears throat> well, what happened was Manson had so much money coming in that Manson bought TVs for him, bought things for him, you know, and, and but he did that in part that they would give him, you know, protection and stuff along the line. But see, that's he's not like the only one. Um, you know, uh, you you know uh, Cameron Hooker and Carrie Stainer? Vaguely. I mean, okay. Explain. okay, well, Cam, uh, Cameron Hooker was the guy who had the girl in the box. Ooh. You know, and he was at Folsom with me. And he I knew him when I was at Folsom, you know. And the thing was, he had been protected by the AB because they all thought it was really great to have sex slaves. You know, that's what every guy, all the guys want a sex slave, you know, come on. You know, and having a girl in a box under the bed for any time you want her. And when you take her down below in the torch chamber and put a box on her head, chain her up, you know, beat her, do whatever you want. You know, it's cool. It's like, you know, and when you have your wife helping you, that's what even makes it better, you know, because it's like, you know, it's a, it's a family affair. And, uh, but Cameron Hooker, play. huh? Bit of foreplay. Yeah. Well, Cameron Hooker had, had convinced the, uh, the gal that, you know, he actually belonged to the company, you know, the organization that had worldwide where they would trade women. And if you didn't, you know, and they all this, and he did all this stuff and he had her for like seven years and he had her so brainwashed that there was times when he actually let her go visit her family and she came back because she was afraid that something would happen to her family if she didn't and all this stuff. Eventually his wife got jealous about what was going on, thinking he was falling in love with her and stuff, and then helped her escape and stuff. And I mean, there's been a number of movies that I, I actually had a couple of reporter people for film stuff contact me about Cameron Hooker. But um, what ended up happening when uh, when he was he, he was at Folsom, and um, this is many years later after when I was back at Folsom the second time, he was still there, right? And but by then the, the AB. If you were anybody in the AB, you were locked up in Pelican Bay to slam shoe. You know, as soon as they got the idea you were a part of that, they, they were slam. But you had the skinheads coming out at this time and the Nazi lowriders and <clears throat> these other little groups. And he was there. Well, we had a walkway that you came down and go around to go down to the library. And up here was Native American spiritual grounds and the religious grounds I had and stuff. But you go down to the uh, library and it's a blind zone. No cops can see you at all. And as they were going down, there was a kid down there. And apparently the rumor was afterwards that he actually was related in some way to the, the victim. And uh, he wasn't born when all this happened. He basically found out about after he was born years later and grew up. And then when he finally went to prison, he got in the position where he could get to the guy. <clears throat> and he just basically, you know, stomped the dog snot out of, Cameron, Cameron into being having to be sent to a, a special yard over in Corcoran and you know stuff like that. Now, <clears throat> funny enough, funny enough, uh, he was found suitable for parole. Uh, he wasn't supposed to be for a number of years, but laws changed and stuff. But then they held a hearing for him and got him up as a SVP, you know, a sexual violent predator. And he's now in the hospital and now he has to stay in the hospital until the doctors say he's no longer, uh, uh, you know, a threat, which could be, who knows? Never. Could be. One of the scariest, most famous killers that Jamie ever came across was Edmund Kemper. You familiar, with, are you familiar with Kemper? Oh my God. <laughs> he's been a subject of so many serial yeah. killer shows, uh, Mind, Mind Hunter and all that stuff. I'm Hunter, yeah. Episode one? Yeah. I've watched that. I can't remember it. Yeah, but, but yeah, but he... Uh, he but the thing Just is, describe what Kemper looked like to, to well, Jen. <clears throat> well, chalk by memory. <clears throat> he's about 300 pounds. He's like about six foot nine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when I met him, I met him the, the very first day I was in prison when I was at Vacaville. And I got called down after chow to go to my first 
quote orientation the thing and there was a couple blue shirt guys wandering around that were just regular inmates because we're all wearing this really weird fluorescent green clothes and uh they're handing out paperwork and stuff and they give us a little bit of this thing and all of a sudden this this man just walks in the room and they moved away and got to the walls I don't think Jen knows what he did. What did he do? Well, he did quite a few murders. <clears throat> he killed his grandparents when he was uh, a teenager. They put him in. They put him in a mental hospital for it. After I don't think it was only about four or five years, the doctor said he was ready to go. He said, "No, no, no, no! Don't let me out. I don't. I, I, I don't feel good about getting out." And they went, "Oh, you're just having late pubescence uh, issues and stuff. It'll be all right." Got out, killed some coeds. You know. Uh, drove around with one on his seat of his car, eventually killed his mom, who was kind of the behind all the stuff. Now it got taken in. You know, he was he, never a problem when he got arrested. He was very high intelligence, wasn't very, he? And he used to hang out yeah. at the police bar yeah. and like talk to the cops about stuff. And in the end, he felt compelled to just give himself yeah. up because he, he would never have been caught because he was so intelligent. Yeah. But the gruesome things he did to the women, oh, oh yeah. we probably... You know, say on skinned YouTube. them and you know boiled them meat and you heads know, cut off everything. You know, all yeah. that you know there's there's even been talk that he possibly uh did a little bit of cannibalism things and stuff I was like say that Hannibal Lecter, yeah. <clears throat> kind of, well can't, not quite like that bad but yeah I'll, but when we had but there was one time there was a three i knew three can i knew two cannibals in prison you know and um uh, you know we had we had a guy named heater who was known as the santa claus killer because he would, he looked like Santa Claus, and he killed children. He was busted with children's fingers in his pockets Ooh. that he would snack on and and stuff Ooh. like that. Snack on, yeah, he ate them. Yeah. Fingers, yeah, yeah, like oh carrot God. sticks or something. You know, and I had a guy named Buddha, big black guy, sit at, there at, uh, at Vacaville, and he would come through the line, and he would hold his pants up, and he'd have a belt in his hand here, but he'd hold his pants up. He would put his tray. You come through, and you're supposed to get an issue. And you're supposed to move on. And he'd stand there until you gave him what he wanted. <clears throat> he'd filed his teeth to be like shark's teeth. And this one cop one time was new and didn't know and said, move on, and reached over to take an extra something off his tray. And he bit into the guy and took a big chunk of meat out of him and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. Was it you or John Abbott that told us the story of Kemper at the weight pile? No, I didn't tell you Kemper at the weight pile. Mine was when he was John Abbott then. Yeah, mine was when he when he came in and he stood at the podium, and he looks out at us in in a very monotone. He goes, "Every man must have a moral compass. You must not deviate from your moral compass." And I kept thinking that I'd have to kill this motherfucker if he ever came at me because he's just so big you can't John fight. John just man. described his hands. <clears throat> oh yeah, like shovels bigger than the, the yeah. <laughs> Wow. And they, like said that? That, they said that the AB wanted to see how strong he was one day and they took him to the weight pile and they put the max on it and he just went like it was nothing. Mm. Yeah. But he, but the interesting thing is he started reading books on tape for the blind. And so I always wondered, if you're blind, then this is the voice you're hearing in your head. You know? You know? And then he all, but the one good thing I can say that he did put, was involved in was starting the hospice program there at Vacaville for the inmates with AIDS. <clears throat> the staff wouldn't, would go in there fully garbed and they'd only do what they had to and get away. And he actually got in there and sat down with Reed to him and he, would, and he actually got that program started. So, you know, does that mean there's some good in him? I don't know. You know. Is he still alive, Kemper? I believe so. Bloody hell. I believe so. Wow, I wonder what he thinks of all his newfound fame with the internet and everything. Good grief. Mm. Yeah. All right, so Jamie, we've, we've finished think, the 10. Yeah. Do you want to just tell the audience then how your life has been for, for a bit before we finish since we last did our po free podcasts? Well, outside, outside of the COVID, <laughs> I think that, <laughs> that, was, that was... Which was kind of funny because the thing was, I remember when everybody was saying, oh, we're going on lockdown, we're going on lockdown. And I'm thinking, you know, I've got a garden. And I've got, you know, this. I, I've got to go out and get food for where I was staying. I've got this house I'm living in. I'm thinking, yeah, this isn't really lockdown. It's, you know, four by eight foot cell, <laughs> door slammed, sl tray slid under your door. That's lockdown. <laughs> this is not really a lockdown thing. <laughs> uh, but it's been pretty good. Uh, like I said, um, I've been able to go back to the Isle of Man now a total of four times. I'm going back. 
uh, the first week of June for the TT for the first time to be able to actually experience it. But like I said, um, are you still planning on living there, moving there? I, that I don't think will ever be a possibility. There's a number of reasons why. Um, one of the first things is finances. You know, <clears throat> I doubt that I'll ever be financially stable to where I could buy a house there. And pretty much, I wouldn't want to live there under somebody else's house type thing because, you know, it's like in Britain, they always say every man's house is his castle. Well, you don't want to be able to be tossed out of your castle by the landlord. You know, it's a, something about him sticking the dragon on you. You don't want that, you know. So I, I would like a place on my own if I could. But um, I don't see that happening. But the thing is, I'm 68 years old now, you know. Um, so getting a mortgage would never be a possibility. And, you know, so I'd have to become... Got to ulti- sell enough books. Well, that or win the lottery, you know, or something along that line. Uh, find find lost gold or something. Um, just not tell them I found it. You know, just <laughs> melt it down into smaller things. <laughs> but when we were there with you, it was like it was your homecoming. Yeah. The way the locals, oh, when yeah. they heard, when you told your stories and oh, you yeah. told them about the origin of it and the Isle of Man. Oh, they've all been like that. They, they were so receptive to you and the light in your eyes. It was like you 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 found your you know your place. Well, in, yeah, in, and like I said, but, but but my when I got my I got my birth registered here. Uh, this last uh, uh, February, on my birthday, on my 68th birthday, I got my birth registered, which is basically an unheard of thing because that's the latest birth ever registered in the UK. And they did the full page article for the Manx Independent. But to get a birth certificate, don't they have to have someone who was there present at your birth? Well, I had enough documentation to verify that who my parents were. I had, you know... Uh, how I got sent away. I had documentation from the man, Dr. Wetmore, who bought me, who had, had, had done a lot of his own research. I had the federal government, U.S. federal government that had ver- done their verification. They had spoken to my aunt, my, my dad's sister, and she's verified, yes, I was his son, but they'd sent me away and they didn't want me, they didn't want to have anything to do with me. So I had enough verification stuff. The problem was whether the law would support my birth being registered that late because in all actuality the um the way the law read was that they had to have register your birth within 45 days if not uh they had up to a year but they could be fined you know and um but they had nothing if it went beyond a year so this was a big thing so i was actually forced to file a writ with the the high court and <clears throat> my writ happened to fall on the first deemsters uh, desk who is the highest judge on the Isle of Man for the high court and he read through it he looked at all my evidence he believed I had a right to have my birth registered and uh, he basically pointed the registry office to the right section which was like two lines in a huge huge document from 1984 and they uh, they granted it and then they called me up and it was they really funny because they called me up only like the Thursday before my birthday was going to be like my birthday was like a Monday. They called me up on, on the Thursday and said, we'd like to issue your birth certificate. Could you be here for your birthday? We'd like to do it on your birthday. So I had to quickly make it, get airplane tickets, get a hotel, you know, figure out how to get to the airport in Manchester, <clears throat> all this stuff. I'm not, I'm and all had to do on the computer, you know, and I had my, get my, my vaccine vaccination papers Man, make sure my pat had, you know, had all my paperwork ready and all this stuff, and did it. Flew in on flew in on the Sunday, and went down the first thing in the morning. And they were all waiting there, and I got it all filmed. That and that hopefully it'll come out as a video as well. But uh, you know, and it was, yeah, it was quite emotional. And like I said, I did one my my first trip over. I did a, a video of that, and you can see the emotion in my eyes just seeing the land and stuff for the first time since I, uh, you know, I left. And, um, but every time I go back to the aisle, I feel more connected and I go different places and there are places I likely never went to before, but they feel familiar, you know, and I've made some, I've got some good friends I've made over there. And that's part of how I'm going over is that, uh, a real good friend of mine has made arrangements for me to have, uh, free accommodations for us when we go over and, um, you know, I'm going to, 
you know, do that. I'm planning to swim in the sea for the first time since I've been back to the UK and even kayak. And uh, yeah, no, but life's been good. Um, like I said, my first book has sold very well. And it came out in paperback, audiobook, and ebook. And then this one's just come out. And this is now in uh, ebook and paperback. And hopefully it'll go an audiobook as well. And um, I've got two more manuscripts right now that I'm working on. You know, uh, but, you know, like I said, you know, I, I've had probably, oh, probably close to 2,700 people contact me who've been reading my book. And, you know, they've gotten me through Messenger, Facebook, um, my website and stuff. And uh, I appreciate them all. That's why every I answer every one of them. I make sure I get a personal message to them telling me I appreciate that. Thank you for contacting me. Some of them have, have sent me numerous messages and some of them have turned have become friends and I've met them. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been all good, but like I said, you know, I'm 68 and still going strong, still get up from vertical in the morning. And that's the way I count for things. So all of Jamie's links will be in the description box below this video. If you do want to reach out to him on Facebook or get his book. And to the people who started the conspiracy theory that Jamie was born in Arizona Take that. Go and wipe your ass on that. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> and, um, yeah, good grief. This has been a masterclass in storytelling. If you are thinking of coming on the podcast, take some notes from Jamie's ability because when we ask a question, we like a good long story that lasts at least 30 minutes and so we can just sit here and not say anything and be completely lazy yeah, on it's our, not on it's our been easy. Behalf. thank you <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. so please support go down and support Jamie and what he's doing and uh, all, like I said all the links will be down there all of Jen's links are down there as well and this has been a great day to start out our 17 day tour 4 hour podcast with Jamie Morgan Kane. take that <laughs> <laughs> give us a hug brother thank you yeah yes I know Oh, fantastic, man, as usual. It's always yeah. a great pleasure. Yeah, yeah brilliant, brilliant. We are on the Isle of Man. It's my first ever visit. We're going to be speaking at the prison. I'm doing the first talk in the morning and Jamie Morgan Kane is doing the talk in the afternoon. The Isle of Man prison is small, approximately 100 prisoners, but because the island is its own community it has a, the whole range of prisoners in one prison in one tiny prison from the highest security levels murderers down to lower level offenders the countryside is absolutely stunning and it's situated with all these rolling hills and mountains over there and if you escape, heaven help you, you're not going to get far. Unless you've got like a getaway speedboat. Foster May, Melchistow Mercada. My name is Jamie Morgan Kane, and I was born on this island 65 and a half years ago. But I left this island when I was six months old. Those of you who are from here will probably know places like the Falcon Cliff Hotel, the old House Drake Hotel. Those were owned by my grandparents. So at six months old, I got sent away from here and I got sent to Canada. I was taken away from here by a woman who worked for my grandmother who actually was part of the Boswell Irish traveler families that used to camp up on top of Douglas Head. Um, 
First, I was taken to Canada to an orphanage there. Turned out that that orphanage had a problem with about selling children to Canadian farmers to be indentured servants or putting children that were perfectly normal into mental hospitals to get paid by either the American government or the Canadian government. So the woman decided she didn't want me to have that for my future. So what ended up happening was she then stole me out of the orphanage, took me into America, and because she knew who my birth mother was, because she had worked with her, she took over using my mother's ID, and she raised me as her own child. And she raised me as her own child till I was 14, at which point in time she became real, real ill, and she'd worked as a domestic for well-to-do families. And a well-to-do family she worked for had a chi some children they adopted, and the boy mysteriously needed to go away. So the boy went away, they purchased me, and gave me that child's identity, and then told me I was adopted. Then we moved from Arizona to California. The man was a college professor who was friends with Richard Nixon, the President of the United States, and most of the Watergate plumbers. And he had originally been an Air Force officer who then went to Brazil with the State Department and worked with the beginning of the OSS, which later became the CIA. So I grew up for high school. At 14 years old, I had this new identity that I was under. And I went to high school under it, and I went in the military. And I served as a Navy corpsman in Vietnam as a, with the Marines. I get out of the service, and I have a, a bad marriage. I have a son. My wife leaves me, leaves my son with me, takes off, tells me she doesn't want to be a mother or wife. Here, here you go. But the man comes to me, who had been the guy, my adopted dad, as they say, and said, I want your son. You sign him over. I'll make sure that nobody takes him. And I'll raise him the way you should have been let me raise you. Of course, we didn't have a great relationship. I didn't let him do it. Uh, I end up getting from him. He gets mad. He throws me a bunch of documents. And one of the documents was my baptism certificate from Onken, St. Anthony's. Now, I had known from the woman who raised me, she used to tell me when I was a little boy that I was from the place called the Isle of Man. And what I knew about the Isle of Man at that time was this was a magical place that would disappear on the sea and people couldn't find it. Or that we had these fairies and we had the Fenidori and the Modi Du and we had all these magical and mystical stuff here. Which for a small child, that's pretty cool if you know you're from there because then you always think you've got some kind of magical powers and you know, something that's going to come forth from there. Um, but because I didn't have anything tangible until I got my baptism certificate, I didn't know. At the time I got my baptism certificate, I started discussing the fact that, one, I took back my birth name and dumped the name I'd been given. That caused concern to this man. Then when he realized I was thinking about trying to come back to the aisle, I was going to go for a passport, and he knew there'd be an investigation, and they'd want to know where the hell I came from, how the hell he got me, and everything would fall apart on him. So, anyway, the situation came down that my wife got stitched up behind a murder and was facing two counts of death penalty. And they were trying to put my wife on death row and I was being sitting, sitting to the side as an accessory. I was then offered an opportunity to save my life after her first trial only was hung up because one man had a problem with a woman being killed. He didn't have a problem if they were going to put my wife in prison for the rest of her life. But if you kill a woman, he just had a problem with that. So in the state of California, they, they have this ability to come to a person and say, we know you didn't do this crime. We know who did this crime. But they're nobody. You're somebody. I was ex-military. I was a bike mechanic, rode with a motorcycle club. And unfortunately, what I didn't know was the man who had, who had me, the district attorney of my county had been his teacher assistant at the university. The two judges in the case had been students for him. And he had a lot of powerful friends in politics. And he had told them, basically, if anybody knows he's from over here, a lot of people are going to get, get caught up in this. So they told me, here's the deal. If you will take responsibility for your, being the head of the household, for your wife, we will return your child, which they had taken away, 
we will let her go, we'll let you do 13 years, and you'll be out in time to see your son graduate high school. You're an ex-Marine, you're a biker, are you really a man, or are you willing to let your wife die? Are you going to be willing to let your son know that you could have saved his mother's life, and you chose to let her die? What are you going to do? Oh, you've got 90 seconds, I'm walking out of here, make a decision. You've got 10 seconds, I walk out of here. And my attorney said, best deal you're ever going to get. So whether you think it was a good deal or a bad deal, at that time I took the deal. I had guys later tell me that it was terminal stupidity and as far as they were concerned, they could always get another woman. Okay. At that point in time, I still thought my wife, my son, child, trying to do this. So. so I took the deal. I got sentenced 13 years. And within four years of my going to prison, they changed the laws twice. And they increased my time. And they took away all my good time. So I ended up doing a total of 34 years. And I served time initially in Folsom, San Quentin, dual vocational institution, which was known as Gladiator School. And I did nine prisons, but I, had, I was in two of them twice, so I was 11 times in different prisons. Uh, I served time with people like Charles Manson, Ed Kemper, Herbie Mullins, Bobby Boussoulet, Bruce Davis, the Chowchilla kidnappers. And I was closer to them in talking stuff than I am to you guys right now. I was right up front. So for my situation, I went into prison, and the first question they ask in California prisons, what are you? I told them I'm Manx. Matter of fact, it says that on my back arm. It says Manx bread. Of course, everybody goes, well, what, what's Manx? So I tell them I'm from the Isle of Man. Well, you're a liar. There's no such place. Yeah, there is. So I pull out books and maps and show them. And they go, oh, it just got named that in the last couple of years. It's an Outer Hebride Island. I tell them, no, it's not. Oh, it's a Channel Island. No, it's not. So I try to explain it to them, and people didn't, couldn't understand. So, so then they put me down as other. Because in the prison system at that time, you could have whites, blacks, Hispanics, others. And others covered everybody from Native Americans to, to uh, Central Americans, South Americans, Pacific Islanders, you know, the Asian, all the, all the other things that was not white, black, or Hispanic. So I went through a number of years as an other. Of course, now that made it problems where guys who were white had a problem with the fact that I wouldn't be white. But at the same time, they weren't Manx. They weren't Celtic. They weren't from over here. And the thing you'll find out in American prisons, they love it if you're Irish. They love it if you're Scottish. They'll even accept you if you're Welsh. But if you're British of any kind, they don't want, they don't want nothing to do with you because you're a dog, basically. And if you don't know what a Manxman is, or a Jerseyman, or a Guernseyman, or anything else like that, again, you're, you're falling out of favor. So it did cause me some issues where I did have to stand up toe to toe with people. Now I know you're looking at me, I'm follically challenged, a little bit out of shape, a little bit shorter than I used to be, but at the time I was pretty much in my prime from all my military time and my working out, and my riding bikes and stuff like that. And because the guys that I dealt with didn't know anything about me, but that I was 30 years old, but I went into prison with tattoos so everybody assumed I had done time before. Not a tattoo on me came out of a prison. I had them all before I went in. And um, so the thing was, I had to get into some fights. Most of the fights were done in what we called the smoker's ring, which was a boxing ring that was on the yard. And the idea is you go in there and you do what you can and you try to hold your mud. Was Marine Kerm, hold your mud was meant the same thing as stand your ground. Yeah. So. I did relatively well at doing just that. And that caused people to be more concerned because I proved I didn't need to be a part of this big group of people. But then I didn't do drugs or didn't smoke or didn't gamble, you know, didn't drink the pruno, you know, or any of the stuff like that. I just wanted to get in and get out. I wanted to get my 13 years over with and go home. This is before I knew they were gonna bump it all up four or five years down the road. So this is the, the scenario that got me there. Um, I uh, 
kept telling people, when people asked me what I was, I'd tell them I'm an islander. Problem is in the California prison system, the only people who are allowed to be islanders are Pacific Islanders. Hawaiians, Samoans, even the Maori, uh, things like that. Otherwise, you're not. So as I was talking to some of the people earlier, they thought I should share a couple of, in, a couple of excerpts from my book that was done about my, coming, my trying to get people to come to terms with me being an Islander. And I happened to be, it was just a few years after I was in prison, and I was at dual vocational institution, which like I was explaining, was uh, referred to as gladiator school. And um, we, had a, we had weight piles around the yard. And of course, each weight pile, only that particular race could pl- do it, except for the 300 pound club. If you could bench 300 pounds or more, you got to use Olympic weights, you had a special yard, they had an actual drinking fountain right there you could do. You know, you got different things like that. You actually were given a free pair of weightlifting gloves. So, I struck up an acquaintance, uh, struck up with an acquaintance with a one black guy who was a bit of a loner. And we'd often spot for each other when we were lifting weights. He could lift more than 300 pounds, and with his encouragement, I got up to 275 pounds without much problem. One day he told me that I should try to get accepted in the 300 pound club which was a very exclusive set of weights on the yard. Anyone was allowed to try for membership. So after a week or so, I, I was finally able to bench 310 pounds five times in a row. For membership in the 300 pound club, you had to be able to bench it 10 times in a row. I wasn't sure if I could completely do it, but I asked for a try. My request was accepted and I was given a date for my trial in front of all the other members. The group of men all looked quite impressive. Their chests ranged from 54 inches to well over 60 inches and some had biceps between 22 and 26 inches in circumference. The guy who held the record for lifting the most weight was my spotter, and he lifted more than 600 pounds. When I sat down on the bench, the coach asked me what I was. I responded, I'm an Islander. He marked it down on the paper, told me to give give my signal when I was ready, at which point my spotter would allow me to start my routine. I could see the men around me looking unsure about my chances, which only added to my determination. Finally announced to the coach I was ready, the guy who spotted for me, Iron Mike, lifted 300 pound bar off the rack and placed it in my outstretched hands. With what seemed like the whole world watching, I started pounding out reps. And I could hear the group counting them out. And by the time I'd done my eighth rep, my arms and my shoulders were burning. Though I realized I could make it to 10, something inside me drove me until I hit my 15th rep. Only then did I allow Iron Mike to take the bar from me. And though most of the guys congratulated, most welcomed me in the club, I noticed a few guys give me angry looks as the coach presented me with my new card. About a week later, these guys approached me while I was working out in the gym, and it turned out that Pineapple, the leader of the Islander's car, was also the leader of their group. Pineapple explained to me he was half Samoan and half Maori, and that no way was I an Islander. To anyone viewing this altercation, the differences between us were very obvious. I'm five foot six, 175 pounds, with a 50 inch chest, 18 inch biceps. He, on the other hand, was 5'10", 265 pounds, 60-inch chest, and 24-inch biceps. I knew if this became physical, I'd have to get to him before he got to me. And I tried to explain them from where I was from, and I indeed was an islander, at which point he made derogatory comments about the British Isles and said if I ever called myself an islander again, he'd smash me. So I wasn't going to listen to anybody diss my heritage, so when he was turning I called to him and I slammed my left fist into his right side of his jaw. To my surprise, though I heard bones snapping, I'd only knocked him back about two feet. He then grabbed me by my shirt, lifted me above the head, his head, slammed me to the ground before repeating the same action four more times. I found myself lying on the mat, feeling bruised and battered with a terrible throbbing in my left hand. Looking up, I saw him rubbing his face and muttering something about a broken jaw. I somehow dragged myself up to face him again, and though my legs were wobbly with every ounce of energy hot, I mustered, I punched him with my right hand, which he wasn't expecting, and it brought extreme pain to my right hand as well. I heard more bones crunching. He staggered back about a foot before grabbing me by my chest, lifting me off the ground, throwing me about four feet into a brick wall. I bounced off the wall, landed in my face, which he picked me up and threw me down about another dozen times. The two guys with him were patting him on the back. I hollered out, I'm not done with you. Pineapple just turned to me and said, well, I'm done with you, and he walked away. The black guy I worked out with came over and sat 
helped me sit up. He gave me some water and told me that was the stupidest thing he'd ever seen. And if, I, if he'd known I was going to do that, he'd have gotten tickets sold for it. I headed off to the medical clinic as it was almost time for work, and I was desperate to have a shower. Noticing my hands were swollen, I told the nurse I'd banged them on dumbbells while working out. So I was sent to x-ray, and just as I was walking in, pineapple was coming out. She told the inmate x-ray tech to x-ray my hands, said I'd had a weight pile injury, to which he responded, that's the second one today. Then I went back into the clinic, pineapple was sitting two tables away, turned out I'd broken his jaw in three places and he'd lost a tooth. I'd fractured my left hand and a few knuckles on my right. I ended up in a cast with my left hand while Pineapple had to go outside hospital, have his jaw wired. I snuck him a gallon of ice cream from the kitchen ward when I saw him later that day, and in response, he gave me a thumbs up after calling, saying, fuck you, island man. Um, it was about a month later, a couple of the guys in the island car told me Pineapple wanted to see me. Turned out it was his birthday, and though he couldn't eat a lot of solid foods, it was traditional among the car do something similar to a luau, which is a feast. Join us, he said. I can't speak for every islander in the prison systems, but here are the ones at DVI, dual vocational institution, will let you sit, call yourself an islander. You're not very smart, you're not that tough, and you certainly aren't strong enough, but at least you have the determination of what an islander is known for. So this, this is what I got for it. They had to replace the lunate bone in my wrist. Broke these knuckles. This, when I got back this last year, I had to have the surgery here because my hand had become totally numb from the nerve, getting too much scar tissue built up. So I had to do that. These are the knuckles I fractured on this hand. So I took that as a great honor with the fact that at least they noted that my spirit was right, even if the, the rest of me wasn't quite up to what they considered to be proper islander. But the thing was, like I said, people didn't believe the British Islands. They think the British Islands, believe it or not, some people think it's still attached to the European continent. You know, a land bridge or underwater tunnel because you know, we've got the channel that makes us attached. Whatever you do, however they want to look at it. So we have that kind of a situation going on. Now, but because of that, people heard that story. And they're like, wow, you, you stood up to pineapple. You know, and pineapple, like I said, was, was this really... Because the, the Islander cars were small in the prison system, probably in the whole system, there was probably maybe only at that time 150 people, all Islanders knew pineapple. So they gave me a certain amount of call there. But a good number of years later, I'm at a different prison, and a similar type of situation arises. So I'll share this part here with you. I don't know if they got, you guys have privilege cards in here, but in the prisons where I was, you used to get a privilege card. And that privilege card meant you got to go have an extra visit, extra phone calls, some extra, you could make, draw more canteen, things like that. So privilege cards were real good. Problem was, is the counselors were supposed to give them out to you. Problem was, counselors didn't want to do that. So as I was a clerk at the time, I got the, the, the problem and the, and the power to hand these out. But the problem was I was always have to hand them out when somebody came with the ducat showing they've been approved for it. So guys used to come up all the time trying to buy them from me, but I knew if I sold them and it got found out, I go to ad seg, I lose all my stuff. So basically it was easier to say no to everybody than play favorites. So anyway, the Islanders, some of them, because they knew I was calling myself an Islander, decided to come up. So the hardest no came one day when I was approached by a group of Pacific Islanders, mostly from Tonga. They figured if I was claiming Islander, I kind of owed it to them to, to just give up their cards to a homie. When I told the messenger what was going to happen, he told me to meet a group in the back of the gym to discuss it. Of course, the gym is, had the showers, and that's basically where all discussions were kept because there were no cameras. Um, I'd be lying to say if, if I wasn't concerned is all the guys there were in their mid-20s, and each one was taller and wider than I was. And I definitely knew that this time I was going to be hurt really bad. But when 2.30 came and I was getting off work, I headed to the gym. Believing my only choice would be get off fast and first and try to take down as many as I could before I was overwhelmed. Again, I'm not the smartest person in the room, okay? I'll grant you that. Um, so the gym was between building from yards uh, three and four, and it's where the inmates could use and had a hobby shop. 
I entered the gym door from your foreyard. I was met by a youngster who led me to the back shower alcove, the best fighting ground. Taking a deep breath, I stepped in, knowing this could be my last. Waiting for me were 15 guys, all under the age of 30. Setting my feet, clenching my fists, positioning my shoulders, giving myself the best fighting position I could bring to bear. I was ready for this shit to hit the fan. Then from behind me, I heard a booming voice, followed by laughter. Hey, Manx boy, didn't you learn anything last time, how hard an islander's jaw is? Quick glance at my shoulder, I saw Pineapple standing there. He came over, put his arm around me. This is the guy who broke my jaw in two places, he said to the group of islanders. You can take my word, he's a true islander. Or don't take my word, and you fight us both. One of the younger guys who was trying to be a leader put his hand out. Sorry, bro, we didn't know who you were. It's all good now. So, the fighting I had to do in the very first number of years bought me a reputation that carried me most of the time I was in prison, which allowed me to be able to stand up to bullies that were trying to pressure young men into getting involved in the wrong things. Not because I was stronger, not because I was tougher, but most of the guys knew that I would always stand my ground, hold my mud, and do what I thought was right for whatever the purpose was. Um, that same reputation bought me a certain amount of respect from staff, the ones I worked for, the ones that worked my housing unit, because they knew that if I gave you my word, my word is going to be, always be good. Um, so... I got asked a lot of times by people, well, how do you do your time? How do you hold on? And I told them real simple. The motto of the Isle of Man, as I understood it, was where you fall, you stand. And to me, I felt that I represented everybody on the Isle of Man. This is my country. It's where I was conceived and born. And for me to fail in standing up for what I thought was right was disrespectful to everybody on this island. And I didn't want anybody, even though I hadn't been brought up here, even though most people never knew I existed, I felt I owed something to the people of this island and the heritage of my ancestors and the contacts I had here. And the spirit of this island is what I carried with me. It's one of the reasons that I drew this, and I used to have this hanging up in my cell. And the guards used to think it was really obscene because they weren't sure what it meant, but they sure just meant something terrible, you know but I had to keep calm and carry on around him, which really aggravated him. But uh, like I said, the woman that had raised me when, when she wanted me to remember things, she'd always tell me, remember, 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 and she'd tell me something. And one of the biggest things that she told me was you have to remember, 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 you're a man of the isle, son of the sea, and a brother of the storm. So I have that tattooed across here in Irish Gaelic because at that time, I didn't know Manx Gaelic because she was Irish. But I've carried that with me. And for me, I've come back here two, about two weeks ago. I came for my first time. I did an interview with Manx Radio, which is on the YouTube, a couple pieces. I did it with Manx BBC. I got off the plane at Ronald's Way and I stepped out and the winds were blowing like they are today. But when I sucked in that first breath of air, I got a warm feeling through my chest like the island was welcoming me back. Now I've spent, I've been lucky to be here for a few days and I've got to go around places. Now the place I was born doesn't exist anymore. It was off the Hillbury TT turn. But like I said, I was a motorcycle rider. So I went there, got a picture taken at the TT sign Hillbury. And I went to the TT grandstands because that to me was kind of hallow ground. So the thing was that if I ever get the opportunity I plan to move back here. But if I can't move back here, at least I'm going to come coming back. I was lucky enough to be invited to come do this talk today. So I'm going to stop talking now, and I'll take questions from you guys. And, um, you know, I am what I am. Well, the first thing they changed in the prison thing was five years after I went to prison, they said, anybody doing over this much time, three years, five years, all good times taken away. So instead of doing half the time to get, go for your first chance for parole, you now had to do whatever because you couldn't. And then the next thing was any person granted parole, the governor now could take your date for whatever reason he chose. 
uh, I was found suitable in 2013. And the way the parole system worked, you go before two people, and you're in there for anywhere from two to four hours, and you're pleading your case to get out. They make a decision. Now, if they find you suitable, they have 120 days for it to go before all 12 of the parole commissioners. And they have to agree that you're suitable. And it has to be a majority. Then it goes for 30 days to the governor. So when I found 13, I made it through the two, I made it through the 12, got to the governor, two days before I was gonna get out, he said no. And he knew I was gonna be deported because I'd been, I'd been up for deportation since 2009, this is 2013. Because the man who had bought me when he died in 96, sent a big letter with 70 documents saying he ain't supposed to be here. He's been in this country illegally. He's been using a US citizen's name. You need to deport him. So he did that, but he made sure he did after he died so nobody could get him. Um, so I get my, my denial two days before I'm supposed to get out from the governor. And the governor has to put down why he's denied you. He said, because I can. What? That's what I said, because I can. So took that to the court, said, this isn't right. The court said, he has the right to in his opinion, and it's his opinion. It took me four more years to get found suitable again. So two years ago, right now, I was sitting in a prison cell waiting to find out what that final decision was going to be with no idea if I was going to get out, if I'd ever be standing where I'm standing today. Quite honestly, people asked me when I was leaving, will you ever go back into a prison to do a talk? I told them, there's no way I'm going to voluntarily walk back into a prison, okay? So, okay, I'm a liar. I'm here. Um, but I have to admit, I did watch the program. I take, I take care of an 81-year-old woman who, who had been my pen pal for like 12 years through prisons abroad, and she said, oh, you've got to watch this. And so we watched it. And um, so, well, the thing was is that she didn't know, she really didn't know the prison I, stuff I was in. And she had never really watched prison shows. So she's like, so is this like what you had? Nah. Is this what you, nah. So it was that kind of thing. But quite honestly, just the fact that it was something to do with the Isle of Man. I try to watch anything I can about the Isle of Man. Um, I did get a chance when I came last time to go straight to the top of Snaefell, and it happened to clear, and I got to see the Seven Kingdoms. Okay, so it's like I said, I, I take every bit over here to heart. Um, but that's what happened: is the governor got the right to take dates, and he started taking dates. And then in 2009, they changed another law, where when you got denied, they could only deny you one, two, three, four, or five years. 2009. They had legislature change that, so everybody who would normally get a one now gets a three. Those who had a two would get a five. Those who had a three got a seven. Those who had a four got a 10. And those who had a five got 15. And in the last four years, the number of guys who got 10 and 15 year denials just went through the roof. So a guy who's got 25 years in, been programming, goes to the board, the board says, well, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we want you to do these programs, so we're going to give you 15-year denial so you have time to do it. The guy comes back to the wing, 25 years in, counting on his fingers from 25, and realizes now he'll have 40 years in before he goes back to his next board. And the other problem you have with boards, you never see the same board twice. You go before the board, and one board says, I want you to take anger management and get your GED, your high school diploma, high school equivalent. Next board, you go into and say, oh, I don't care about that. I want you to go take an auto mechanics course and uh, take, uh, we'll take a class on human sexuality. So you go and do that. And you come back and then we go, oh, we don't care about that. I want you to take electronics and I want you to go and work in the kitchen for a while. And you're like, I keep doing what you do. Yeah, but you didn't do what we told you. You did what the last group said. And that, and I hate to tell you, but as a nickel and dime, you have two years here, three years here, five years here, 10 years here, you start taking away a man's hope. I still have contact with some of the guys that I did time with, and I've had at least seven who had as much time in his eye or more who've told me, 
I'm not going to board anymore. They just, board, they come and tell them, you got to go board. No, here, take my ID card. It can talk to them. And that's what's happened. California's gotten to where guys have just given up. They don't even, they don't even want to get out. And particularly when they get to be my age. I'm, I'm 65 and a half years old. Unfortunately, this tells me I'm 30, but the rest of it tells me that. Um, so that's, that's, what hap- that's what changed, the laws changed, and just has been devastating ever since. Yes, ma'am. Pardon? How did I cope up here? Because I wouldn't let the bastards win. In my mind, no matter what, they couldn't win. And that, that was really my thing. They cannot win. And, but at the same time, I did, a lot of, I did a lot of hobby craft while I was in prison. Example, the only thing I could bring in here. I wore that home on my belt just to aggravate the immigration custom people. Okay? But I used to take lolly sticks and I used to make little miniature guitars and I would give them to the guys who played guitars. Just give them to them, just because I could, because I made them and I didn't really need them. And it made the guy realize that, hey, this guy thinks that I'm worth something because he gave me this, he made this and gave it to me. Okay. Uh, guys who played Dungeons and Dragons, I don't know if you guys had that going on over here, but they couldn't have the figures. So out of lolly sticks, I'd make, you know, werewolves and elves and dwarfs and monsters and stuff, and I'd do that for them. And then I also, I did a video, it's on uh, the YouTube thing, where I showed how to make prison buttons. Because we, we had problems where you lose a button, you lose a button. So I took lolly sticks and glued them together and made holes, and, and I'd make little buttons, different sizes and stuff to put on clothes. Um, so for me, doing things like that, the most kind of fascinating thing I did was they had the Stafford Shore, the Stafford's Horde found uh, back in like 2010 or something, and they had pieces of an Anglo-Saxon helmet. Well, I actually made the helmet based on the drawing they did. I mean, it's full size, fits me. I've got pictures of it. Uh, I did a Manx table, three-legged, armored leg table. I've got that that I made. Uh, five times I've been displayed through the Kohlesler Trust uh, in the Royal Festival Hall. Five times my stuff went there, twice things sold. So with me, I did what made it right for me, made, my, made me feel like I was doing something positive every day because I used to tell guys, if you're not doing something positive every day, you've thrown away a day of your life you can't get back. And like I said, but I just wouldn't let them win. Yes, sir. How long did it take you to realize you made a mistake and letting your wife live? <laughs> well, here, here's kind of the thing. Part of, part of the, that, that, that conversation my attorney had with me and my wife's attorney had with me was, your wife will love you forever, she'll stick by you, your son will think you're all, you're all that and a, and a bag of crisps, and um, my wife was gone two weeks after I got her out of the jail. She married, married a, a, a brother of one of the girls she met in the county jail, moved on with life, and I've never had any contact with her since. The point with me, though, is that still, yes, I, you could say it was a, a big mistake on my part, but if you look at all the stuff we found out later, chances are, had I not taken that deal, I would have probably been a victim of a traffic accident because I was too dangerous to the man who had bought me to allow me to be out there running free and loose. So this was his way of getting me off the streets because there was a little statement he made in the statement to the immigration. He said that because I was in such desperate need to have family, something I never had growing up, and I had a wife and I had a son, I could be easily manipulated. So they knew that, that I would not allow my wife to be harmed or my son to be thrown into state care, which is almost prison in California. Uh, most of the kids that go into state care end up in prison. You know. um, so they knew they had that. And though I didn't understand all the stuff going on behind it, I just knew where my, my, my morals stood. And my morals stood the fact that I had to protect my family. No, unfortunately, my son died. Yeah, because what happened was, as he started growing up, he started looking like me, sounding like me, and the new guy that my wife was with said, he, I don't want him around, because he had a couple of kids with him, and they put, my, they put my son into a foster care situation, and my son ended up 
being in an accident, yeah. Currently, I live in North London. Um, don't know how much longer because the lady I take care of has got a big Victorian house that I've been helping her fix up because I cook for her, I help do her errands for her, I shop for her, I build things for her. I built an ensuite for her bedroom because she's having mobility troubles and stuff. And now I just passed my driver's license, so now I'm going to be her chauffeur as well. And she's planning to sell the house in the spring and move to a market town some a little bit further out of London. And at least in the interim, I'll be moving with her to help t still take care of her. But at the, like say, at some point in time, we know that that situation is going to change. She's got you know, a lot of health problems right now. And like I said, if everything works out for me, I'll eventually come back over here. Watch the TT, you bet you. Though, I'm, though I was a really reasonably good motorcycle mechanic, and I had friends that were racers, I know personally I didn't have to take what it takes to be a racer. But I've watched as much TT and clips of TTs as I could over the years when I was in different prisons that allowed us to see that. Yeah. Well, the, the, the whole point of Dean Deporty was an interesting thing because I got released from prison 18th of December, 2017. And immediately, Immigration Custom Enforcement, ICE agents, picked me up and took me down. But instead of taking me to an ICE detention, they rented a part of a local jail, and they had a wing that was all ICE guys waiting to be deported. So we had like 200 guys in a room a little smaller than this. And um, most of them were Hispanics, some were Asians, a few Africans. And most of them came from war-torn drug cartel countries, things like that, and they didn't want to go back because you know, things were a little more dangerous than they were in the U.S. So when they wanted to go get, to be able to get asylum, the, the government would give them a 100-page packet and say, fill this out properly and give it back to us. Well, most of these people didn't speak English, couldn't read, couldn't write, any of that. So, of course, they didn't get it. So, stupid me, of course. I said, bring them to me. I'll fill them out for you. I did 48 packets in the two months I was there. 36 got granted right away. The others were still pending. And the ICE agents came in and said, you know, Kane, we're going to kick your ass if you keep doing this. Said, we've had two put in in the last two years and both of them were denied. You've put 48 in and 36 have been granted. Said, we're going to kick your ass because we don't want these people here. I said, well, I don't want to be here. So if you don't want me to keep doing it, get me the hell out. Uh, the morning they took me out of the jail, they chained me up, put me in a van, had a guard sitting across from me with a pistol on my chest, basically. Don't move. Drove me to the ICE office, took me in, stripped me out, gave me my, my dress out clothes, put me back in chains, took me to the airport. British Airways would not let them send me back in chains. So we went by Delta. That was 17 hours that I was in chains. I'm a type 2 diabetic, and they wouldn't feed me during that time because it wasn't in the budget. Um, so I fly over, we're, la we're, we're the first ones on the plane, last ones off the plane. We get to uh, Heathrow, and my friend, the 81-year-old lady, 79 at the time, she was waiting for me out there. And when they're getting ready to get off the plane, the pilot says, take, those, take all that chains off him. Do not let British authorities see you, him and him in chains. They will not appreciate this. So they do it. Now, I have an air marshal who's been sitting behind me, poking me in my back of my head most of the trip, telling me if I got squirrely, he'd shoot me, all right? And uh, the two ICE agents each grab my arm, and they're walking me. And, of course, they're, they're big guys. They're, they, nobody, I, I, for some reason, I never got any guards that were my height or smaller. They were always, you know. So we're walking up. We walk up to the ICE thing. Now, I have a full passport, and my passport says birth, place of birth, Onken. Uh, my driver's license says Isle of Man. I have a status letter from the British Secretary of State saying, born on the Isle of Man. My deportation papers say, born on the Isle of Man. Um, so, but my friend, she had my full passport, and she wouldn't send it to the U.S. because she didn't trust them not to lose it. So we had a temporary one from the consulate. So we had, they handed in, and there was a nice lady sitting there, and she's looking at it, and she goes, how long have you been gone? And I said, 63 and a half years. Well, welcome home. And they, they looked at her and said, we've deported him. He goes, yeah, but he's home. Wait right here. She walks off, goes in this room, comes out with a man in a suit, comes out with a box, walks up to the ICE, uh, ICE agents and the air marshal, punches a com combination, opens the box, 
turns to the air marshal and says, put your weapon in here. He goes, my gun? He goes, yeah, you got to put your, put your weapon there. Well, I'm leaving tomorrow. She goes, and tomorrow you can have it back. So he takes out and puts it in there. She goes, and the two magazines. But I'm leaving tomorrow. And you get those back too. Then she puts it, closes it, locks it all up, hands it to another guy. The guy in the suit walks up and says, you know, I'm immigration. Okay. He goes, um, how long have you been gone? I said, 63 years, 63 and a half years. He goes, well, why are you back? I said, because this is home. Well, welcome home. Now just walk over there and get your bag off the carousel, head off that way and get on down and you get your way out of Heathrow. And they go, we just deported him. And they said, yeah, and he's home now. Yeah, but, but we brought him here in custody and he's no longer in custody. He's now home. And I grab my bag and I hear him go, where would we get a taxi? And they go, well, the buses are out. No, no, we, we want taxis. And the guy starts walking away and you hear the air marshal going, man, they took my gun. They took my gun because he's still got the holster. Um, yeah, so I get my first tube ride. Never been on a tube before. Never seen that many people in, in a little tiny metal thing before. Got home and stuff. But I've had a real problem with things like the internet and email and stuff because I kept telling everybody, I'm not going to have this stuff. I don't need it. You know, didn't have it when I was in, out on the streets last time, you know, 34 years ago. Didn't have it. Didn't need it. So I tell everybody, well, if I need anything, I'll get a CB radio. Anybody really wants to talk to me, they'll get a CB radio. Ain't nobody uses CB. The airways are clean, right? Well, problem was is I had to get benefits because I came back with five pounds. That's what the government, British government, I mean, what the U.S. government gave me. Here's five pounds. You're, you're a criminal alien, undesirable. Do not come back to the U.S. or any territory or you face a federal life sentence. So I show up with five pounds in my hand. My friend gets me back to her house, so I've got a, I've got a place to stay. And then I have to get things, and I have to get an email address, and I have to get a phone. And the first phone I get is a stupid phone. And partially because of the fact that he kept telling me I had Texas, and, and I kept saying, okay, tell me what it says. I didn't know how to answer a text. Didn't know how to write a text. Nobody tells you. And you know what? The phones don't come with instructions. None of it says, you know, push this button and this button, this button, and you get. Doesn't tell you that. The guy just says, practice. Okay. Well, that didn't. I, you don't know how many things I deleted before I realized I was, that I was doing the wrong thing. So anyway, before I came this last time, I bought a, a new phone because my my old one sometimes I couldn't call within a couple miles to the house. So I get this new Galaxy thing, and everybody said, oh, this would be great because it's like your Samsung tablet, which I still don't know how to use properly. So I get it, and they, the guy goes, do you want a plan? He goes, well, we'll give you a plan where you can do free calling anywhere in the British, in the UK, anywhere in, in the EU. I said, fantastic. Funny enough, Isle of Man is neither. It's neither UK nor is it EU, so I couldn't use my phone to call over here. Yeah, so, that kind of, so I had to get something called WhatsApp. Didn't know what that was. And the first time I used it, and suddenly somebody was looking at me on the thing, I'm like, because I didn't know it had video on it. Yeah, so I've had, I've had some things, problems like that, where, you know, same thing where a few of the bathrooms I went in and trying to get the water to come on. And, and then I'd come to find out there. Yeah, you know, so the first couple of times I had to kind of like stand back and wait for somebody else to come in the bathroom. Hey, how you doing? You know? Wait for him to get the walk. Oh, okay, so there's a light thing under there. Because nobody, nobody tells you. And of course, being down as long as I am, I also have this problem about asking people things because, you know, it's a man thing. You, you ladies back there wouldn't understand that, but men have a trouble asking a lot of times. I've gotten better, particularly when I was over here a few weeks back and I was walking the hills of Douglas, which ironically I didn't know you had because maps didn't show it had hills, it just was flat. Um, and I got up in the hills trying to find places and people. Would, People were really kind to point me out to which way I'd go and stuff. Friendliest people I've met has been here. Much friendlier than America, even friendlier in London, but London was much friendlier than, than America. I've got a question. Yes? I can't, I can't imagine what you went through in the sentence, but did you, you talk about cartels? Are you friends with them? Am I friends with cartels? No, actually, I wasn't friends with cartels. What I was friends with were some of the victims of cartels. I had one of the guys that I became very good friends with lived in my wing at the last prison I was at. A guy named little guy named Jose, little Mexican guy, played guitar and stuff. 
Huh? I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, he, he doesn't have a phone. He's still, in, he's still inside. Uh, the problem is, is that he was one of these guys who was a victim of cartels. He was a dirt farmer. He used to talk about how big his rocks were he grew, grew on his farm. He said every time he, he plowed the field, he had bigger rocks than he had the time before. So he must be doing something right. But he lived in northern Mexico, and one day these drug people came through, and they grabbed up all the men in their mid-20s and told them, we want you to take these drugs across the, the border for us. We're going to get you across the border. You can take them up here, you drop them off, we'll get you back, and then we'll give you $500. If you don't do this, we'll kill your family. Jose stands about this tall, weighs about 105 pounds. So he and two other guys get taken to this, the border, get, they get him across the border, and they tell him, okay, go, go four more miles up through the desert here, and you'll find your drop-off point. There'll be somebody waiting for you. This is the California desert, middle of July, 115 degree heat, no water. They're trying to figure out where they're going. They don't have any maps, compasses, or anything. One of the guys gets really, really sick, and he sits down. They're carrying these big packs of, of drugs. So they sit them down next to them while they decide to go up and see if they can find the connection that's supposed to get so they can get help for their friend and get this stuff and get back home. As they come out of the road, Border Patrol pulls up. They get gaffled. But now they've got a friend in need back here who's from the same village. So they tell him. Blah, blah, blah. So they go over there. The guy's died. They got these drugs all around him. These two guys get charged with murder because it's in the, the guy dies while they're committing a felony. They're telling him, look, we're just dirt farmers. We were forced to blah, blah, blah. He gets given 25 to life. He's been down 23 years right now or so. He wrote me a letter and said, Mr. Morgan, I don't want to go home because they've killed, my, they've killed my wife, they've killed this, they killed my brother. So my other brother has taken this part of my family to America. They want to deport me, but I'll be killed because I didn't do the drugs, and they're going to kill me when I go back. So here's a guy who can't go back and can't stay here. And he's to the point where he doesn't want to, go, doesn't want to get out of prison because it's the only safe place for him. So that's the kind of people I dealt with were the ones that were victims of these other kind of crime things and stuff. Because if that had not come up, he'd still be growing the biggest rocks in northern Mexico. Yes, sir. Well, that's a big question here. I had these big plans when I got out. I thought I'd get back over here, I'd get me some motorcycle parts, start building bikes again, all stuff. And everybody kept saying, you can't do that. Um, I tried to get jobs in a couple motorcycles. Oh, you haven't got this, re this, you haven't got this permission, this citation, this document, don't have, things like that. So basically what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to get the most out of each day I can, trying to do everything I possibly can to help the people around me, friends, family, strangers that I meet. I would like to be able to come back to the Isle of Man on a motorcycle here in a not too distant figure while, I can, while I'm still capable of riding, I think. Um, Hopefully, I'll live to be a ripe old age because I have most of my family live well into their 80s and 90s. And pretty much, um, I'm just trying to uh, be the best me I can be. Currently, one of the things I do is I volunteer at a wildlife center doing maintenance work, and I'm helping to take care of a hedgehog that just moved into my back garden. And um, it's what I do. But my, best, my thing is just whatever I can do to try to help other people have the best they can have as far as, and, and like I said, you know, I did a lot of work with some of the young guys coming in prison, trying to convince them prison wasn't the place to be, and give them, show them the opportunities that they had, so as I told them, the last thing you want to do is wake up 35, 40 years later and look like me, looking in a mirror going, damn, I should have listened to them, so I don't blame anybody for the problems, but I tell everybody you have the same strength to, to overcome as long as you believe in you. Because I believe everybody can be better than what they think they can be and better when other, other people think they can be. You just have to believe in you. And trust me, I had a lot of people tell me, you'll never get back to the Isle of Man. You'll never get out of prison. You're never going to see freedom. You're never going to have any friends on the outside. You're never going to have, you're never going to have, you never, and you know, and I've got a lot of that. And like I said, and um, you know, I really, 
appreciate you guys coming to hear me speak. Because quite honestly, when I was first told I we should write a book when I got it, which was actually by one of my board commissioners, um, I kept thinking, I don't have anything anybody wants to hear. But my book got published this last uh, uh, June. And in the first 90 days, more than 5,000 copies were sold. Surprised the hell out of me. Um, I have had people actually meet me on the streets of London who had either seen Sean's podcasts or had seen my book and stuff like that. And so, and like I said, I am what I am. Are you anyone bitch? No. <laughs> but there is people that, that would, you know, staff for the other team over there. there. There were people who did their time that way because that's how they knew that was easier to do the time, having somebody protect them than them for doing their own. Do you keep a family over here? Unfortunately, I have, I have a few family members over here, but the problem was because I got sent away, and it was kind of a scandal at the time because my dad divorced my mom and left the island and all this stuff. The family I have over here basically said that they hold nothing against me, but I've been a stranger all their lives, and they have no room in their lives for a stranger. Pardon? Well, they did, but that's meaning my grandparents died in 81. They sold, they, the Falcon Cliff got taken from them in 39 by the British government for the war effort, and then the house, the house strike all burned down. It used to be Molly's Kitchen and stuff like that. And so, yeah, my grandparents, all, all my dad, my parent, my mom, my dad, and my grandparents have all been dead, you know, from the late, um, early 80s to the mid 90s. So, but the family I still have over here, I hold nothing against them, it's their lives. They, they choose to not want to know me, choose not want me in their lives. And, you know, so I've made some good friends on the island, though, and I've come over and visited them, and uh, I'll be back to see them. And, hey, you know, some of you guys I may see out there in the street and say hi, and we can, we can talk and whatever. I don't care. Well, it's, it's the first time I've independently spoken to a crowd. You know, previously, the last one I did, I did with Sean a year ago, November, and, you know, um, and we, we kind of worked together with that one. Um, but yeah, this is the first time, and definitely the first time I've been back in prison after 34 years. Uh, I, I, I think it went reasonably well. Uh, just, uh, you know, I was having a hard time kind of judging some of the, the people because I, for, there were a couple of moments when nobody was raising hands, so I wasn't sure what they were thinking. And, you know, but uh, hopefully I answered the questions that they asked me you know, pretty concisely and clear. Well, funny enough, it wasn't as nerve-wracking as I thought it would be because, quite honestly, the staff was so welcoming that it just was extremely surprising that, you know, they just, I was expecting more security, being they knew I'd come out of a prison and stuff. And quite honestly, the, the pat down and you know, the questions they asked me and all stuff were just almost as if I was just going there to visit somebody. There was no smell of fear uh, in the air. You didn't have the sense of foreboding. Um, it was quiet, much quieter, much, much cleaner. Um, just to all in all, it was a, a pretty good experience, I think. And uh, like I said, I think that uh, they're, some of the things they're trying to put into their program uh, it's pretty innovative and I think uh, may ultimately help at least some of the people, you know, and who knows, if they can even get 10% of the people not to come back, that'd be a pretty good bit because, you know, California runs on an 85% recidivism, you know, so if you can, you can, re, you know, get anybody to stop coming back, it's going to be helpful. This was Jamie's second talk to an audience. And when you go into prison, you know, they always look at you like, who are you? They're very skeptical and they can see through people if they're bullshit artists. And Jamie went in there and with his roots of the Isle of Man, you could just see. I was looking around the room at the audience's faces and I was almost teary eyed at some points. It got really emotional in there when Jamie was talking because he really skillfully weaved in, you know, all of his history and the anecdotes that he chose to tell 
about him being Manx in prison and being an island and what he went through and how he's got the tattoos. So I think Jamie spoke for about 30 minutes and then it went over to questions. The questions lasted a full 30 minutes and you could see how engaged they were just, just by all of the questions that they were asking. And the fact that during several points of the talk, the whole audience just burst out into spontaneous applause. Yeah, that was amazing. So you had the right balance of stories. There was some sad moments, there was some violent moments, there was some tragic moments. And I was constantly looking across the room and I could see that he, he really had him gripped. And for that to be only his second talk ever, you know, I think that was just a absolutely tremendous delivery. And that he's really got a career ahead of him as a public speaker. Actually, during the talk, I wasn't. Uh, once I decided that I would start by greeting them in Manx Gaelic, um, I felt that I, I'd opened up properly and it gave them the feeling that I was actually trying to reach out to them in, in something that they might find uh, uh, a pretty uh, a pretty good little uh, start. And so once I got going and I felt that I would tell them the bits of the story, I felt that I kind of needed to lay down a foundation and then I would go in from there. Uh, I actually felt really good about how I, I, I got that far along. How do you actually feel now after doing the talk? Because when I do a talk, my adrenaline goes up and then I come out and for about an hour I'm on a natural high and then I feel a bit tired. I remember when I, earlier on in my speaking career, sometimes I just, by the, by the time the drive home had finished, after an hour or so, I just go to bed and have a nap. Are you on a high right now from speaking or? I, I, am, on, I am on a high, but it's more of a level high. It's like I went up two notches and now I'm just stationary there. I'm not spiking. I'm not, I'm not, not going to go super spike like you do on a sugar rush or something, but it's, it's kind of like I rose up to that level and now I'm just riding that wave. So. And seeing the prison population of the Isle of Man versus, you know, where you come from with um, all these racial gangs, how, how did it strike you, the differences? Well, it struck to me with the fact that there seemed to be uh, a lot more uh, connection between the people and it might be because they all live here or majority of them live here and um, I saw how they were kind of teasing with each other before the talk which you normally wouldn't have seen in most of the prisons I was at and um, you know the fact that um, they when I was looking at them they all, their eyes seemed to be focused on what I was saying and that I didn't expect. I was expecting people to basically, I'm here just so I'm not in my cell type thing. And they weren't. They seemed like they were there because they wanted to see what I might say. So, Jamie, this is now your second visit to the Isle of Man. Yes. Would you, I, I mean, I, I, you said in the talk that you're feeling very welcome here, more welcome than anywhere in the world. Yeah, I feel this is home. Do you feel it was your destiny to be, to be here, back here like this? I, I honestly do feel that, quite honestly, it's, it seems to be like something that was um, destined or um, something that was meant to happen at some point. And so, ironically, even with everything I've gone through, I think it was worth the struggle to be here. Noticing you, watching you, when you are speaking to people, you know, people that have been helping us today, staff, um, the, John, the man who helped us yesterday and you were with this morning. It's like once you start to tell them your story and they hear you from the Isle of Man, their eyes go really big and there's this special rapport. Yeah. Everywhere you go, I just see people opening up to you, man. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I, I found that too. And I think in some respects, it's one of the things like when I told people that's where I was from, they seemed to want to reach out to try to figure out how to help me even more because I'm one of theirs <clears throat> and uh, you know and like I said 
uh, as John and I were talking earlier today, you know, he feels that, you know, that quite honestly, I've, I've had, you know, the, the dung end of the stick a number of times too, too many more than I should have had. And, and like I said, a lot of the people, like the guys were saying, you know, how do you keep so upbeat? How, how is it that, you know, with all the stuff you went through, you just didn't go into a deep depression. And like I was just trying to tell them, I just couldn't let the bastards win, you know, it's just. So is it your game plan now to move to the Isle of Man? Well, like I said, the, the big idea, I would eventually like to move back because this is where I'd like to die because I was born here, because this is home. This honestly feels more than any place I've ever visited anywhere. This truly feels like home. And, but the thing is that right now, my, my situation uh, between my, my financial situation and my just general living situation, doesn't allow me to be able to make that move at this point though it's something that I'm definitely going to be trying to figure out how I can make happen at some point but I'd like to be able to come back here you know two three four times a year at least for a week or better and um, if I can get go through and get the situation done with my birth registry then that will make it a lot easier because then at least I could transfer my 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 pension over here and I could get assistance to move over here but um, yeah a lot's going to just depend on how so how many things go right in the future. The next time Pineapple asks for your paperwork you would be verified as an Islander. Yeah. So why did you do the talk today and what were you hoping the prisoners would take away from it? Well quite honestly I did the talk today because I was surprised that I got asked to come to speak by the administration of the prison. I felt that if they actually wanted to hear what I had to say, I kind of owed it to them, being that this is where I'm from, to come and try to express some of what I felt about what had happened to me and what's happened to me now that I've been back. And I'm hoping that, as I was trying to explain to some of the inmates and stuff there, is that even if other people don't believe in you, if you can believe in yourself enough and you push forward enough, eventually everybody else is going to see the same potential and value in you that you may not have known up until the point you start forcing yourself to recognize and face it. Because I really believe that with the exception of just a very, very couple few people, everybody can be much better than they think they can be much better than a lot of other people believe they are. And what do you say then to people who claim that prisoners are incorrigible, lock them up and throw away the key, they should have nothing coming, they shouldn't have the special courses and classes that are available in the Isle of Man prison? Well, like I said, I've always said that you can't rehabilitate anybody, but you can offer the tools and uh, the uh, situations to which they can then take and rehabilitate themselves. But you have to give the encouragement to that person to make them believe <clears throat> in themselves. Because once a person believes, that's, that's, that's something that, that will surpass so much negativity is once you actually believe in yourself and what you can do. And um, I, I feel anybody who says that that everybody's incorrigible and everybody needs to be locked up and thrown away is themselves not seeing their full potential. Because quite honestly, I don't believe that you should give a hand out to people, but a hand up to people. So we were only allowed to film the talks today in the prison, but we did have a tour. Could you just describe what you saw on the tour of the prison and, and how that contrasted with the California prison system? Well, I, I noticed the first thing I noticed when I walked in the prison system is really how clean everything was. And and I can't believe that that was done just for us showing up. And I mean, <laughs> little crevices on the bars and everything, which I used to see junk, junk caked up on in a California prison. Everything was seemed to be done. And it seemed like staff actually took really pride in where they worked. And even when they were speaking about their interaction with inmates, they didn't speak about them as 
the other side. They spoke about them as part of the community there. And quite honestly, I don't think most of the guards would be all that unhappy if they had to one day close the prison down. I think that they would still find better ways of living. But the thing was, the quietness when you walked through your units, you didn't have screaming and yelling and doors being kicked and banged on. And uh, you didn't have really awful smells coming out of places. And just uh, the, the complete upbeat. And of course, like I said, the fact that I didn't see double fences with razor wire and electric, you know, fight and gun towers and all this stuff was the first thing that caught my eye when we pulled up. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I was just totally amazed and taken back with the fact that, uh, that this place is so civilized. I think that's really the, what I'm taking from it. It's civilized. And even like say, the guys came in an orderly manner. They went left in an orderly manner. They didn't try to push and shove and, you know, and, uh, it just, it just seemed like there was something that was working. What courses did the guards tell you were available, Jamie? And do you think that they are the key to rehabilitation? Well, they, they have a lot of self-help type courses similar to that in, uh, in the California prisons, but they do them in smaller, in a smaller, um, setting with small and you know, on smaller number of people and stuff so I think that may be a big key because of the fact that that you know if you're in a smaller group with people you're more knowing of and stuff you're more likely to actually try to work through issues uh, the the education lady was talking about that they had a wide variety of education and uh, you know avocation type training and stuff and uh, they actually did uh, college courses you know that I thought was, uh, <clears throat> you know, pretty good because though they have college courses in the California prison stuff, they make it to where it could take you seven, eight, ten years to get a two-year a two-year degree. Here they seem to be trying to not hold you back and trying to promote you to, you know, move on the best you can as soon as you can. So I kind of found that was, you know, a big part because. People don't realize that just being able to <clears throat> accomplish something will up somebody's uh, feeling of themselves and, you know, their value, so. I saw they gave the prisoners access to computers, no internet. Yeah. Did you have access to computers in California? Oh, internet. I, at the very, towards the very end, I did have a standalone computer in the library, but all it, all the programs were set to just manage the library um, you know books you know there was you couldn't it, it didn't even have a <clears throat> uh, stuff that you could put on like Excel and and stuff like you know PowerPoint and stuff that no that we just had a basic word thing so we could do tables and type in the, the books for each shelf and things like that so did you ever imagine that you would one day be doing a talk to prisoners no I because I actually told people that when people ask me if I'd ever go back into prison and give talks, I told them that absolutely not. There's no way I'd ever voluntarily walk back into a prison. I couldn't see any <clears throat> situation that would warrant me doing that. You know, and so, no, I, quite honestly, I, I didn't expect to do that at all. So I got released in December of 2007. Um, I was a bit institutionalized, I had to get my head a bit, a bit straightened out before I could start doing any talks at all. First talks I did, I think, were in 2009, maybe, uh, in schools. And I did do a prison tour, I think it might have been a Young Offenders in Wigan. And going back into prison, I'd only been out for about two years. It was a really, like it was triggering things. Yeah. My heart rate was up. I was sweating when I saw the prison as I'm walking in. Once I got in there and heard the noises of the keys yeah. and the doors clanking, it was almost like I was gonna start having flashbacks. Yeah. And, you know, I had to like take deep breaths to get these reactions under control. Yeah. So, You've been out now for, what is it, almost two years? Well, almost, yeah, 20 months, yeah. 
So you're at, you're at the same level now as, as me, but you were in for 34 years. So imagine, you know, there's some things in your brain, some patterns, some institutionalized patterns that are laid down. And there are things that kind of like trigger memories, especially if you go back into prison here, that they hear those same noises. How did it, you feel, can you, can you guide us from when you first just saw the prison to, to checking into the prison and going through the security measures? Well, the first thing was that it really didn't register that it was a prison when I walked up because it, the, the outside didn't look like a prison. You know, and so it almost looked like I was walking into like an office complex or something. And then when I saw their control room there, I actually told them, oh, that's a pretty nice uh, control room you got here <laughs> and stuff. Uh, but <clears throat> the fact that they didn't have keys that jangled and the doors didn't have that clunk clunk sound to them because the way their key system worked, uh, I think that may have kept me from really having any kind of uh, a spontaneous uh, reaction. But um, no, I, like I said, as soon as I went in and the guy was so polite about, oh, and what was funny is I pulled out my passport to show him and he didn't even look inside it. Um, he just took it. So we're going to put it in the locker here for you. I went, okay. And then I gave him all my other stuff and he's like, okay. And then we got in the side and he goes, oh, do you mind if I put your hat in there? No, no, here, go take my hat, you know. Uh, it was so, he kept asking me if it was okay. And I kept thinking, no prison guard ever in California would ask me if something was okay. They would just tell me, You're, this is what we're going to do. So, and then like I said, when I saw Margot come out, and I, because I knew her, and she had this big smile and ran up and gave me a big sh handshake and, you know, asked me how I was, how I was feeling. You know, that was completely opposite of what I saw her in the, in the movie about, I don't care about anybody, I don't trust anybody, I don't, you know, and so... That's why I pointed out that she had a male counterpart, Dougal, because uh, I want you to know that I already had some idea about her, but she actually didn't show me that side of her. She actually showed me more of a human side, so. And what did you do this morning before you arrived at the prison? Oh, geez. Well, we shot all the way down to Peel, and we had a Kipper's Bab, <laughs> which was pretty nice, though the, the wind was blowing so bad that you know, I had to leave my hat in the car and, and it was blowing the coffee. We had cups of tea and it was blowing the tea out of the cups and stuff. And then we drove over to uh, the ferry bridge on uh, the way to back to Ronald's Way and also to uh, the Murray's Motorcycle Museum, which is right on the right in the same little bit of road. And we went in there and I was immediately just over. That was a place that really overwhelmed me. I went in there and they've got hundreds probably at least 130, 140 motorcycle and parts everywhere, motors, trannies, all that. And I just went around, I took photos of some and I was just just completely enamored with all the stuff I was seeing. And I just, uh, the lady actually made a comment that she might have to bring a towel and come wipe the drool up. And uh, then the guy came out and they gave me a bunch of stickers and. Gave me some little lucky fairies to put in my helmet when I start riding again. And just, it was just, everything was so overwhelming because everybody was being so, so nice. You know, and, uh, and like I said, the guy made the comment when he found out I was, that I wrenched about, you know, hey, you ought to just come on over here and move over and I'll, I'll let you come over here and work on bikes. I got a Triumph back here that needs to be put back together. And, you know, and so, you know, it's one of those things I'm going to tell Bay night. You know, I've already found found place for us to stay. Of course, we're going to be sleeping around motorcycles, but I'll throw a couple sleeping bags on the floor. <laughs> you know, got, I've got a job. I got a job. You know, so, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's just been wonderful. This whole day, you know, it's been just uh, something that's built building on each other. And you know, so the going to the prison was kind of the the highlight at the point at this point in time of the day. But I think that. <clears throat> I've been able to somewhat control a major hike in uh, adrenaline. So, you know, so yeah, this has been, but this has all been good. So it was, it was our intention to bring you to the Isle of Man for your very first time ever. Yeah. But two weeks ago, your book publisher said that there was a bunch of 
publicity stuff they would have liked you to do here and you came what did you do on that previous visit well uh, they had scheduled for me to have Manx radio interview on that um, Wednesday a book signing for that Thursday and uh, a, a Manx uh, BBC interview that Friday before I flew back out and so we got here and we got here on the on the, the, on the Tuesday <clears throat> we got settled in and um, we stayed at a place called the Trevelyan which is just down from the best western where we are now and then we went and did a couple of quick scenes we went up to Snaefell Mountain which highest peak on the aisle and like I say on a clear day you can see said the seven kingdoms and we did see them because the clouds cleared and what does that mean the seven kingdoms the seven kingdoms there it says that on the clear day on the top of Snaefell Mountain which Snaefell means snow in the Norse language so it means snow mountain um, you could see the seven kingdoms the seven kingdoms are Scotland England Wales Ireland the Isle of Man the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the sea <laughs> <clears throat> and so we got to see that and it got it we got it filmed and everything and it's no sooner we did the filming the clouds came back in <laughs> and uh, then we came down and we quickly went by a couple of places that were connected to my family the Falcon Cliff and the house trade got a couple of quick photos and then the day was pretty much getting too dark and we had to go back and <clears throat> get ready for the next day next morning we went and we did the interview at 11 a.m with uh, Manx Radio, it was about a 25 minute interview. Came back out, tried to see a few more little things, and then it got dark again. <laughs> then uh, Thursday, went down to do the book signing, found out the books hadn't arrived. So that day, uh. we, uh, we got rides from um, my friend Sarah's dad, who's a taxi driver, and he drove us different places. And, and uh, he kept telling me he wasn't gonna charge me, and I still said, no, I gotta pay you because this is your job and I know off season you don't get as many calls as you normally would. So I paid him anyway and <clears throat> but he took me to the church where I was baptized and you know took me to the golf course where my granddad's trophy is given out every year and you know took us to a number of other iconic places around the aisle, got to the grandstands for the TT race, got some photos. And then uh, I went that evening I went over and visited my friend Sarah and, and her her boyfriend Glenn and their their kid and you know had my first bushies which is the ale of man and then um, <laughs> the next day we met up with the BBC reporter and went out to Laxey wheel and did that and then we came back to the hotel and the lady let us stay at the hotel a little longer and do the interview from there and uh, basically then we just uh, got prepared to head back to the airport because we had to be there two hours early and then we caught our flight back out and went back to London. So out of your two visits yeah. to the Isle of Man, what has been the f thing that you've visited, uh, the, the thing that you've seen that has affected you the most, that you've enjoyed the most? Well, like I say, quite honestly, going to the Manx TT grandstands because that's kind of holy ground, you know, for... Uh, for anybody who rides motorcycles and stuff. So including putting that next to the Murray Motorcycle Museum, that's like a big double helping of, you know, 60 weight petrol, 60 weight and petrol shoved into my veins. Uh, but I think the most moving thing for me <clears throat> was going to the Falcon Cliff because there were still these two pillars that lined the drive going into it. And there's one stone on one of the pillars that was kind of a really smooth, flat stone. And it was just at the right height to put your palm on if you were just standing up against it. And I really kind of got a feeling that my my dad and maybe my granddad both had, had had their hands on that stone. And because it is a place that my grandparents lived for 20 years, it seemed like part of their spirit and part of my parent, my grand, my parents' spirit might have been connected to that. And uh, that that held a pretty emotional. Uh, moment for me kind of the most disappointing thing for me was the fact when uh, <clears throat> I wanted to go to where my my dad's ashes were and found out that the property had been sold by the church and it was now in private hands so I wasn't even allowed to go on the property even though the markers where 
they were, had been done, which were the Stations of the Cross, had been moved to another place. So nobody actually knew where my dad's ashes had been laid. I just couldn't even go onto the ground to get a feel for it. So that was kind of probably the, been the biggest letdown out of the, both trips. We spoke to numerous people, locals, today and yesterday. And when you start telling your story, I see some of them ask you, like, grill you a little bit about your Isle of Man knowledge. Yeah. And it ends up with them astounded because you know more about the Isle of Man than them. And they've even, they've even admitted that. How does someone who has not lived here, how do you know all this stuff? Well, some people would probably tell you it was a Vulcan mind meld, but actually it's just because I wanted to know as much as I could about where I was born so that I could be more, uh, more capable of using it as a strength. The more I knew, the more I understood, the more heritage that, that I knew came from here gave me the ability to withstand a lot of uh, adversity. And so it's been just a constant thing about me learning as much as I can. And that's why even with John today, I told him, he said, well, I don't know if I should tell you certain, certain things because you might know it. I said, tell me anyway, because even if I do know it, it's good to hear other people tell me. But if I don't know it, it's just give me more information. So he did. He took me to Fletcher Christian's house showed me Prince Albert's tower, you know, um, you know, pointed out different things that, that he thought were kind of important on the aisle. And uh, yeah, quite honestly, <clears throat> it meant an awful lot to me that he actually took the time to want to show me things and uh, to share time with me as um, comparing different things uh, that we knew about the aisle. Has the aisle met or exceeded your expectations? far exceeded my expectations and like I said and <clears throat> the, because there's still so much more of the aisle I haven't experienced and things I haven't experienced to the fullness I don't uh, see that as something that's not that's going to lessen anytime soon I I think that quite honestly I could come here and live for the next 20 years and still be in a constant state of amazement uh, and exhilaration for being here and and getting to know the place even more so. Yeah, and she also gave me her third bedroom as my office where I work and do my writings and stuff out of it and stuff. So, um, I, I measured the inside measurement of my shed. And my shed is 88 and, ha and uh, half inches long. So I have to get a bike that's, that's shorter than 80, 88 and a half inches. I looked at a Triumph Bobber. It's 89 inches. I <laughs> looked at uh, Yamaha Drag Stars. And they're like 92 inches. Oh. But the Sportster is 88 inches. Perfect. And I could bring it in and turn the wheel so it'll even fit even better in there. So it basically that's how it came. Because I actually had an offer for uh, a big twin Harley uh, for, from a guy that I've become friends with uh, named Paul. I just, matter of fact, he just had me come down to this airfield, uh, Fish, Fishburn Airfield, and uh, he had people buy some books from me and stuff. And he's He's been, he's been really cool and stuff like that, uh, but uh, so have you sent your books to um, like film producers, big production? Companies? I don't know how to do that. See again, yeah. you've got to remember, half my life and two thirds of my adult life, I w I was out of circulation, you know, and so I mean, the last time I knew how people did that is they used to go down. 
to the Brown Derby in L.A. and sit there and wait for producers and stuff to come in and drop a script off at them. Yes. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I don't know. I don't even know how to do a screenplay. Because here's the thing. See, I've written short stories as well when I was in prison. And I wrote a really, uh, what I think is, is a beautiful little short story, make it a great little film, mm. right? It's called, you know, The Choice. And and the story is, is that, <clears throat> this is partially based on what Martha told me. Because Martha had told me that there was... There was a couple. There are some places in Scotland and in Ireland where there are crossroads, and you can go to these crossroads at a certain time at midnight, and the horse goddess will come riding along, and she'll offer you a chance to change your life. But you have to be in true dire need for her to show. And so I wrote this this little story, and it's basically this guy where his life's taking a shit. His his mom just passed away. He just lost his job. His wife had. A miscarriage and has divorced him you know and he's down to where he has really nothing left he's being his house is being taken because he didn't have jobs and all stuff and so i saw like the opening scene is she a guy sitting at a table with these letters laying out there yeah. you know and you see all this stuff and you just see despondency but he remembered his mom told him about this this crossroad in, in ireland's place and uh he didn't know if it's true but his mom believed it so he takes what he what Lily has left. He flies back to Ireland, and he rents a car and he goes to this pub, and it's like an old country pub and stuff out in the like middle of nowhere type thing. And he goes in and, and uh, the bar keep the pub, uh, you know the um, the publican goes, uh, you're looking uh, like you're kind of lost. He goes, no, and he says, uh, he says, there, you know where the crossroads are here? And the guy goes, the crossroads. The guy goes. Well, you don't want to go to the crossroads. He goes, yeah, I, I do. And he, and he goes, life's that bad for you. He goes, yeah. And he goes, I, I need to, I need to see if it, it'll, if it's, if it's true. And so the guy says, well, he says, uh, have this pint on me. And he goes, and uh, if you really want to go, he goes, uh, I'll point you the way. So they can get it. he tells him, pull your car around to the side, take off your shoes and socks. You walk up that hill. Over on the other side of the hill, you'll find the crossroads. And at the hill is just like all grass, except there's one old gnarly weathered tree at the top. And as the guy's walking, he realizes that the warm ground is, even though it's, it's got dew on it, it's warm, and it's kind of got this different kind of feel, and he sees all the greens in the thing. And he's getting up and he sees the tree. And as he starts to get, the, he suddenly can't move. It's like he's being pushed back. And he looks, and there's like a face in the tree. And... And he says, no, no, I, I know what I'm doing. I've got to do this. And then all of a sudden, the pressure goes away, and he's able to go across. And he walks down the other side. Well, he looked at his watch when he left, and it was like 7 in the evening. Yeah. He gets down there, and it's like 2 minutes to midnight, but it's less than just, just a little over this hill. It's not very far. But he's noticed uh, fairy rings, mushroom fairy rings, as he's walked down the same. Gets to this thing, and now it's just pitch black. And clouds go away and a full moon comes out and then he then he's standing right in the middle of the crossroad he hears his clippity clop clippity clop and he sees this cloud of mist coming there and in it he just make out a figure on a horse and up comes <clears throat> this raven haired a woman green eyes on this horse that's nearly transparent it's so white and uh that's masha that's the horse irish horse goddess and um uh, she says, what are you doing here? And he says, uh, I've, I've heard that you're the giver, you know, of, 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 of you know, that you can give gifts of <clears throat> changing my life and stuff. And she goes, okay. And he says, uh, you realize that if you do this, you can't go back. It doesn't change. So you can stop right now and go back to your life. And he goes, no, I can't go back to the life I have. I've got to do something. And she goes, okay. So you've made that decision. He goes, yes, I have. He says, okay. He says, well, down this road here, he just goes, didn't say which way. He goes, well, down one, one road, you'll have great wealth, <clears throat> but you'll be of such ill health, you'll never be able to enjoy it. So another road, you'll have great fame, but everybody around you will be constantly trying to, you know, betray you to get part of that. He says, the other road will take you <clears throat> to have a, a, the life that you have now only at an earlier stage to give you the opportunity to change things along the way so you won't end up here. And the last road has not, the, 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 the future hasn't been written on that. 
And he goes, oh, and he's thinking, but he doesn't know which one goes where. She doesn't tell him that. <clears throat> he says, uh, well, well, what if I don't choose? She goes, no, no, you made that. You already decided you were going to. She says, so what happens if you don't take a path before the sun comes up? You will be stuck here in this crossroad in out of time until someone else comes along to make a choice and then you get their life that they're trying to get rid of. Yeah. And, uh, and she says, but you'll have to make your decision soon. She goes, because the dawn is starting. And now you can see the false dawn starting up. And she goes, remember, I'm Masha, you know, the horse goddess. But I'm also recalled the nightmare because not all dreams are pleasant. And she rides off. Ooh. Yeah. And he's left there. What decision, which choice, which road does he take? And you're left with that. And then it goes back to the pub. The morning's there. The publican comes down from his room upstairs, comes out, sees the car still there, sees the shoes and socks, moves them over, backs the car through the skate. And in this back behind the pub, <clears throat> there are just like hundreds of cars, coaches, uh, you know, uh, wagons and stuff of all the people who've come there and parked their stuff to go and try the crossroads and never came back for it. And he goes... I'm going to have to start getting rid of some of this stuff. I don't have much room left. And that's how it ends. And so I wrote this short story. It's just, it's really just like a two page story. But I've written a few short stories like that. And I thought that would be a really great one to do in a short film. Yeah. Is it based on the legends or anything? Well, Masha or, is. She's the horse goddess. Horse yeah. Progress. It's like <clears throat> you've got Masha and then you got Rihanna. Rihanna is the Welsh horse goddess. Okay. And then. <clears throat> you've got the Gaulish, which is still Celts, is Epona. Yeah. And Epona is where you get the word pony from. Oh, right. Oh. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Right. Oh, yeah, I've, I've got I've, I've got long, long knowledge of Celtic oh, gods, so Scottish, you, you know, the... You the, said the, the, you, you're not sure how to write a script, please. I don't know how to write a script. I'll, I'll send you some PowerPoints, because I'm yeah. running workshops now, where I'm yeah. teaching the screenwriting, and yeah. I'm trying to get into uh, producing drama. Yeah. But, but like I said, but here's one of the things. I, I've thrown this out to my publishers, as well as other people I've talked to them about film stuff. I said, look, <clears throat> you know Orange is New Black, right? Not that. Okay, now think about this. That's the experience. That's, that's going into its seventh season. It's based on a woman's one-year incarceration in a minimum security federal penitentiary, and she really didn't meet any famous people. No. So if you can get seven seasons out of that, for one year, and I've got 34 and a half years, and I've got all of the people I've met, all the interactions I had. I mean, it's like when we, when I met Ike Turner. Ike Turner was living, was actually at CMC West, which is the minimum security, but he got real sick. So they brought him over and they put him in that little hospital thing. But every morning they wheel him outside in, you know, in, in this wheelchair thing, even though he didn't have to be in the wheelchair all the time. It was like him getting a set of wheels. And all these young black guys come over to talk to him, and you go down there, and, and he'd be croaking out some of the old tunes and stuff like that, and bitching about Tina and, and things along these lines like that. And so, so, I mean, you know, uh, he was what he was. I mean, he, he, he was an old, you know, drug-using black musician that was well beyond his, you know, time and stuff, and he didn't quite make it as famous as Tina did. You know, quite honestly, I mean, Tina, after she got rid of him, shh, you know, yes. I mean, you know, so, I mean, but, but uh, you know, so the thing was, but like I said, I, I met, I met these people and, I, you know, knew all these, you know, stuff. And that's why I said, is that if that can't, if that couldn't be turned into a Netflix series or some other kind of series like that, I don't know how you, how you do it. Because like I said, if you put my stories up against the orange and new black, I I I I blow out the car. truly believe I would they would blow them out of the car. I'll yeah. send you some powerpoints. Okay. I've written a step by step guide on how to create stories for the screen. Yeah, and there's a structure to it. So yeah, I've got a, I've got another one that I actually was writing as a trilogy story yeah. called Rising of the Nightman. Okay, and the Nightman is a, is a Manx character, and it's very there's not a lot that people have ever written about. But the description, that what little, whatever I've been able to, to uh, you know, call out of different things, came out that he was a, he was a character that was born out of 
trials and tribulations and stresses and stuff like that. And when he comes to people that are bad people, basically, his eyes will look like stormy seas going on and stuff. And then he will make them live their worst fears in their minds to where they eventually lose their mind and, and basically die from the conflicts in their minds and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I've, I've written this. And it, loosely, I, I wrote it. I started writing it because I did, I've done some artwork too. I don't, I've, I've done a few, you've seen my drawings and you stuff. You showed me a bit of the, the sketches yesterday from the helmet. Oh, that's just the helmet. No, I mean, I've done drawing artwork and I've sold some of my artwork and, uh, and stuff. I don't think I have any on this. I have it on my tablet, but I didn't bring my tablet with me. Um, let me see if I got any down here. So who would you love to play you in either a movie or documentary? Well, like to be cast? I've had people ask me that a few times. And quite honestly, the, the problem is, is that um, I, I don't really know because some of the people I enjoy watching the most are, are way too British that they wouldn't be able to put it off and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. Well, I, I personally like Jason Statham myself, but oh, you know, yeah, he's a good actor. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, cause I like the, when, when he, when he'll come up to somebody before he puts any hands on him and he, and he, and because he does, he's done it a few times where he can talk a person into realizing that the best thing they can do is walk away. And that's one of the things I did a number of times was just made, made them realize that this might not go the way you want it to. And it could be really, really bad. So, oh, I'll show you this, this something else here. Uh, there's a little girl uh, named Lula on the island, a uh, man, uh, her mom, uh, Sarah and stuff. And I made her a guitar. I actually made her this guitar. Oh, wow. And I, I painted this little girl on here playing the guitar. Oh, wow. And then I made the, I did the uh, case and I embroidered the little patch that says Lula Lion because that's her middle name. Oh, wow. And I did that for her. And That's stuff, really and it's awesome. it's a half size electric guitar. How long does it take you to do something like that? Yeah, it just depends on how uh, motivated I'm. For her, I was very motivated because I took a copy of my book to her mom, and uh, yeah, here shows you when I'm, here's here's all the stuff when I was doing it all, you know, painting it because she wanted it hot pink as well. So that is so. But I, you know, wicked. Yeah. You know, so, and then right here, and it says Lula Lion with stars on it and stuff. Um, but to send them to James. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is her. This is this is little Lula here. Oh look! And I got that shirt for her. Never mess with a, yeah, with a goth girl, Lula. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Because she was going through a goth period, and uh, little rock chick. Yes, and and her mom's as an indie singer over there. Her dad does um, uh, filming for like the TT races and weddings and aerial photo stuff and things like that. And uh, so yeah, I mean it's been you know little things like that, but. Uh, but what I did for her, besides making the big guitar, because I didn't want her to feel left out when she's playing music, is that I made uh, this little one for her dolly, and I painted the little girl Lula for her little Barbie. Oh wow! So, you know, because because uh, like you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a hard, cold, cruel, nasty type person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. No. I got I got no feelings. So, this is my toy. And here, this was that my little motorcycle toy that I had when I was five years old. Interesting enough, this is the letter. I don't know if you'll be able to read it, but this is the letter that came with it because it got returned to me just uh, over a year ago. We see clear in last year's things that been stored since her passing. In one of her boxes of mitts, brick brack, I found this. We had first seen this when we were children in a drawer in a cabinet. We were told that Eva's father had given it to a boy who his wife had sent to Liverpool and that years later her mother received it back which meant the boy could not return to the Isle. It was often a threat that if we were bad we would be sent to Liverpool and not allowed to return. Eva said it had been part of a corkscrew that was from the Horse Drake Hotel. I believe because of the tag that Eva's mother put on it and knowing your story this may have been yours, and not having it was part of the reason you couldn't get it back. So without telling anyone, I chose to send it to you, rather than give it to a charity shop. Well, that's good. 
I hope that is something you may like. Please do not try to contact me. The family would not be happy I've done this. I wish you well in your life. Wow. And I believe that's one of my two nieces. Because I've gotten a few weird things like that. But yeah, so that was my little my little thing there. That's wow. the envelope that came in there. And to me when it got mailed. But it came it was in a, it was in another envelope with a a old yellowing string around it and it said you know, James on it and and so but uh, we believe that when Dr. Wetmore contacted my grandmother in seven, May of 71 that he may have sent that as quote proof of life type stuff to her Yeah. but we don't know what he said in his letter but we got a copy of her letter and she said yes this child you have is the son of my son Douglas but he's, un, he's ill and unable to care for her children so uh, we gave him to the church and we 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 broken ties with the from it from our family. Uh, please have no more contact with us. Now this is May of seventy one, September seventy one. My grandparents are getting ready to celebrate their sixtieth wedding anniversary, and there's a full page article put in the Manx newspaper, sell it where the Queen sends them congratulations and all that stuff, and they do this little st thing and they talk about that. Uh, and unfortunately, D their son Douglas couldn't attend because he was ill. Uh, said that their granddaughter, who was a confectioner made their cake for their anniversary. Or their granddaughter, who was a, was a confectioner, made grand thing. And their only grandson just got his O's. Now, she only had one granddaughter. They didn't say their only granddaughter made our cake. But they made it very specific. They only said, our only grandson. So five months earlier, we had been talking about, they had written to said that they acknowledged me, but they weren't going to, didn't want me so this seemed like they're making a public declaration they only have one grandson they're acknowledging mm. and so very cruel and i out of out of respect because quite honestly it really hurt because i my, my sister's older and you know it'd be really really cool to have an older sister i thought but and uh but anyway um before i went to the isle of man i went on facebook and hunted up the best i could on them found out places that they said they liked or mentioned they went to, and I purposely marked them on a uh, map so I avoided them because I didn't want to bump into them accidentally and cause them any distress because even though they may not want to know me, I still have an adoration towards the fact that they are my family and they didn't have anything to do with me being sent away. Yeah. So I don't want to make them feel that I'm holding anything against them. So I don't go. But at the same time, uh, when I've gone over there and spoken on Manx Radio and I tell my story, yes, I talk about my parents. Yes, I talk about my grandparents. I don't talk about my sister. I don't talk my nieces. And they've got different names, of course, because my sister married. And uh, the only one that's come up in conversations, I went to this one high school where my cousin taught. He just retired like this last year and gave copies of my book and stuff. And I walked in. And the lady looked right at me and says, are you related to Paul Kane?" I said, yes, I am. I'm his cousin. He says, knew it, because we look so much alike. Yeah. I'm better looking, but we look so much alike. <laughs> uh, but anyways, you know, so, <clears throat> but even him, I haven't gone out of the way uh, to, you know, to, like I said, because it's, it has nothing to do with me trying to get anything from them. That was one thing I tried telling them a long time ago. I don't want anything from you guys. It's not like I'm trying to get, you know, inheritance that I should have gotten way back. Right? No, I just, my thing was, I just wanted to be acknowledged that I was born there. Yes. And I have a right to come home. And I don't know, it's because it's always been funny, is that no matter where I've lived, I've never felt like I belonged there. When I got off the plane, and I don't know if you've seen my first video that I did yes. when I when we're flying in and I get teary eyed and all that stuff. Yeah, um, when I got off the plane and Jim had ran down the bottom to film it, I stepped out and the cold breeze blows across. I suck it in; it becomes warm in my chest, and it felt like a hug, and it felt like yeah, I'm home, you know. And this, I'm really home because I was really worried because people kept telling me, "Oh, you're not going to feel comfortable over there. You're gonna, you're not gonna." It's not going to be, you're, you're going to find that you're not this, you're really not wanting to be there and stuff. And I kept being told, well, Birmingham's where you'll probably find your best because 90% of my ancestry comes out of Birmingham. 
and going all the way back to 1670. And uh, they all live within like about a three mile radius of each other and uh, stuff. And, uh, but no, and every time I've gone back over, I just, and quite honestly, if I moved to the aisle, I probably would never leave it again. It's sure, it just, to me, I just, you know, like I said, it, uh, it's, it's just, it's like your most comfortable, you know, robe to put on, your most comfortable chair to sit in, your most comfortable slippers to put on. Is it quite a spiritual yeah, so, island? No, it is. It's very, yeah. it was, well, like I said, I grew up with, see, that's why I said when I was, when I was a small child and Martha used to talk to me, she used to tell me, remember, 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 whenever it's something really important, she'd always you say, remember three times. And this was that, Bo this was that um, Boswell gypsy clan, you know, traveler thing. And she'd tell me things like, you're a man of the isle, you're son of the sea, you're a brother of the storm. She goes, you're of the isle. You'll always have communion with the sea. It'll always call you back. And you're a brother of the storm because throughout your life you'll have lots of conflicts and you know, transgressions. But you'll survive them because you're the brother of the storm. So I took that to great heart. I've got it tattooed in Gaelic across my neck. There. Yeah. And uh, then, like, <clears throat> you know, she told me that when I was first born, when I, within a few days of my being born or a week from my being born or whatever, she actually took me down to Douglas Bay. And uh, she put a drop of seawater in my mouth. She put some sand uh, from the shore on my mouth. And she held me up into the mist so I'd breathe in Mahanan's cloak. And Mahanan is the sea god who the island man is, is he's the patron of. And she said she did that because that bound me to the island. It would always call me home. It would always protect me. It would always... And, and the thing is that, like I said, the number of people who are educated people and all this stuff who never heard of the Isle of Man, let alone know anything about it, used to always clown me. Oh, there's no such place, blah, blah. Is there an Isle of Woman? Which, of course, <laughs> I would respond to, yes, there is. It's called Tiernan Ban, but that's now called the Isle of Sky, but it was Tiernan Ban. Uh, Tier means uh, land. Bond is woman, is yeah, and um, a Scot part of Scotland. Yeah, Isle of yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's off yeah. there. But at one time it wasn't because it was before Scotland was Scotland. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, you know, and uh, so anyway, so I, I would <clears throat> tell people these kind of things. But I told them, you know, I come from a, a magical, mystical isle protected by the sea god. You know, we have the Fenidori, and we have the the Gentile we, we people, and we have the. Uh, Mothadu, the black dog of Peel Castle, and uh, you know we have all this stuff, and so when you tell a small child they're from this kind of a place where magic can happen, and and supernatural beings and things around there, yeah, you feel like I'm, I'm kind of this is kind of cool. I've come, and you got the three legs, and why do we have three legs? For wherever you throw us, we will stand, and that was also part of what my my thing was, is that how I looked at it, no matter what happened to me, I've always got one foot on the ground because that's what we do. We put one, we stand one foot, nothing else, we're there. And, you know, and then the other thing when people, I've had people ask me, well, how, how did you find the strength to carry on and, you know, go through all those stuff? And I said, well, two things. One, I realized that you might never meet another Manxman. So I'm representing my whole nation. So, I have to be the best I can be for what I am. So if you never meet another one, and somebody mentioned you, you go, I met one one time, and this is the kind of person he was. He was fantastic. And so <laughs> this is how, so I felt I carried the weight of my nation on my shoulders to represent. And um, the other thing was, is that quite simply, I couldn't let the bastards win. I knew they were wrong, you know, and... I couldn't give them the satisfaction to win out. They had, they, I had to get out. Like I said, because people said, well, you must have been hopeless at times. I said, you know, I did have low periods, <clears throat> but I was never hopeless. I never got to the point where I said, oh, that's it. I can't do another day. I'd get down and I'd go, you know what? The sun's going down. Sun's going to come up, and I'm just going to try this again. And so <clears throat> every day, I tried to do something to make sure that wasn't a wasted day. And 
I read more than 15,000 books while I was in prison. And I, like I said, I did writing, I, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I, like I said, I used to do what we're doing right now. I used to sit on the yard with guys and, and I would try to explain, and I would do it and I'd say, Something, this is not me bragging. This is me trying to get you to want to go out and do things. You know, live your life. Jump off a cliff on, on El Capoco. You know, climb a mountain. You know, go wrestle a grizzly bear. I mean, do something that you're going to be able to go and tell somebody, yeah, I was there and I did this and da 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 because it's your accomplishment. And if you, if you don't make that one, Okay, back it up a little bit and try one that's not quite as hard. But, you know, because uh, <laughs> as silly and corny as it is, it's like what Yoda said. Do or don't do, don't, tr you know, not try. You know, it's just real simple. And I'm, with bikers, I used to tell guys, guys would go, oh, he's a wannabe. And I tell them, I don't have a problem with wannabes. You have to want to be something before you can be. What I have a problem with is never bees. And the never be is the guy who buys the Harley jackets and stuff and hangs around, hasn't got a motorcycle, never will have a motorcycle, you know, and stuff. But he just wants to be there, you know. You know, wannabe will actually go out and he'll get, he'll get a Honda 175. He might put Harley stickers on it because he's still trying to get to the Harley park. But he's, and he's going he's gonna to keep trying. He's going to get there. It's going to take him 40 years, but he's going to get there, you know. <clears throat> Eight divorces, 15 kids. He's still going to get there, you know, at some point. Uh, and so that was like, for me, it's just like, and that's my life. My life has been, like I said, I'm a brother of the storm. I've had trials and tribulations. The bastards aren't going to win. They're not going to beat me. And like I said, I, I still lift weights, not, not, not heavy weights, but I still lift weights. Uh, I still am very active. You know, I, I'm, I'd like to get to be at least as old as my dad, which was 86. My granddad was 93, you know, but you know. I've gone through my family and about 70% of my immediate family, including a great, great, great grandfather, James Taylor, who was born in 1819. He lived to be 90 years old and he was a tin plater, which you know, you know anything about that, all the caustic and poisonous chemicals you used in plating tin back in the day. He worked in that for most of his life. And we read a thing where uh, somebody had written about the fact that uh, that you knew he was coming down the street because of the smoke coming off from his from his cigarettes because he smoked so much he just constantly had a cloud around and he drank like a fish and stuff. He ninety years old. I mean, you know, I don't do all those kind of things, so I figured, you know, I mean, quite honestly, the only vice, my my only real vice is my motorcycles. I, I, you know, that's why I said, you know. I eat, drink, and sleep motorcycles, and if you cut me, I bleed 60 weight, you know, so. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but like I said, you know, uh, Linda would like, you know, Linda's been really uh, supportive, and she's like, I'm not against you having a bike. I would like you to get a smaller one, you know, not just because as she says you're not, you're not as strong as you used to be. You're not necessarily as agile. You're not, you know, this type of thing. But she's seen me in the car, and she's really amazed at how, really observant I am when I'm driving, watching other drivers. And I told her that's from all the years riding motorcycles because you get on a motorcycle, you're invisible. You know? And so and I've had people do stupid stuff and went against me with my car, so I'm, you know, I'm able to react real quick. So she's been pretty the bit. But honestly, if I didn't get a motorcycle, she wouldn't be too unhappy with me about it. But, but she's not going to tell me you can't have one, that type of thing. You know? Have you ever had an accident on one? Yeah. I've had a couple accidents. Never my fault. I was sitting, I'll tell you, I was sitting in Fresno. <laughs> I was sitting on First Street. I'm at a stoplight. It's about 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm sitting on my Harley, and I hear, this motor, it's a red light. And a motor's running up, and I look in my mirror, and I see this truck coming up behind me. And I pushed my feet up on the foot pegs, and the truck hit me. And I flipped off my bike and into the back of the pickup truck on top of all this broken asphalt and rolled off the back, right? Bike, bike's destroyed, right? Guy gets out and says, look what you did to my truck. Oh, and he's yeah. just as drunk as you can get. He can barely stand up, all right? My bike's just, it's, I don't think it was a, root, a usable part left on, not even a screw. I think they're all bent, you know? I mean, it was just, it was, I mean he hit me. Like I say, probably 70, 80 miles an hour. And uh, 
about that time, <laughs> this cop from nowhere comes over there, sees my bike in the screen, this guy here, and the guy's going, he hit me! Right? He's telling the cop. And from three, four feet away, the cop could smell the alcohol on him and stuff. And uh, I got that. But the, the, worst, <laughs> the worst accident I ever had on a motorcycle, a friend of mine decided he wanted to extended front end chopper and he got a good deal in Tijuana for a guy to build him a front end and chrome it and stuff but he'd never ridden a, a bike with a extended front end before so he asked me to go down with him and ride it back for him so then he could practice once we got back over here rather than riding it from there back to San Jose and okay so we're coming up and it's, it's February and uh we're coming up and it's like about two o'clock in the morning. We're going through LA and it's like a, a Sunday morning, so there's no traffic. We're going down there and all of a sudden I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm watching the stem uh, on the front end. I see the nut spinning and I'm thinking, oh crap, they didn't tighten the nut down, right? And I've got my hand, and, but we're doing like 70 miles an hour. All of a sudden, the stem comes shooting out from me. So now, it, do you know what that means? The wheels are going to come off. No, it means that the front end is no longer attached to the motorcycle. I'm on the bike. The stem has come out. The, the, <laughs> the triple trees are sitting there, but there's nothing holding them all together. Realizing this, knowing I can't put the brakes on because then I'm going to have the thing all go apart. I'm holding the, pulling the handlebars back to try to keep this thing together as I try to slow this fucking thing down. He's going alongside me and he's going <laughs> like this. I'm going, you know, trying to let him know there's a problem. And he's like, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden I can't hold it anymore. I've gotten it down to about 35, 40 miles an hour and the front end takes off. Oh. The centrifugal force is keeping the bike up. And then all of a sudden the bike goes, bam, <laughs> and off the bike I come. Now. I'm not wearing a helmet because we don't wear helmets back then. But I've got this really cool Confederate hat on. You know, it's really cool. It's made out of leather. It's really nice. I've got, because it's wintertime, I've got my club colors on. I've got my leather jacket on. I have a, um, you know, a Pendleton shirt, real thick Pendleton shirt. I've got a T-shirt and i got a tank top on. I've got gloves and I have a scarf around my head that the my hat's on top of. I had hair back then, so my neck wasn't warm. Was warm. I come off this fucking thing. When I did, I hit the front brake, which caused the front wheel to stop and me flipping over on it. I land on the highway and I start spinning, and I spin probably about thirty or forty feet down and up into the ice plants, which they put on both sides on the highway. They put the ice plant. And I go, I mean, 30, 40 feet is all I went, up into the ice plants. My, I see his, his light stop down the road. I stand up, and I'm holding the handlebars still. And the top of the triple tree is with me, but the rest of the front end's down on the highway somewhere. And I'm dazed and confused for that moment until I slightly lean forward, and all my stuff falls down to my elbows. The only thing still on me is my tank top, and it's just barely gotten done so I didn't get any decent road rash out of it but I mean it tore through my colors and my leather jacket and all the stuff and I'm just and he comes running up he goes my motorcycle my motorcycle you fucked my bike up I said better get away from him I'll beat you with these handlebars <laughs> and about that time a trucker pulls up he'd seen that the bike was starting to do wiggle he'd call the highway patrol highway patrol comes up and what we found out was they had only spot welded the, tr the stem. They hadn't, they hadn't finished doing the weld around it. And so the vibration of the bike snapped those little three little spot welds on it. And it, it, he had spike nuts. So if that thing had hit me in the head, it would have penetrated my head because of spike nuts and stuff. You know, and that was the worst accident I was on. Did you get a payout on that one? Part The payout. You betcha I got a payout. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> he, he was so upset with the fact that I... He goes, well, are you going to fix my bike? I said, absolutely not. He said, you don't need a bike like that. And in fact, you went to Mexico to have a front end made. You know, I said, there are plenty of shops in San Jose. Good you know, but they want to charge me more. I said, yeah, well, I said, this is going to be real expensive for you. 
and I, I hit him with a bill for $10,000. Nice. You don't have it written down anywhere. I said, well, no, I'll just relive it. When, because when I tell the stories, I'm just reliving things. And and so that's why for me it's just like it flows because I just we wish it. all I guess flowed like you. Why is he not? Amazing? I I said all I guess now I said in the shot call of it clip. I said if you want to call the podcast, watch this. This is how to tell a story. Well, like like I said, I keep hoping he's going to hit the right people. This is you coming along. I take her to nice little. I took her to a really nice little B and B. This B and B was better than any of the hotels I've stayed in. The people were just over. Couldn't couldn't do enough for us. And stuff, and then when they found out who I was, because she happened to be outside having uh, a cigarette, and she happened to mention it, that, <laughs> who I was, and then they next thing I know they ordered books right then and there. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean it was just really lovely. And like I said, when we went to the Isle of Man, you know, I, the, the big joke now is every time I've taken her somewhere, she gets a pair of boots. <laughs> I, I bought her a pair of boots everywhere we go. Uh, a handbag at this time, but anyway, so you know, she I try to make her tri the trips inclusive to her, not just her sitting here watching me, you know, do what I do. Yeah. But and I thought that I to me, believe I, I, I was telling her, I said, you know, the stuff he's going through, I said, similar to stuff I did. I said, the worst thing was is for him is he was in a place where everybody's Asian, so it's like one big family, and you're the odd man out. Language barrier, <clears throat> language barrier, yeah. but you're also. You know, the group type thing, it's like, yeah, yeah. where I said, well, there were so many factions of me, half of them didn't even care about me because I wasn't a part of any of the, their stuff. So that made it easier in some ways. Though it long, But I said to me, the best part was the very end when his character, the father, comes to see him in the prison because the father is Billy. Yeah. Billy plays his own father in the end. Yeah. Right. I, thought that was, I thought that was a great uh, uh, ending thing. But I don't know how he got his film made. I do. Yeah, but the thing was that, like I said, quite honestly, as I was telling her, I've told t so many people, including my publisher, I've been on them numerous times about. I said, look, Orange is the New Black is based on a is seven seasons coming out now. It's based on a woman's one year sentence in a minimum security federal prison, and she didn't really know anybody famous. I said, if she can get seven seasons. I, I, I should get 12, 14, easily, with, and, and each one of my episodes is going to be much more, you know, because you know, they had to ad-lib a lot of her shit, where mine, they don't have to do so much of it, you know, <clears throat> but I, I said, because quite honestly, I think either a film or a series is quite honestly the only way I'm ever going to own a place of my own. Yeah, really? well, my, my publisher hasn't gotten it for me yet. I've, I've well, pushed yeah, for, sometimes it takes time. Yeah. Well, I did, my problem is, see, here's, here's part of the thing, and this is one thing I kept telling Jim. I'm 68 years old. If they get it for, if they get it for me when I'm 90. You know, I said, it's not like I'm 50. Well, that's what happened, know, with, I, that's what happened I, with Howard Marks. Yeah. He got his movie out, didn't he? Well, and he, he didn't live much longer. But no, but Charlie Hoonan, who played Jax in Sons of Anarchy, is from Newcastle. I know that. Yeah. And he also is in uh, King Arthur, the... You know, the legend of the sword and... Uh, is he still in Newcastle now? No, 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 no. Right. He, he, he's, he's too big for Newcastle now. He's in Hollywood <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. No, trust me, if, if he had been still here, I would have, I would, I would have had Linda's family. Yeah. She's got a, a well-extensive family. Hunt him down and yeah. we, we'd, have, we'd have put a book in his hand and made him read it. <laughs> 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 Tell them, you think you know about bikers? <laughs> Let me get you this. Yeah. You know. and, and, and like I said, it's really funny because I used to have, one of the things guys used to tell me in prison all the time is, damn, Morgan, you're hard, man. You're hard. Because I would tell them the truth, how I felt about shit. And if I, like, I'd tell guys they were coming back to prison, and they'd go, oh, that's fucked up. Why would you say that? Because it's true. You're not going to do a single thing different than you did when you were out last time. And probably do worse, and you'll be back for more time. Oh man, that's bad. that's fucked up, man. Then change. It's real simple. Yeah, just don't do it. You know? And and then I, I I used to get the guys who hung out in the chapels, right? I tell them, "Are you a Christian?" "Yeah, I'm a Christian." I said, "Well, you got the easiest way." You go, "What do you mean?" I said, "Cause all you gotta do is you know get that WWJD. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus shoot that dope? No. 
Would Jesus <laughs> rape that woman? No. Would Jesus rob that man? No. Then you know what not to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm a bar I, I come from a barbarian culture. Would we pillage the village? Hell yeah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, so I mean, we're a little different, you know. I said, but you know, you guys got the guy. As a vet, as a vegetarian, you can eat. Depends on your reasons for being a vegetarian. No, 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 no. Okay. What do cows eat? Grass. The yeah. <laughs> so if they are vegetarians and you eat one of them, you're still vegetarian because you're, you're, you're only eating a vegetarian. You're only eating grass, yeah. yeah. you're only eating a vegetarian. It's real simple. <laughs> so you, you just got to look at it from I'm the right perspective. That, you know, I said to my parents once, if get, a cow can get everything from grass, why can't we just get everything from grass? But it's to do with the stomachs, isn't it? Well, yeah, because it goes through multiple stomachs to yeah. get to that point. You know. I feel like um, thinking that sticking... What was that thing that made the chickens bigger in your dick or make your dick bigger? <laughs> <laughs> hormones. Oh, yeah. hormones. Oh, yeah. Guys, yeah. Our stories yesterday, man, <laughs> honestly. They're the fucking and, reserve. And you, you? But you know people are going to go, he's lying. That's not what happens. It's not like that. There are going to be people who do but that. But you know what? As long as they take the time to yeah. come in, it adds to it. Yeah. But like I said, if you if you can, I'd appreciate you take that one blog thing down. Oh, yeah, I'll do that now. Yeah. I'll do it right now. What's that? The one where... Jay, he, he got, got trolled. So, she doesn't get, know about the trolling oh, and all this. Yeah. I'm going to go, okay, so we're going to deal with this. And he starts taking, and I punch him in the throat. I'm going to the radio. <laughs> I'm sorry. You walked up and said we're going to fight. I thought that meant the fight was on. <laughs> I didn't know we had, well, there's rules. Not in prison fights. Not in street fights. Not in barroom fights. There may be in a ring. Yeah. But that's, you know, debatable too. You know? And, and so... And, and like I said, guys who would like stomp their feet when they 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 grab hold of me, I'd stomp them and on their instep and break it. I mean, what the hell did you do that for? Same reason I'll grab your ear and rip it off the side of your head. You'll never wear sunglasses. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? You you made it to where I feel I've got to deal with this. Yeah, and that's why I used to tell guys, look, if you're not willing to step up, better step back. And my gunnery sergeant, Gunny Roach. Said real simply with us, you don't have to be the toughest, you don't have to be the strongest, you have to be the guy who's willing to go the step further than the other guy is. That's how you win. Whatever the worst thing he thinks he can do to you, you're willing to go beyond that. And you do not realize when you say things to people, guy comes up, he's like, oh, You think you're tough, huh? I'll deal with you. I said, Have you ever seen the roots of your testicles? <laughs> what? I said in 30 seconds I'm going to rip out your testicles and show you the roots <laughs> and his mind's trying to process this at the moment <sighs> what? or like one guy comes up to me young kid chicken chested tells me I don't think you're that tough he goes I think we ought to trade punches to the chest I said okay this is my when I still have my 50 inch chest I said go ahead I'll let you do first and he punched me and I went I didn't move. And he goes, okay, okay, it's your turn. I said, now, I'm just letting you know, just so we know ahead of time, everybody's aware. I'm going to reach through that fucking pigeon chest you got and rip out what you think is a spine and beat you with it. <laughs> you have never seen anybody run backwards so fucking quick to get away from me. <sighs> See, fight with words. Yeah. Yeah. I had to physically fight, like, during the first five years. And after that, for the next 20 odd years, it was people go, hey, you leave him alone, he's fucking crazy. I, big black guy, comes into the gym, when I was with pine, with the, before the pineapple thing, big black guy. He had been working in a nursing home, and he'd been raping elderly women who were bedridden. Jesus. Because he was a sexual stallion, and they all wanted him. So he gets arrested, he gets sent to YA, and he assaults a female counselor in the YA, so they kick him into the prison system. And he's a big guy. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he's just really massive, right? He's walking around with these other guys, and they're all thinking he's the thing. He comes in the gym, and I work out with this one, one black guy. And he goes, oh, shit, these guys are coming over here. Okay, we're working out. We're in the corner here. Guy goes over and goes, I want those weights. I go, and in 15 minutes, you can have them. He goes, no, I want those weights now. Picked up a 10-pound weight and said, 
I'll tell you right now, I'm too old and I'm too fucking tired to fish, sit here and fight with you for 15 minutes. So I'm gonna fucking cripple you, put you in a wheelchair, you be peeing and pooping in bags the rest of your motherfucking life if you don't get the fuck away from me right now. And the, and the guy's like, fuck, man, they ain't like that serious. Then there's no reason you should be over here talking to me. Then he walks away. I throw the weight back down. And, and they go where they sit on a bench. And the black guy goes, that was kind of intense. I said, you think? I thought I kind of restrained myself. You know, and then we start working out. And he goes, hey, it's time to quit. I said, no, we got 15 more minutes. And I purposely worked out 15 more minutes while they eye-fucked me, <laughs> you know, from the bleachers. Then I walked over and I said, hey, Teddy boy, your fucking weights are ready for you. Because the guy's name was Theodore. And he went by Teddy. And I went, hey, Teddy boy, your weights are before you. And we walked out. He sees me a week later. He's walking out. And he goes, that's a fucking crazy guy talking about putting me in a fucking wheelchair. <laughs> See, here's the thing what I learned. A lot of youngster guys, they don't think about being killed. That doesn't mean fucking put in a wheelchair. Your shit don't work. You're pooping in bags and stuff. They know people like that. That's reality to them. So you got to know when to tell a guy you'll cripple him and when you're going to tell a guy you're going to take his life. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> and, and, and see, that's what I'm trying to say is, you know, is that I was able to walk. Some youngster comes in and he doesn't want to get part of the gang shit. And I tell him, look, come here. Here's the deal. If you don't want to be picked up by them, get your ass to the library, get some books, reading books, not comic books and shit. Start reading. Because they don't want you around if you're educated. The leaders don't want somebody more, you know, knows more than they do. It's real simple. And guys do this. But every once in a while, guys come over and try to pressure him because he's from a certain little area. And I walk over and go, he's with me. Oh, well, well we didn't realize it came out. I'm sorry, you know, uh, but we thought it was all right, man. You know, uh, yeah, it's cool, you know. And I didn't have to do anything more than just say that. Because the, the history of what I might do and what mother... And here's the funny thing. If I get in a fight with one guy, five years from now, that turned into a fight with seven guys. Because everybody builds on my story. Guys who like me build on it because they think it like... Blah. And the guys who didn't like me build on it because they're like, he's that fucking kind of an asshole. Yeah, so it, it, so that's why I said, you know, it's just, it worked out these different ways. And there were times, like, when I got attacked with a mop ringer, a guy threw water on my, by my floor and attacked me with a mop ringer. Well, there were other guys who knew me, who liked me, who rushed over to make sure that... Why did he do that? There were a couple of young guys that were wanting to try to make a name. This is when, towards, when I was much older. I, I was toward when I was at Folsom the last time. And they thought that if they could take me out, they could then... Go, damn, what's right? We were the ones that got it. Mm -hmm. And this is when I pointed out the thing about, like, Whitey Bulger, right? Okay, Whitey Bulger was yeah, the Lavender Hill gang, and he was all that and everything like that, okay, and he got away. So he goes back. Yes, okay, he may have been a rat for the feds and the weather, all that kind of shit. The man's fucking in a wheelchair. He's elderly, he's in a wheelchair, and three heroes with knives went and got him. Not just one hero with a knife. It took three heroes with a knife to go after a guy in a wheelchair. So, what's that really say about them? Pussies. If it, takes, if it takes 10 guys to get me down, are they really the guys who won that fight? No, forever they'll be known as they were the guys that had to come 10 on to take out a 68-year-old man. I mean, you know, and it, so that's why with me, it was just, yeah, but... Why did he have it coming, though? Well, you know, but here's Didn't the thing. Did he kill women and stuff? Huh? Did he kill a woman as well? Whitey. Whitey Bulger. But he, Francis okay. talked about this, didn't he? Okay, but, but, okay. In the gangster world, you're still doing wars. That's why you have the head guy, and you have lieutenants, and you have the sergeants going out, and you have the soldiers. Still a war. There's two hard, fast rules of war, whether it's governments fighting each other, or bike clubs, which are, or you know, gang stuff, whatever. There's two hard fast. The first one is innocent people die. You know what the second one is? Innocent people die. Funny enough, no matter how many times you go to a battle, 
some innocent person is going to get in the way. They might be killed because somebody saw something that they shouldn't have seen, didn't mean to, they just happened to walk into it, so they get killed as collateral damage. I mean, the U.S. military used to just fucking eradicate villages because one person might be involved with the enemy. You know, and they, you know, and, and the thing is, you know, you kill every man, woman, child, and dog that exists. Collateral you know? damage. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's that kind of thing. And it's like, I, when, I, when I, I did this little course thing, and... Well, then you've got off the butt bucket story. Oh, yeah. well, anyway, so, but well, see, that's why I say one of the problem. But anyway, so, no, these guys, they, they decided they were going to do it. So what happened was, they, they I, I come in my tier, and they had water spilled in front of my cell. So I have to kind of tiptoe around because it's got soap in the water, so it's going to be slippery. I jump up on my step to tell my celly to hand me my shower stuff out because I take showers over in the office where I'm working as a captain's clerk. And this guy runs up and he throws this, this liquid stuff at me and I duck just as my celly steps up and gets it full in his face. Well, it turns out it's just, it's just cleaning soap. It's not... It wasn't the day palm. No, it was just it's cleaning just... soap. But, I mean, still, he's got all this, you know... Soap in your eyes, you get, ah, yeah. And so I ended up engaging him, and there's two other, and one picks up the mop ringer. Well, at this point, the mop ringers are no longer metal, but they're heavy plastic thing. And he hits me, and hits my shoulder, you know, and drives me back and stuff. And I'm trying to get my footing on the water and stuff like that. And these couple other guys come running around and gaffled the two guys up. Now I've just got the one guy that, that had thrown the stuff at my celly, and he's running down the tier. Problem is that the tear is a dead end. And I'm coming after him. And he's like, no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. No more. No more. No more. Oh, no. No, oh, I'm sorry. I haven't had my go. You've had your go. I've had my go. Yeah. And you don't know how many people told me it was fucked up that he had, you know, chain link fence marks on his face where I tried to shove his fucking ass through like a cheese grater. <laughs> but the two guys that grabbed the other guys twisted one guy up and threw him in the fucking laundry cart, you know, and then dumped a bunch of dirty laundry all over his face and shorts and socks and all that shit on him and told him, don't get out of there. They told him to get out of there. And the other guy, I'll give him credit, he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the guy and he hit the guy about ten times in, in the chest and stomach and then the guy says, you threw now? And then just beat him to like he was a stepchild. So, you know, I had people like like my friend Ted, I'm saying, he, he'd step up for me. I'd step up for him. Anyway, so, the, though I didn't have permanent crew, I had people that, and I had people of different races because I didn't play the race card. I had Mexicans who helped me because I helped them get their GEDs. And they really appreciated me trying, you know, I helped them with it, read, reading. I had guys who were illiterate. I read letters and helped write letters for them. They'd step up for me. I had some black guys that stepped up for me because even though I rode with a club that had a Confederate flag, they knew I didn't play the race game. That's my club. And uh, if I could help you, I would. I mean, I got so a couple guys jobs when they, they, told, they were told they couldn't get a job unless one of the lead men spoke up for them. All the lead men happened to be white, except me. And I went loud. And I got them jobs. And then the other lead men came and said, hey, you didn't talk to us about it. What, you thought this was a fucking democracy? No, well, you guys got your shit. I do mine. We don't, we don't meet in the middle here. I don't know where you're thinking this. Is. Well, because, you know, because uh, you look white. The fuck's that mean? An albino looks white. But does that mean he's white? I said, actually, he's whiter than you are. And then I said, what is this about you want to be all this white? And you can't wait to get out and get the darkest suntans in the world. <laughs> the fuck is with that? That's what I want to know. Be white, man. Stay out of the fucking sun. Get the bleaching cream that Jackson used. <laughs> be white. Be proud, you know. Let your kids be ignorant. It's like when I dealt with a guy who came up and he was a Satanist. He had 666 crosses it. You know, Satan rules. He came over to me and he starts talking, yeah, you know, I'm a Satanist. He's got all these guys around him and they're all listening to me. And I go, okay, so let me get this right. 
You're, you're saying this again. So, so uh, you know the Bible pretty well. What? Well, you, you have to because that's your guide to know exactly what the opposite you're supposed to do. So that's how it works for you. I said, now, let me understand this right. So that means that because you're a Satanist, that you're a, a guy who will betray people that trust you, uh, so it means you'll tell on the guys for anything they're doing to get more blessings and honor from from Satan, and uh, you'll rat all these guys out, and you'll betray them, and steal from them, and lie on them, and oh yeah, and you'll encourage your wife to go out and have sex with other guys just to betray you, because that helps her get into better graces of Satan. And your kids, you want your kids to fucking burn your house down when your wife's in there having sex with another man because that makes them better off and, and, so, and the guy's like what fuck no what what i didn't tell anybody i'm not good and the guys are all looking at him i said come on let's be true if you're going to be a true satanist i'm going to be willing to help you be the best satanist you can fucking be <laughs> <laughs> and what's he do he goes and locks up what the fuck is that So I did the only thing I could think to do. I went to the chapel and I got some books on how you can become a good Christian and I said shit to him. Yeah? Well, because he wasn't doing a good Satanist, I would rather help me go the other way. And did he? Oh, I don't know. He, I never saw him after that. He, left. he was in the ad said, get me for a transfer. But I mean, see, it's like I say, but that's why people think I'm an asshole and that I'm a terrible person. I don't think I am. I think I'm just me. You know, I take me as... Like I said, like me, don't like me. I don't give a shit. Yeah? And like I used to tell people, don't get into my business because you really don't want me in yours. Because trust me, I, if you let if you get in my business, everybody's going to be your fucking business. Mm. I'll put so much shit out there about what you're doing, you won't be able to go out of the house for a glass of milk. The motherfuckers will be, you'll be on every paparazzi shit, you know? You'll be the first guy on this block to walk out there and find nothing but clicking the cameras going around you. No, I'm, I'm sad. I'm done, like I said, that's what I'm saying. Is that, you know, and, and like I said, yes, I'm getting old. I understand it. Yes, I know I'm not supposed to do certain things. So that's fine. But the problem is that at no point in time did I read a thing that says, you know, people tell me to act my age. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to act my age because I've never been this old before. So I act the age that I know, which is me. And as I grow old, I, I think I'm getting more calm and graceful in my aging process depending on who you talk to but every once in a while somebody will say something or do something and I'll respond in what they think is not exactly the most appropriate way <laughs> you know and then they're butt hurt I, and I don't know why I said well you said such and such I just told you what I thought yeah but did you have to go that way did you have to be that hard mm. but see I've had to be like this since I was a little kid I would not have survived the beatings that Wetmore gave, and that's what we think happened to the other boy, is that he that the kid was beaten and probably killed, and then was taken away and disappeared, because they can't find him. They find no record of him. I was given his identity, which is what I went in the military with, and stuff. And yes, they backdated my age because I was older, but I was, I was small, so it looked like, you know. But yeah, I mean, so, but yeah, I mean, but this is just me. I mean, I don't know how to play somebody else. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I could, I don't know how I could play an effeminate trucker, you know, from Malarca. You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. But at the same time, I'm one of the guys who, if I'm dealing with somebody of another uh, race or culture, and I've traveled to other places, I eat what local people eat because I want. I don't look for a McDonald's right from the gate, and I try to learn how to speak certain bits of the language so I can. You know, show them that I respect them in the way that I expect to get respected back. And it generally works. You know? It's a good way to be. Yeah. Como se llamos? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, I, the I, animal I, is so... Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, you know. You know. We know but but the worst thing was that I learned my Spanish from a woman who was Swedish, so <laughs> I ended up with a kind of Swedish-Spanish <laughs> con thing. You know? yeah. It was always it was the funniest thing, because I had to take Spanish in high school. And I took it two semesters, and, uh, you know, yeah. but, I mean, but, I don't know, I'm, I, I may have, I may have the whole 
picture all fucked up and be, be completely we, uh, stepping outside. We the love frame. you. We love you as you are, Jamie. Stay. I may stay. I may be stepping out the frame, but you know. Stay as you are. Stay as you are. Yeah, hundred percent. And there will be a movie. <laughs> well, let's hope. Yeah. As long as Bob Hoskins doesn't play me, I'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, you know, but no, I, I like I said, I'm all, I'm good. I, I, you know, and like I said, and, and quite like I said, my, my, my six months I've been up here now almost has been just amazing. I mean, yeah. you know, I, you know. You seem like totally at ease. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, and like I've always told people, don't tell me I can't do something. Tell me I shouldn't, and then let me make up my mind. But when you say I can't, you make it a fucking challenge, and I'll rise to a challenge in a heartbeat. You know? <laughs> I mean, right now, what I'd like to do is when I turn 70, my summer, my 70th birthday, <clears throat> I'm trying to get uh, enough practice in to where I can sea kayak from Scotland to the Isle of Man, 19 miles across sea. Wow. Because a 65-year-old guy did it about 10 years ago, and I wanted to, I'll be older, but I want to also beat his record. Wow. What was his record? Um, I can't remember now. I haven't written down and stuff, but... You know, and uh, I joked with him because he, he did it with his dog, and I joked I'd get me a hedgehog and take it with me because you know, I, like I love hedgehogs. And so I worked for a while at Wildlife Rescue Centers and did repairs for them and got to play with the animals and stuff. You know, had, had a, you know, a loving relationship with a, a, a doe named Daisy that, like, every time I'd be working on her, the fence line, she'd come up and lick my side and my shirt would come up and stuff. And the people going, she doesn't come up to people. Yeah, I'm not people. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just me. She likes me. I don't know why. You know, definitely an animal guy. But, but, you know, but like I said, I, I, you know, but it, I, that's why I say it was really hard for me to get all the to suddenly get all that kind of uh, crap because, like I said, on the streets and on the street, somebody'd say it, and I'd walk up to him and go, Where, "Where'd you hear that from?" Oh, I heard from her. I'd be on your, then I'd be on him, and I'd walk right back to the, the first guy, and he'd say, "Well, you know, I didn't really, I didn't know it was going to go like that. I just, I just made a comment." You know, and yeah, there were a few times when people we'd have to get into it, but most time people realized that they weren't expecting me to be on their doorstep because unfortunately I, I don't know. I, yeah, I wear a watch, but I don't know that other people know what time it is. So when I kick your door in at six a.m. in the morning to wake you up to talk to you about what you said, I don't know that that's inappropriate because it works for me. I'm awake. I'm, I'm ready to talk to you. You know, so I, you know, and I have ridden a motorcycle through a front door and fired a flare gun off in it to get a person's <laughs> attention. Wow. And that's another story. Wow. Another one. Pop. Part five? Yes. Part five. Yeah. Yeah, okay, like I said, but, yeah, I mean, but yeah, I just, uh, I appreciate you guys. And I, great seeing you two again. Yeah. That's that's great seeing you. Yeah. I hope I, I hope I see like you guys it. again at some point. Definitely. You know, and uh, like I said, Hopefully my these other podcasts I do will do will go all right and yeah. and stuff and like I said get more momentum and stuff and you know eventually get to the point where I've got far more people you know on my side that the little trolls just crawl into a hole and they cover themselves up and stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah I didn't have a copy of my new book to give you so that's why you got no, a copy no, of my first book that's perfect yeah. thank yeah. you yeah. so but, much yeah no thank you. Yeah, because they, they, they only send me so many publishers' copies, and I already had them already put out. And so. No, thank you. Can't wait. Can't wait. All right, you guys. Yeah. Right. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, James. <laughs>